Welcome to Marrying Miss Kringle Robin, the fourth book in the Sweet Santa Romance series. I hope you enjoy this holiday romance. If you do, please leave a comment below. And Welcome to the Kringle family. Marrying Miss Kringle Book 4 Chapter 1 Robin Robin Kringle made her way into the family gathering room. The warm wooden paneling called to her. Though she loved living in an ice castle, the blue and white walls were too bright for her mood today. She needed walnut wood and a yule log to chase away her blues. Chocolate would help too, which was why she had a small box of hand-dipped, homemade lemon truffles in one hand and a cup of cherry hot chocolate in the other. The ovens were misbehaving, acting like they were in a tropical climate instead of the North Pole. Her strawberry candy canes had come out limp and sticky, and the watermelon ones weren't worth talking about. Baking was supposed to be the easy part of life. Recipes had specific instructions, and when followed, they resulted in beautiful confections delivered by Santa and enjoyed by children the world over. She pushed the door with her hip, but it stuck and she bounced off, splashing hot chocolate on her hand. Growling, she balanced the box on top of the cup, shook off her fingers, swiped her hand on her raspberry-colored apron, and gave the door a good shove. It popped open with a wood-on-wood -wood scrape that sent shivers over her arms. The sound also startled two of her sisters, Stella and Ginger, who had been sitting on the couch. They popped up like kids caught sneaking cookie dough. Come to think of it, Stella had a glint in her eye that said they may have raided Robin's cookie stash before hiding in the family room. What are you two up to? she asked, making her way to the large red brick fireplace. She set her cup and box on the side table, next to Mom's rocker, and faced her sisters. Stella, the only other single Kringle, as she liked to call them, picked up her laptop and hugged it to her chest. Right now? Nothing. Her black hair was past her shoulders now. She'd chopped it off and worn it spiky several years ago and had been growing it out since. Ginger, or Santa, as she had inherited the silver snowflake tattoo that should have been Robin's birthright, shoved Stella. Tell her. Stella twisted her lips. I don't think it's a good idea. The two of them locked eyes and battled it out silently. Robin groaned. These two had spent the year plotting out matchmaking schemes for Robin. They'd tried online dating, a bust. Asking friends from college to set her up, epic fail. And hitting the single scene in every major city from London to Singapore, exhausting and often embarrassing, as Robin had major dance skills from the 1980s but none from this decade. Each new scheme had a higher level of desperation that scrambled Robin's confidence like a fork whisking egg yolks. Three of her younger sisters had found true love and saved Christmas in the process. As the oldest, she should have been the first to stand at the altar. Yet here she was, 32 years old and counting, with no husband, children, or Christmas hero status to her name. Stella finally broke eye contact with Ginger and flipped on Robin, her face a mask of fake serenity. How much do you love me? Instantly wary, Robin squinted. Why? Stella didn't invoke that question unless there was a catch, a double-decker with extra frosting catch. Thank goodness Frost had given her a makeover last year when they'd gone to Elderberry, Oregon, to help Frost find her husband, Tannen. The two of them, and Tannen's son, Brody, had moved into their own suite in the castle. Frost was over the mail room and spent most of her days organizing and reorganizing letters to Santa. Thanksgiving was late this year, the last weekend of November, which gave them just 27 days until Christmas Eve. It was one of the shortest holiday seasons they'd had in a decade. No one felt the pinch like Robin, who had to find her true love, marry him, and return to the North Pole in time to make enough candy to stuff stockings for every child on the planet, or Christmas magic would perish. Being a Kringle wasn't all cookie binges and sleigh rides. Stella lifted onto her tiptoes, making her knee-high black leather boots crinkle. Because I just solved your marriage problem. It's my problem? Robin lifted one eyebrow and an older sister stared down. 
Stella had a string of broken hearts staggering behind her and not an engagement ring to be seen. This could have been her year to get married. If only she hadn't. It's all of our problem. Ginger interrupted Robin's thoughts. She went to the door and heaved it open, causing the same creaky noise that Robin had made when she came in. The wood in the castle is swelling. Do you know what that means? That it needs an ibuprofen? Stella snarked. Ginger stuck her fists on her wide black belt. Her red velvet skirt swished around her ankles as she paced the room. It's absorbing water. She moved to the bookshelf and wrapped her knuckles on the back. It sounded thick. The castle is melting. Melting! Robin snatched up the chocolate box and popped a morsel of chocolate lemony goodness in her mouth. The milk chocolate melted on her tongue in the most soothing way, and the lemon came in with a kick that started her thinking process. How fast! Lux estimates the integrity of the ice will be at zero on Christmas Day. Ginger spoke low, as if she was afraid the walls would hear her and start to worry. The castle was made of Christmas magic, changing with the family's needs. The day Robin's room had transformed from a child's room to a teenage girl's room with a queen-sized bed, a beautiful makeup table, and a larger closet was a cherished memory. She'd felt like the magic had seen her that day, had known she longed to move from the playroom to the kitchens and take her place as a contributing Kringle. Lux, their science-loving sister, was over all things mechanical. She had a way with engineering like Robin had with sugar, and she had built a substation that converted Christmas magic into electricity and stabilized the flow to prevent power surges from shutting down machines. Ginger touched the single snow globe on the shelf, her face drawing into a grimace. A whole collection of snow globes used to grace those shelves. But last year, when the North Pole had begun to tip because no one had gotten married yet, the decorations had fallen to the floor and smashed. Mom was heartbroken. She'd taken a lifetime to gather snow globes, most of them representative of a family trip or holiday tradition. Dad had taken the sleigh to Austria to purchase a replacement for their honeymoon snow globe. It was beautiful, with a small replica of St. Rupert's Church inside and a water wheel on the base. When shaken, the snow gathered on the church spire and bell tower, creating an inviting Christmas Eve scene. Tipping was one thing. Her cakes and goodies were lopsided until she leveled the ovens with shims. But melting ice was a whole different issue. No wonder her kitchen acted like a tantrum-throwing two-year-old today, defying her at every turn. It wasn't only her kitchens at stake. Just in this room were items more valuable than her store of gourmet candy flavorings. The carpet they'd gathered on as children to open presents, the mantle where they'd hung their stockings every year, the family painting above the fireplace, all of it could be ruined by water. And then there were the elves and the reindeer to worry about. None of them could swim, and both were tied to Christmas magic. If the magic went away, the elves turned to dust and the reindeer couldn't fly. They'd be forced out into the frozen north to roam as a wild herd. Maybe they'd make it far enough to find food, but that was a slim possibility. The only way to save them was for either her or Stella to get married this year, before Christmas. She gave her sister a stern look. Stella you've got to talk to your preacher. Stella lifted her nose. He's not my preacher. Ginger nudged her. He's only dating that woman because you left him last Christmas Eve in Oregon, after kidnapping him on a sleigh with a flying reindeer, I might add. Stella sucked in hard, revealing the cords in her neck. He can date whomever he wants. Just because she's a goody-good lister doesn't mean he's in love with her. I'm focusing on Robin this year. She's the oldest, she should get married first. Robin undid her apron and folded it with crisp movements. Being the oldest and single was bad enough, having the very same fact pointed out by other people was downright embarrassing. She brushed it off with a police. It's not 1813. She hurried on before either of them caught onto her false bravado. And I agree with Ginger. 
flying away in a sleigh didn't earn you any points. In fact, flying him there with Prancer was a bad idea too. Prancer was a fast but slightly unstable reindeer with a crazy look in his eye that made everyone but Stella think twice before harnessing him to a sleigh. It was Christmas Eve. Hello, wrapping presents for the whole world ring a bell? I was on a deadline, and we barely made it. She flopped onto the couch, throwing her arms and legs out as if Christmas Eve was last night and she was exhausted. Besides, he's a pastor. He preaches miracles all the time, I've heard him. A flying sleigh shouldn't cause him that much alarm. Not enough that he wouldn't talk to me come January. She plucked at the frayed hole in her designer black jeans. Ginger gave Robin a look that said help your sister out and go along with her scheme. An internal battle began inside of Robin. On the one end of the field was her vast understanding of the damage rejection can do to a sensitive Kringle heart. Her longtime boyfriend had broken up with her three years ago, and she still felt insignificant inside when she thought of him. On the other end of the field was her sense of self-preservation. Stella had some Looney Tooney ideas, and she loved nothing more than to involve her sisters. Robin plopped on the couch and asked in a monotone voice, What did you have in mind? I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I'm curious. Stella sat up and crossed her legs. The small bells on her boots jingled as she bounced her foot. She twirled a strand of black hair around her finger. So I was watching a Hallmark movie, and I saw this commercial for a dating show. Robin shot to her feet. I'm out. She had a hard enough time flirting when there weren't witnesses, having a whole television crew watch her would be like watching the Polar Express slide off the tracks and not being able to stop it. Listen. Stella grabbed her hand to stop her from walking away. You don't have to actually go out with them on camera. They line up three possible guys, and you pick one. Super easy. You don't even have to see them. There's partitions and stuff so you're not judging them by their looks, added Ginger. What did Joseph say about this? Robin's introverted brother-in-law preferred the solitude of his woodshop to literally anything else that involved people. Well, people except for Ginger and Layla, his niece they were raising together. And maybe the Kringle clan. The poor guy had been the first one to marry into the family of five women and spent the year hiding out. Things were better when Lux brought Quick into the family. Then came Tannen. The guys hung together and got along great. Still, if anyone thought this was a harebrained idea, it would be Joseph, and she was counting on him backing her up. Ginger twisted her fingers together. He said he'd never do it, but maybe you should. What? Robin made a mental note to stop all cinnamon cookie deliveries to the woodshop. It's low risk, high reward. Ginger shrugged. Besides, we're running out of time here. Robin considered her other options and found that there weren't any. She could hit the clubs again or reopen her dating profile, but just the thought of that was tedious. Okay, I'll do it. Ee -e. Stella hopped to her feet and jumped up and down, making her hair bounce. I'm going to make you a TV star. Robin held up a palm. No. We're not playing dress up. I go as myself or I don't go at all. She tried on Stella's clothing before. Not only did it not fit her the same way it fit her icicle thin sister, the leopard print skirts and black tops muffled her happiness. The clothing she and Lux picked out, with bright splashes of color and tailored seams, brought out the woman she was, and the one she wanted to be. I agree. Ginger wrapped her arm around Robin's waist. The scent of ginger snaps overwhelmed Robin, and she wrinkled her nose. Not that she didn't love a good cookie, she just preferred fruity scents and flavors. People told her she smelled like vanilla bean. She'd always found that quite plain as far as scents and flavors went. Okay, fine. No drastic makeovers, Stella begrudgingly consented. But can we please, please, 
please ask Frost to whip up some new clothes? She got a shipment of fabric on a Black Friday deal. Robin shook her head. It's December 3rd, letters are pouring in. Yeah, but she has Tannen to help. Stella grabbed both their hands and tugged them to the door. Besides, we all know she won't sleep until after the holiday. Robin and Ginger exchanged shrugs. Frost probably would be up until the last letter was processed and the gift delivered. She had fantastic claws stamina. Even Ginger, who spent 24 hours delivering presents in an exhausting down-the-chimney, up-the-chimney routine, had to sleep every couple of days. To the mail room. Robin flopped her hand. I guess I'm going on the dating show. 30-minute match, Stella corrected. We get in, we get you a husband, we get out. Sounds like a plan. Ginger smiled. What it sounded like was a desperate attempt to trick a man into a first date. But hey, who was she to judge? She had 21 days to find a guy, fall in love, and get married. 30 minutes was about all she had to offer. Chapter 2 Gabe Security guard Gabe Fowler scanned the Spritzworks Studios lobby. Today was busy because they were filming episodes in three of the four studios in the building. The production crews and staff were anxious to wrap things up. Many of them had second jobs lined up for the holiday break between filming. Having a month off sounded great until you realized it was a month without pay. Then, it became a hardship you had to plan for and get through, especially at Christmas. The contestants for the popular game shows were the ones with smiles. They could go home with a pocket full of Christmas cash, a new TV, or, in the case of 30-minute match, a shot at true love. He rolled his eyes. Cash and a TV sounded great, but love? Come on, that only happened in the movies. He'd spent his time in foster families, and not one of the couples that took him in had a happy marriage. Even now, in the break room, he heard more complaints about spouses than he ever heard compliments or sweet stories. Even though it meant losing a paycheck, Gabe was anxious to get filming over with two. His 15-year-old brother, Nick, would be on school break and home all day. The kid didn't do well with being alone. Maybe had to do with the fact that he'd been in foster care until he was five. Gabe was 13 years older than Nick and hadn't been able to get custody of his brother until he turned 18 and gotten a steady job. By then, Nick was five and in all-day kindergarten. Gabe had worked as a private security guard on the night shift, leaving Nick with a sitter overnight and sleeping while he was in school. That worked out until four years ago, when Nick started running away at night. It was then that Gabe found the job at the studio so he could be home. Most days, their schedules met up, but there were times when Gabe worked late and Nick floundered in the loneliness. Speaking of trouble, two women with bright eyes, big purses, and a ton of energy breezed through the door. It was like trumpets announced their arrival, turning every head in the lobby their direction. The smell of vanilla and sugar wafted over him as the doors whooshed shut. Neither woman wore a heavy coat, hat, or gloves against the 25-degree weather. Their cheeks weren't flushed from the stiff wind either. Gabe leaned forward to look out the window for a car, but nothing was near the door. He narrowed his eyes, sensing that something was off with these two. I'll check us in. You check your hair. The shorter, dark-haired one handed the other a small hand mirror and pranced off to the receptionist's desk. The taller woman with the auburn hair did a quick assessment and then stashed the mirror in her shiny black purse with two leather tassels. She had on a pair of tight jeans that brought to mind the term painted on. Not because they were indecent, but because they fit her so well. Gabe had always liked long-legged women. Cameron Diaz had nothing on this girl. Her top, a flowing red blouse, hung loose while allowing her natural curves to tease. The thing that got him the most was that she wasn't working what her mama gave her. Not like the other women who walked through that door intent on taking the leap into fame and fortune who strutted and sashayed and shimmied. 
This lady was dazzling without even trying. Gabe was halfway across the lobby before he knew his feet were moving. There was something magical about her. When he stopped in front of her, she turned a pair of big gray eyes on him. Yes? His tongue sat limp in his mouth. His mind was empty. Did I do something wrong? She asked, her perfect red lips pouting slightly as she glanced at his security badge. Wrong? He asked. Her voice had a definite Scarlett Johansson quality to it, a little bit of danger and a whole lot of confidence. Your security? She pointed to his chest, where his credentials hung from a lanyard. Yes. Wait. He needed to say words out loud. Yes. I'm security. Preferably words that weren't the same as hers. He could talk about his job. I'll need to search that bag. She gripped the shoulder strap and turned slightly so the purse was out of his reach. Why? Do I look sketchy or something? Her eyebrow lifted slightly. He laughed easily before catching himself and schooling his expression. Security guards weren't supposed to flirt with the contestants. It's routine, ma'am. She wrinkled her nose as if the word ma'am was distasteful. Some ladies didn't like to be called ma'am, it made them feel old. He should have called her miss. His eyes darted to her hand, still clutching the bag as if it held jewels and gold. She didn't have a wedding ring. Miss it would be from here on out. But you didn't check their bags. She motioned to the fifteen other people milling about, filling out their paperwork or chatting on their phones while they waited for their names to be called to go backstage. Well, they weren't sketch. He shrugged. She grinned, and he had the impression she was happy with herself. No one's ever called me that before. She flipped her hair over her shoulder. He liked feistiness on her. Liked it so much more than he should. One side of his mouth lifted in a goofy smile. What do they call you? She considered him, and he had the distinct desire to puff out his chest. Robin. The name fit. She had the grace of a bird, along with delicate fingers and large eyes that seemed to take him in and take his measure. I'm Gabriel. Gabe, I mean. Gabe. Why had he given her his full name? No one used it. He must sound like an idiot. Her companion took that moment to reappear, grabbing onto Robin with a purpose. They want us to wait in the flower room for pictures and then come back tomorrow for filming. She followed Robin's gaze to Gabe and looked him over. Hello there, sailor. She winked. Where he'd found Robin enchanting, this woman was brassy and bold, and frankly, she scared him a little. I'm no sailor, he said to shut down her flirting. He spun on his heel and headed back to his position by the drinking fountain. The warm and rich scent of vanilla followed him, leaving the feeling that he'd been enchanted with Miss Robin. He covertly watched the women walk through the soundproof doors. Robin set something inside of him off-center, which was strange, because no woman had ever had that effect on him before. His practical side kicked in and reasoned that it was bound to happen at least once in his life. He was a man, after all. And men were attracted to beautiful women. He'd been enticed by others, but never so befuddled as to hand over his full name or forget to search her bag. He hoped he hadn't made her nervous. Just before the doors closed, Robin glanced over her shoulder. Her brows pulled together, as if she were trying to figure him out. His breath caught. He lifted his hand to wave, but the doors closed quickly and he dropped it again. The room felt ordinary without Robin in it. In the absence of Robin's effervescence, a fresh sense of mortification washed over him. He'd flirted while on the clock. Flirted like a teenager without a care. Not that he'd know what that looked like. When he was seventeen, he'd gone to high school and bagged groceries. No girl wanted to date the kid who had just moved in and was just as likely to move out the next week. 
Robin would be no different. She'd see right through his pressed uniform to the orphan inside and walk away. He glanced at the doors where she disappeared. It was best if he didn't think of her again. Robin plucked at the tassels on her purse wondering what had happened in the lobby with that cute guard. Gabe. Usually, when Stella turned on the charm, no man could resist. Charming was part of the Christmas magic she inherited from their father, Santa Claus. It came in handy with nervous children and for Stella, with nervous men. Or confident men. Or any man with a pulse. Not for the first time in her life, Robin wished she'd gotten that particular trait. But Christmas magic hasn't sprinkled on her in that way. She could manage a kitchen full of elves and ovens, cook and bake any recipe without fail, prove herself as a world-class chocolatier, detect when someone was lying, though she was unable to lie herself, and sense physical and sometimes emotional needs in people often before they identified them themselves. But attract men like she was giving away free candy canes? Not unless she actually was giving away free candy canes. Gabe hadn't fallen for Stella's charm, though. That left her puzzled in a pleasant way. She'd sensed a need in him for connection, and Stella had offered one. So why didn't he take it? That guy was a real Scrooge McSour face. Stella flicked her dark red fingernails in Gabe's general direction. Thankfully, he hadn't searched Robin's magic bag. Who knew what he would have found in there? The bags worked on wishes. Any Kringle could put her hand in and pull out a wish, jewelry to match her outfit, holiday decorations, a driver's license from any part of the world, a chocolate bar, whatever. They'd never tested them with non-Kringles, though, so Robin didn't know what Gabe would have seen inside. He could have found an empty bag. Or he could have pulled out a set of golf clubs, which would have been hard to explain. Instead of worrying about her purse, Robin thought of Gabe's gentle teasing. Not outright flirting, but a cute, stammering approach that seemed humble and earnest. She smiled to herself. I don't know. He had some good list qualities about him. If you're talking about his packs, I'll agree. Stella hooked their elbows together and made a sour face. Let's forget about the grumpy security guard and focus on finding you a husband. Please try, for the love of peanut brittle, to stifle your need to take care of everyone. Only if you'll stop charming everything with two legs, Robin fired back. Ouch. I can't help that I'm irresistible. Stella winked at a guy carrying a Christmas tree prop. He tripped over his own feet and slammed the tree into the wall. Several plastic baubles fell and bounced across the hallway. Robin pulled to a stop to help him retrieve the props. Stella put her hand to the side of her face and ducked her head. Sometimes, she didn't know the strength of her own charm. And I can't help that I'm nice. Robin bent to retrieve an ornament that had rolled into her foot. She hung it on a branch while the guy looked for the rest, his ears redder than an elf's. Ushering Stella away from the poor in turn, she asked, What can you tell me about my future husband prospects? There are three. Stella practically glowed at the news. She increased their pace, reading name cards on doors as they went. The show will pick them for you, based on the questionnaire I filled out online, and you'll get to choose from the sprinkles on top of the dating cupcake. And you don't know who they are? This was starting to feel a little like a tagless gift under the tree, frustrating and unsatisfying. They came upon a door labeled Flower Room and went inside. There were giant hibiscuses painted on the far wall in pink and purple. The couch was lime green. The floor was white. The stale smell of a forgotten pine air freshener tainted the air. No man can hide from me. Stella cracked her knuckles. Give me ten minutes to get into their mainframe, and I'll find out all you need to know about the contestants. She pulled a computer from her magic purse and settled onto the couch. Robin could jump into a big sister lecture on privacy laws and the difference between gathering info and stalking, but then she wouldn't get the download on her potential true loves. Oh, 
The moral dilemmas faced when searching for her one and only. She chewed her lip for a moment before plopping next to her sister. All right, what have you got? Stella glared at the screen. I think we need to call Ginger in on this one. You're going to want to review the naughty list. Robin's heart sank as she texted the male contestant names to Ginger. She threw Gabriel's first name in there too, and his city, her curiosity about the man overriding her good sense. She'd felt something in the lobby, well, she'd felt a lot of things in the lobby. With that many people in one space, it was hard not to be crushed by their needs. So many people in the world had a desire to be loved that wasn't being met. The feelings she sensed in Gabe were different in that they had been aimed at her, specifically. The sensations they created were, inviting. Which was strange, because Kringles were impervious to temperature changes. Her phone dinged a reply from Ginger, and she scrolled through the disheartening information. I can't date these men. They're all on the naughty list. Except for Gabe, but she kept his info off the screen in case Stella looked over her shoulder. Stella frowned. Love can change people, Robin. You've got to give at least one of them a chance. That's true. Her brother-in-law Quick had been a recluse in Alaska, living off the land and his wits, before he'd met Lux. He was a doting husband, something his Santa stats would never have predicted. Okay, I'll give it a try. Who knows? Maybe I'll meet my husband tomorrow. Stella clapped her hands. You're going to make the most beautiful bride. In Robin's head, she could see the dress, the twinkling lights on the Christmas trees, and her family gathered around for a small, intimate ceremony. The only blank spot was the groom. Stella's phone rang with an alarm. Shoot. Moisture is messing with the printer in the board game room. She cast a worried look to the ceiling before typing a hasty reply. The sooner we get you married, the better. Robin couldn't agree more. Chapter 3 Gabe Gabe plowed through the snow on his driveway and glared at the dark windows of his condo. Nick should have shoveled the driveway when he'd gotten home from school. Now they'd need ice melt to get it clear. Another expense. The difference between his place and his festive neighbors only made his scowl deepen. They hadn't put up Christmas lights, or a tree, or any decorations, really. What was the point when it all had to come down in less than a month? Unless you were old Lady Miller at the end of the block. She left her lights on until Valentine's Day. He cut the engine and stepped out of the truck, stuffing his hands into his pockets to keep warm. Nick was probably in his room, watching a video or something, not doing his homework. His grades had slipped into solid C and D territory over the last semester. Getting the kid to care about life was half the battle. Gabe had promised to take him ice skating tonight if he'd caught up in English. He barreled through the door, ready to go to battle. Nick had no idea how good he had it. While Gabe had bounced from home to home during his teenage years, Nick had stayed in the same house and school. Was it fancy? No. Sometimes they were lucky to scrape enough together for pizza delivery. But they had a home. Gabe would have given anything for that kind of stability in his life. Nick, he yelled up the narrow staircase next to the patch of linoleum where they removed their shoes. No answer came. He growled and plodded up the stairs. Stupid headphones. Tapping on Nick's door, he pushed it open to find the room just as dark as the hallway and empty. Gabe cursed. Not again. He jogged through the house, checking the bathroom and even his small closet, his heart beating rapidly. No sign of Nick. With a quick intake of breath, he pulled out his phone and activated the tracker app. He hated to use it on his brother, but it was the only way he could keep track of him when Nick decided to bolt. It wasn't like he'd left a note behind, telling him where he was going and what he was doing and why he didn't want to live here. His chest ached at the thought. 
He was failing as an older brother slash father figure, but he was doing the best he knew how. It wasn't like he'd had a strong example to follow. Most of the men he'd lived with had a stay out of my way attitude. As much as Gabe wanted to be closer to Nick, he didn't know how to make that happen. A small blue dot blinked at the bus station. Gabe rushed down the steps and was back in his small truck before the cold could grab his breath away. He drove to the seedy side of town, cringing as he thought of his brother walking through these streets. They weren't safe in the daylight, let alone the darkness that descended early in the winter. As he got closer, he could make out Nick's six-foot skinny frame inside the front window. He was standing by a fake Christmas tree void of presents. The branches drooped like Nick's shoulders, as if the plastic needles understood the griminess around them. A homeless woman took up the only bench inside, her shopping cart parked next to her, her arm thrown over the top of it protectively as she eyed Nick. His brother might be a runaway, but he wasn't a thief. Gabe decided not to get out of the car and cause a scene in his uniform. He let out the breath he'd been holding as he pulled in front of the window and honked. Nick's gaze tore away from the tree. He had that defeated stare, the one that made teachers throw their hands up in the air. Gabe motioned for him to come out. He walked slowly, his shoulders hunched as if carrying the weight of the world. For some reason, his posture grated on Gabe. A little gratitude would be nice. Life wasn't all roses and fancy hotels for Gabe either. He rolled down the passenger's side window. Where you going? He bit out, wanting to yell so much more but holding back. Nowhere. I don't have any money. Nick rubbed his red nose. He must have just gotten there when Gabe located him on the app. He hadn't had time to thaw out inside the building. So why are you making me chase you clear across town? Gabe glared out the windshield. Maybe this was a weird trust thing for his brother. He just needed to know someone would chase after him. Or perhaps he was running after a better life, he wasn't going to find it on the streets. No answer came. Nick wasn't exactly a deep kid, and Gabe was too emotionally wrung out from years of watching his own back to start a heart-to-heart. -heart. Get in, he said, softer this time. Nick opened the door, and Gabe rolled up the window. With a sigh, he pulled out of the parking lot. All he wanted was something to eat and a few minutes of quiet where he could mull over his interaction with Robin that afternoon. She was a bright light in an otherwise dim world. Tomorrow would be the last time she'd come through the building. If he worked it right, he'd be in studio with her. The skating rink is the other way. Nick pointed east. Startled by the sound of his voice, Gabe jerked his head. We're not going. He drove faster, knowing there was an argument coming and wishing he could, for once, have the night off. This kid had a chip on his shoulder the size of a grocery store. Why not? I can't reward you when you run away. You know that. Years of counseling should have taught Nick something. But no, he always had to push. Always had to try Gabe's patience. He hit the brakes hard at a yellow light, throwing them both forward. You're such a jerk. Nick glared out the window. Gabe turned in his seat. You think I wouldn't like to have an easy evening hanging out with you? You think I spend all day looking for ways to ruin your life? Dude, I would love to have my little brother back. The light changed to green, illuminating the dashboard. Nick glared at his feet. Gabe turned forward and drove them home in strained silence. Just as he opened the door, Nick said, I wish I had a real family. Yeah, well, I'm all you've got, Gabe fired back, barely biting off the and I'm the only one who wanted you that tried to slip out with that jab. Nick slammed the door behind him and ran in the house. Gabe turned off the engine and let the cold seep into the truck and wrap its bony fingers around him. Truth was, he wished the same thing. Parenting would be a heck of a lot easier if he had someone to share it with. 
His neighbor's lights flashed, and the plastic Santa out front waved cheerily. As a kid, he'd wished so many times for a real family that he'd lost count of the wishes. But wishing never made anything happen, and he'd learned fast that the only person he could count on was himself. He shoved aside the hollow feeling in his heart and pushed open the truck door. No matter how hard Nick pushed, Gabe would stand firm, because his brother deserved to have someone who cared. Maybe one day Gabe could focus on finding someone special. This just wasn't the time. And Robin wasn't that woman. She was much too cheerful, cultured, sketch. He chuckled inside as he remembered the light in her eyes at being labeled a troublemaker. He believed her when she said she'd never been called that before. Even though he shouldn't think about her, he looked forward to seeing Robin tomorrow. He checked the schedule, and she was a contestant on 30-minute match. He didn't love the idea of her on a dating game, but there wasn't much he could do about that. Besides, it wasn't like those dates ever turned into anything serious. In the two seasons the show had been on, not one real love match came out of it. There were rumors the network was going to shut it down. Even though he shouldn't, he decided that a moment of flirting with her, should the opportunity arise, would be enough to get him through the holidays. Just the thought of a stolen moment with her lifted his heart enough that he was able to head inside and face the stone-cold silence from his little brother. Chapter 4 Robin popped a chocolate-covered cherry in her mouth to soothe her nerves. She could really go for something stronger, like a pixie stick with all that sugary goodness, because her nerves were through the roof. Being on television was worse than riding in the sleigh with Stella at the reins and Prancer flying out front. That crazy reindeer had almost flown them into the side of a mountain. When Robin protested, he had the audacity to snicker. Tomorrow they'd bring Starling, she was the mother hen of the herd. Her hide was almost white, so when she was coupled to a white sleigh, she'd be camouflaged on the roof. Prancer could stay in the stables and think about his attitude. We're looking for a real love match here, Stella told the executive producer, Jerry. We want to find the love of Robin's life. He nodded while flipping through papers on a clipboard and making notes. That's our goal too. Right. Stella winked at Robin. The wink did nothing to calm Robin's nerves. When Stella was crafty, things tended to get out of hand for those around her. But we want the works really pull out the stops for this girl. Jerry shook his head, never looking up from his papers. Look, we don't do special treatment for any contestant. Stella templed her fingers and tapped them on her chin. What if I could promise you a wedding before Christmas? Would that interest your viewers? Jerry snapped the papers in place and turned his full attention to Stella. Are you serious? He rotated to Robin. You'd be willing to get married on camera this Christmas? Well, uh, Robin glared at Stella. I've always loved the idea of a Christmas wedding, she said weakly. Jerry's need for higher ratings and an in with the network to score some prime holiday time practically screamed at her. She had a hard time turning down the volume on her Santa gift so she could hear what he was saying. A 30-minute match Christmas special. His hand formed a rainbow through the air in front of them. Following you from this show to dating, to engagement, to surprise wedding, well, surprise for our viewers. There's a lot of work to do, but I think we could pull this off. We just need to film this episode first and get you a guy. He smacked his open palm against the clipboard, making Robin jump. She eyed the sugar packets on the drink table. Would anyone notice if she downed a few of those before the cameras turned on? Jerry was in full swing, counting the zeros on his January paycheck and accepting his wife's congratulations. Ah, he really loved her and wanted to make her proud. This show was his baby, and it was failing, costing him hours at home with his family and putting a strain on his marriage. Robin could be the key to making so many things in his life go right. Her head swam with the urgency to solve Jerry's problems. Curse her Santa gift, she was twirling out of control. 
Stella put a steadying hand on her arm. Physical contact helped break up the waves. She reached for her sister and held on. Jerry checked his watch. We've got 20 minutes before filming. Let's talk to the director and see what she thinks. Yes, let's. Stella took his arm and hustled him away. She threw a look over her shoulder, probably to make sure Robin hadn't passed out. Don't worry about me, Robin said to their backs, I'll just hang out here. She flipped on her heel and went for the drink station, ripped open a sugar packet, and threw it back. Hmm, better. She took in the other offerings. Coffee but no cocoa. What a shame. Sugar was great, but nothing beat the soothing effects of a good hot chocolate. She reached into her magical Kringle bag and wished for a Christmas mug in the shape of a tree and some of her favorite hot chocolate mix. She preferred to make cocoa on the stove with cream and melted Italian chocolate, but this would have to do. The hot water dispenser didn't disappoint, and soon she was sipping liquid coping skills. She turned, and her eyes fell on the security guard who had called her sketchy yesterday. Gabe. He was like a ganache, thick, tempting, and delicious. A uniform did good things for him, but she wondered what he'd look like in loose pajama bottoms and a tight t-shirt. Her heart flipped over, and her grip loosened on the mug. She caught it before she dropped it completely and scolded herself for almost spilling. She hadn't expected to see him again, not after scouring the lobby for him when they'd first walked in. But there he was in his handsome black security uniform, his hair neatly combed and his muscles all muscly. She glanced quickly away, lest he catch her staring. All it took was that one lengthy perusal, and the link was established between his needs and her Santa sense. Her head rang with his exhaustion. He needed sleep. And, she cocked her head, food. Not junk food, but hearty comfort food. Before she knew what she was doing, her hand was in her purse, wishing for a warm banana muffin. Her feet carried her across the room, a need to answer the siren call to bring cheer to the cheerless. You look like you could use this. She lifted the bag, the scent of warm cinnamon filling the air between them. She stared at the ground, embarrassed at being so forward but unable to back away. Thanks? He took the sack and opened it, drawing in a deep breath. Did you make this? His question triggered yet another of her Santa-inherited qualities, the inability to tell a lie. For out of the five sisters had gotten Santa's truth-telling gene. Frost, the one who didn't, had kept a deep, dark secret right up until Christmas last year. Robin scrambled for an appropriate response. Saying she had a magic purse that fulfilled her wishes would have her hauled off to the loony bin. But the pressure inside her throat, the one that squeezed until the truth came out, forced her to say something. It's a special recipe, she rushed out. Which it was, because it was made by her purse and that was special. Her throat relaxed and she sighed with relief. Robin watched with interest as he took a bite. Her baked goods, whether they came from a purse or from an oven, were food for the soul, not just the stomach. Ask any child which tasted better, a chocolate Santa from the store or one found in their stocking on Christmas morning, and they'd tell you, the stocking chocolate was better. Why? Because Robin added a dash of Christmas magic to each recipe. Also, a warm muffin could do wonders for a person's outlook on life. Case in point, the magic worked Gabe over with the first bite. His eyes grew brighter and opened wider, his skin lost its sallow appearance, and the shadows under his eyes disappeared. Still, there was something missing. You need cocoa. She hurried back to the table, made her wishes, and returned with a steaming mug. He grinned, taking a tentative sip. The tightness around his eyes melted away. Thanks, Sketch. That was just what I needed. Her whole body tingled at the nickname, or maybe it was the way his eyes took her in. Like he saw her and liked what he saw. I know. 
His eyebrows pulled together, and she wanted to reach up and smooth them back out. How'd you know? he asked. Her throat began to tighten. Everyone needs cocoa at Christmas time, she rushed to say. The strain lessened. She'd forgotten what it was like to talk to someone outside of her family. She needed to be more careful about what popped out of her mouth. Gabe chuckled. He had a cleft in his chin she hadn't noticed the day before. She liked it. Robin tucked a loose strand of hair behind her ear, ruining the perfectly must look Stella had worked so hard to create. A lighting technician walked by, and the strong sense of loneliness tugged at her Santa sense. As much as she wanted to stand there and bask in Gabe's royal blue eyes, set off beautifully by his black shirt, the wardrobe supervisor needed mint tea to calm her stomach and soothe her worries over spending the holidays with her boyfriend's family. And the set director had a powerful hankering for strawberry streusel. I, uh, need to check on a few people. She stepped backward, easing the internal demand that she act now to spread cheer. Thanks again. Gabe lifted the mug in a salute. Robin grinned. Every year she baked for the whole world without expecting a thank you. The words were like warm caramel drizzled over her heart. You're welcome. Her hand was already in her purse, retrieving a pastry for the set director. She flipped around so she wouldn't run into anyone and handed off the goodie with a smile. He was surprised but pleased. Wow. I was just thinking about my mom's streusel. This is amazing. Merry Christmas. She hurried over to hold a ladder for a sound technician. While she stood there, she gave an intern a pen when hers ran out of ink. When the technician hopped down, she headed for the kitchen prep area to open a bottle of olives for the caterer. A blur of Merry Christmases and Happy Holidays followed like a tornado. Actually, she was the tornado, meeting as many needs as possible. Jen wanted to talk about her recent breakup. Brad had a crush on a woman in his building and needed a pickup line, Robin handed him a box of mint truffles. Trust me, she'll love them. He grinned. I'm going to give them to her as a neighbor gift. Perfect. Robin lifted on her toes. The room buzzed with energy and fizzed with holiday cheer. She dusted off her palms. Behind her, the hallway to the main offices called. Someone couldn't find a stapler. In seconds, she knocked on the accountant's door and offered to organize his top drawer. That was his real need. She was refilling the janitor's glass cleaner when Stella threw open the supply door closet. There you are. She rushed in and took Robin by the hand. The contact jolted Robin out of her compulsive need to serve others and allowed her to recenter her thoughts. She blinked several times. We've been looking all over for you, Stella scolded her. Robin tuned in to her sister. Stella needed for this show to go well. Though why her sister was so invested in 30-minute match escaped her. That was one problem with her Santa gift, it didn't always give motives. Some physical ailments were easy to spot, a lot of that was reading body language. Emotional reasoning was complex and layered and not as easily deciphered. She took in her surroundings, unsure how she'd ended up so far away from the studio. Robin, called the receptionist, Sarah. I followed your advice and called my mom. You were so right. She and Dad want to go on the cruise with me this Christmas. We've booked our tickets. Robin glowed with the joy flowing off her new friend. Have a great time. Don't forget the sunscreen. Stella tugged her arm. Can you put a cork in Miss Nice List for a bit? We have work to do. I tried, Robin protested. I was doing fantastic until, she nodded her head toward Gabe, who was standing against the wall. He couldn't blend in if he tried. He was like a gourmet cupcake amidst cookie crumbs. Robin leaned toward him, reaching for his needs. No! 
Stella jumped between them and dropped her hand over Robin's eyes. I have worked too hard to get you into this show and find you a husband. Focus. Right. Robin repeated the word focus over and over in her head as they made their way onto the blue carpet. The set was arranged so that she was seated next to a podium where the host, Brian Douglas, would direct the question and answer period of the show. Stella sat her in the gray chair, adjusting her hair and lifting her chin, shoving her shoulders back and tucking her ankles together as if she were a Barbie doll on display. Robin tolerated it because, when it came right down to it, she needed to find a husband. The North Pole was melting, and if she didn't fall in love, true love, then her whole world would melt away. Chapter 5 Gabe watched Stella arrange Robin on set. He'd worked 30-minute match dozens of times and had never seen a contestant come in with a handler. Mother? Yes. Best friend? Sure. But an agent-type person who arranged each hair in place and dusted her cheeks with something shimmery was a first. All morning, Robin had bounced from one person to another, doing whatever she could to lighten the load. Her energy seemed endless, and she never asked for anything in return. The crew adored her now. Who wouldn't love a beautiful woman handing out baked goods and office supplies? He could use some of that energy. If he bottled it up and sold it on QVC, he could make a fortune. Also, he felt really good. Too good for the rough night he had listening for Nick to sneak out again. He hadn't, but that didn't mean Gabe could relax. The cat and mouse game was exhausting. Why couldn't Nick see how good he had it? Gabe would have given anything to have the same address for longer than a year and an older sibling to watch over him. Instead of being grateful, Nick resented every step Gabe took to parent him, including checking up on his grades. Logging into the school website last night was a bad idea and only brought Gabe's spirits lower. The whole situation made him feel like a failure. Worse, he had no idea how to change things. So, the fact that his chest was all warm and happy had him worried that Robin had drugged him with that muffin. He wasn't the only one. Goofy smiles followed all the treats she'd handed out. She'd said something about a special recipe. He narrowed his eyes as he scoped the room and casually sniffed his fingers. He'd have to keep an eye on this girl. Not an entirely horrible prospect, as she was the prettiest woman in the room. The lights dimmed, and the director's assistant called for quiet on the set. Gabe clasped his hands in front of him and tried to watch the doors more than Robin. His eyes were drawn to her of their own accord, and he had to count to three to get them to move about the room again. Brian's booming voice filled the cavern. Welcome to 30-Minute Match. The intro music came through the speakers, and the small screens above the cameras showed a live feed of the opening sequence, describing how the show worked. One lucky lady, Robin's smiling face, appeared on screen. She has great presence, whispered the assistant director to the director, Chelsea. Her slight shyness will have the country falling in love with her before she speaks, answered Chelsea, her voice full of greedy pleasure. Gabe's protective instincts perked up. It was one thing for Robin to be on the show, but another to exploit her. He'd caught snippets of rumors floating around about a Christmas special. Which would be great, because it meant extra money. He'd been careful to save up so he didn't have to bag groceries over the break. He hated going back to the store and seeing the pity in the manager's eyes. Let's meet our men hoping for a match today. Brian gave the camera his game show grin. First up is Kylo. Kylo is 28 and works in a motorcycle repair shop. Kylo gave the camera a smirk as he walked to his seat on the other side of the partition from Robin. He had tats running up his arms and going up his neck wrapping around his ear. His dark eyes glinted with danger. His jeans were old and frayed, and his t-shirt was two sizes too small. Gabe's eyes darted to Robin. Her smile was frozen in place. Did her eye tick? 
Our next guest, Oliver, graduated top of his class and manages investment portfolios. Bachelor number two wore a light gray suit and a blue button-up. His hair was slicked back, and his skin was shiny. Robin lightly pressed her finger to the corner of her eye. It was ticking. Our final guest is Logan. He's a wedding photographer. He's on the lookout for his own special match. Robin grimaced for a brief moment before writing her expression. Gabe watched her closer. She shifted around in her seat as if the chair were made of jacks. What was her deal? Was she nervous about being on the show, or was there more to her obvious discomfort? He wished he could tell her that he was there, that he wouldn't let anyone hurt her. Robin's eyes met his for a brief moment, and her cheeks flushed pink. She looked quickly away, focusing back on Brian. Gentlemen, this is Robin. She's a world-class chocolatier and manager over a commercial kitchen. She listens to Christmas music all year long and enjoys long walks in the snow and kisses under the mistletoe. All righty. Brian twisted his body so his good side was to the camera while he talked to Robin. Let the questions begin. Who do you want to start with, Robin? Robin pressed her lips together as if she were debating within. A rapid movement to Gabe's left grabbed his attention away from the stage. Stella waved her arms frantically, as if trying to ward off a swarm of bees. Odd. He swiveled his head to see if Robin noticed. If she did, she didn't give an indication. Instead, she clasped her hands together and hooked them over her knee. I'd like to start with Logan, if you don't mind. We don't mind at all. Brian winked at the camera. He did that a lot. From what Gabe had heard, the female viewers loved it. Hi, Logan, she said in that sexy voice of hers. Hello there, beautiful, he responded with confidence. Gabe rolled his eyes. Robin smirked, telling everyone at home she wasn't impressed with his flattery, especially since he hadn't seen her yet. Logan, exactly how many couples have you stood up on their wedding day? I, what? Logan's confident demeanor slipped 40 degrees. What do you mean? Robin tipped her head. You took Mark and Terry's deposit and then pull a no-show on their big day. Didn't you? Gabe gapped. This was not how the game went normally. In fact, Robin wasn't at all like the normal, giggling contestant. She was calm and invested on a whole other level. The result was extremely attractive, making Gabe want to take a seat as bachelor number four. That was a ridiculous idea. He couldn't woo a woman as sophisticated and put together as Robin. She'd see right through his barely keeping it together situation. Uh, beads of sweat began to form on Logan's forehead. Is this some kind of hidden camera show? Robin's eyes widened, and a light of understanding went on inside of her. Something in Gabe cheered her on as she geared up for another blow. You're supposed to be at a wedding right now. She scared and shook her head. Chelsea stared in awe. It was like watching a train careen towards the end of the track and she had no idea how to stop the inevitable crash. Logan looked right in the camera and then bolted from the stage. Gabe let him go. There was no reason to hold him there, and he was glad to have the creep as far away from Robin as possible. Brian looked at the director for help. Chelsea lifted her hands. This was out of the norm. If Robin had come for a showdown with Logan, she was done and would walk away. But she didn't. She sat there as if she was waiting to meet the next guy in line. The assistant director stepped forward and signaled for them to keep rolling. The show was low budget, and it wasn't often that they stopped the cameras. Well, I guess we can rule him out. Brian chuckled good-naturedly. Who's next, Robin? She cleared her throat. Kylo, what do you really do for a living? Bachelor number one's dark eyes went hard. 
Gabe's instincts kicked in. This guy was off. His jittery hands did nothing to instill confidence, and the way he tensed said that he was ready for a fight. Gabe reached for his taser and moved into position next to the stage. Kylo looked Gabe over, locking eyes in a battle of who's tougher. There was something deviant in Kylo that would have Gabe backing away from an altercation. If he saw this guy on the street, he'd cross to the other side. But with Robin sitting less than ten feet away, he couldn't back down. I don't have to take this. Kylo slowly got up. He walked across the stage, making eye contact with Robin as he did. Who do you know? He growled. Hey! Gabe barked, drawing Kylo's attention. If you're going, go. Otherwise, I'll have to ask you to leave. Kylo pointed at Robin. You keep your mouth shut. Robin gasped. Gabe stepped forward, his taser in his hand. Kylo glared at him and moseyed off the stage. Gabe followed him out the door and made sure it was shut behind him. As soon as he was gone, a sense of lightness returned to the room. He hadn't noticed the darkness until it disappeared. Robin fairly glowed with the light, whatever it was. An inner sense of joy? Happiness? Christmas cheer? Brian shook his head and then perked up. Well, I guess we know who you're going out with tonight. Robin shook her head. Sorry. I'm pretty sure Oliver has something he'd like to get off his chest. Gabe swung his attention to the remaining contestant. He had sweat marks on his shirt. Where Kylo had been all threats, this guy was a cornered rabbit. He had to know Robin was going to talk to him next. Okay. Okay. I barely graduated from a certificate program and lost all my money in a pyramid scheme two months ago. This suit is the only thing I have left. Robin planted her feet and leaned forward on her elbows, putting off the vibe of a good therapist. Why'd you come here today? Her soothing voice invited confidence, like a spell cast over the entire studio. Oliver swallowed. I wanted someone to look at me like I meant something. A soft smile played on Robin's full lips. Even though Oliver had been talking, Gabe couldn't take his eyes off of her. That's what we all want, Oliver. There's nothing wrong with that. I think you have a lot of love in your heart, and you want to share it. Is there someone special in your life? Oliver ducked his head. I met someone online. She doesn't know the real me. Why don't you ask her out? Robin prodded. Because I don't want her to find out I'm a failure. Gabe's shirt felt too tight. Oliver's raw honesty was hard to watch, and he wasn't used to discussing feelings with anyone. A wave of embarrassment for this poor guy washed over him. Here's the thing about us ladies, Oliver. The whole crew leaned forward to listen as if Robin were about to hand out the secrets to the universe. As long as you don't fail us, we think you're Superman. Do you think you can protect her heart? Gabe blinked, letting the words sink in. Was that true? A guy could be as much of a screw-up as Oliver, and a woman could think he was golden as long as he was good at loving her? He wanted to believe that. Not for Oliver's sake, but for his own. Because if that was true, then even a guy like him had a shot with a woman like Robin. Oliver nodded slowly. I think I'd be really good at loving her. Robin sat up. Then go for it. Just don't let her down. And if you do, her eyes twinkled. Then you'd better make it right, right quick. I will. Oliver beamed. Robin settled in, the matter at hand taken care of. She seemed to come to herself and realize she was on a dating game show and didn't have a guy left. Oh! Her hands flew to her mouth. I've ruined your show. I'm so sorry, she apologized to Brian. 
Stella huffed loudly, but she smiled as if she was proud of her sister for calling the guys on their crap. Brian nodded slowly. He was off script now. Let me ask you, Robin, why'd you come on our show? She fidgeted with a ring on her right hand. Truthfully, I wanted to find a husband. Her fidgeting stopped. Gabe spent a lot of time learning to read people. She wasn't lying. In fact, he wondered if she even could. The more he watched her, the more he liked her. Which was dangerous ground to be on, but also, exciting. That's a bold declaration, observed Brian. You're not just looking for a night out on us? The show paid for a date in exchange for the couple doing after interviews. She shook her head. I want a man to share Christmas with, forever. I want mistletoe kisses and magic sleigh rides and cozying in front of the fire and all the holiday trimmings shared with family. That sounded good to Gabe. He found himself stepping forward, raising his hand to volunteer. An intern grabbed him before he entered the lights and tugged him backward. The jerk away from the stage also jerked him out of his head. Thanks, he whispered. The kid had saved him from humiliation. He shook his head, trying to shake off the beautiful dream Robin had created in his mind. It felt so close, like he could reach out and grab it. He shrank back into the shadows. Brian and Robin talked a few more minutes, and then Chelsea yelled, Cut! Chatter erupted, and Stella rushed forward to grab Robin in a whispered conference. We've got to find this girl a husband, said Chelsea. Heads bobbed all around. Gabe gripped his hands into fists. The dream Robin wove into his head with her interview was alive in him, and he hated the idea of another man in his spot. Chapter 6 Robin paced the flower room, her phone pressed to her ear. The news from the North Pole wasn't good. She shouldn't be down here when everything at home was falling apart, er, melting. She'd adjusted several recipes for humidity, but chocolate was going to be a real issue. Tempering required temperature control, and at this point, they had none. Roxy, the head candy elf, was efficient and capable, but also frazzled and upset that her world was melting away. Robin didn't even want to think about what would happen if she didn't get married. Some of her closest friends would turn to elf and dust. Why had she let her Santa senses take over and grill those guys on camera? I think running the ovens is making stuff melt faster. Roxy's voice went up in pitch. Robin frowned. I arranged for a kitchen in Alaska with 24 ovens. Lux should have it wired and ready to go in three hours. Can you sneak some elves down there? We'll have to store things on site. That's fine. There's a warehouse. They'll freeze, so don't do candies or chocolates. Gummies are out too. Pastries will do fine, Roxy replied. Okay, then. Start with the panettone, then move on to the Christmas pudding. I'll be home tonight. She hung up just as Stella stormed through the door like a flurry. You ruined everything. Her words were coded in a need for acknowledgement and understanding. Robin was quick to answer the unspoken first. You have done an amazing job getting this all set up. I wouldn't have been here without you. Stella sank into a chair. I'm not sure what other avenue to explore. We're running out of husband opportunities. Robin patted her hand. I asked for another crop of men. We'll see if they'll be up for trying again or if they're going to send us packing. She dropped her forehead into her hands. Robin rubbed her back. Even though she was the one who had missed out on finding love today, she offered comfort to her sister. Still, there was a part of her that needed to point out the obvious. Besides, you were the one who hacked into the system and ran background checks on the guys. If I didn't know those things about them, I wouldn't have called them out. Stella flapped her hand over like uncooked dough. 
your Santa senses would have picked up on something. True, Robin acknowledged. She was about to ask why Stella was so emotionally invested in Robin getting married when there was a light tap on the door. The director, the producer, and an intern filed in. Chelsea, the director, spoke first. We've reviewed the footage and, she lifted a shoulder. We like what we see. It deviated heavily from our regular programming, but we're going to air it tonight and gauge viewers' response. Basically, we have nothing to lose, said the producer, Jerry. Our rankings have tanked over the last year, and the network is talking of cutting us loose. We're hoping this will shake things up, especially if we can get a love match on the show. The key to it working will be Robin, added Chelsea, turning all of her attention on Robin and all of her internal voices. Her need for this job was wrapped up in her daughter, perhaps something about paying for college. She continued, you're genuine. Even when you're accusing a man of fraud, you're real. How did you know about that, anyway? She scratched the back of her neck, trying to appear casual, but Robin picked up on her anxiety that they had a leak in the studio. Stella piped up. Google search. She lifted her phone. Robin lifted an eyebrow, but she didn't sense a lie coming from Stella. Maybe it was as easy as googling the men. Chelsea seemed to buy the explanation. The intern took notes on everything, his head bent. He handed Jerry a paper. One other thing. Jerry scanned the sheet. Kylo made several threats on the way out of the building, besides the one we got on film that was directed at Robin. What? Robin squeaked. Her hand flew to her throat. She'd never been threatened before. She wasn't the type of person who made waves or confronted bad guys. She worked with elves, for the love of peanut butter fudge. Jerry nodded. We think it would be a good idea to have someone escort you home tonight. We don't exactly live close, Robin hedged, looking for a way out. She couldn't very well tell them that she lived at the North Pole and planned to fly home in a magical sleigh. Fine, we'll get a hotel room for you, offered Jerry. The intern wrote furiously. His stress level soared. We can pay for our own lodgings. Stella threw in exchanging a look with Robin. It wasn't like they could leave Starling on the roof for long. The reindeer needed to eat, and someone would see her eventually. Most adults would see a helicopter or small plane, their brains filling in what they didn't understand. But a child would be enthralled with a live, flying reindeer. The intern scratched off the note to get them a hotel, and his blood pressure decreased. Is Stella a target too? Robin asked, worried for her sister. The last thing she wanted to do was put her family in danger, well, more danger. Having their home melt out from under them was dangerous enough for one Christmas. No, his main issue was with you, replied Jerry. Well, that was great. The door opened again, and in walked Gabe in all his uniformed handsomeness. Sugarplum fairies filled her stomach and danced, leaping and twirling in their tutus. She was starting to think there was something more to her attraction than just his good looks and the fact that he thought she was sketchy. He folded his arms and stood like a fortress. Good. Jerry headed for the door and the others followed. Gabe will take you wherever you need to go. We'll see you tomorrow. Chelsea waved happily before ducking out, and the intern followed with his head down. He had a lot of work ahead of him before he could go home. Robin darted forward, her hand in her purse. Wait. He stopped, his shoulders up around his ears, warding off one more task to complete. Yes? I brought you these. She pulled out a white box filled with pumpkin cookies. I thought you might need a snack. His shoulders dropped. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. His heart lifted, she could feel it, and it made her smile. You're so welcome. She patted his arm. 
He just wanted someone to notice how hard he worked. You deserve them after all you do around here to keep this place running. He flooded with joyful relief. Are you ready to go? asked Gabe, before the intern could say anything else. He grinned before slipping out the door. There was a sense of urgency about Gabe that spurred Robin to move faster. Any time you are. Where's your hotel? he asked. Um, the day-night inn? Robin offered up as a question. She had no idea what was in town or where to go. They would need roof access for Starling. Stella cleared her throat and shook her head. The Holiday Inn? She tried again. Gabe scowled. You don't remember your hotel? Robin flushed. There was no way to truthfully answer that question. They didn't have reservations anywhere, and she didn't know this town. Her throat tightened. I'll text you the address. Stella threw over her shoulder as she rushed out the door. Robin relaxed. She'd meet Stella on the roof of whatever hotel had the best landing spot, and they'd be on their way home within a half hour. Her sister was much better at this avoiding lies thing than she was, maybe she should take lessons. Gabe held the door for her, and they made their way through the lobby. Sarah had strung a garland of palm trees with Christmas lights across the front of her desk. They were the perfect decoration to celebrate her upcoming cruise. She was on the phone but waved as they walked by. Robin waved back. Gabe stepped in front of her on the way out and scanned the parking lot. His intense desire to keep her safe was intimidating. There was no doubt he'd tackle her to the pavement and throw his body on top of hers to keep her from being hurt. Goose bumps broke out on her arms. Not from the cold, Kringles didn't feel cold temps, but from the sense of danger lurking all around. The sun had gone down and the parking lot lights were dim. Shadows lingered everywhere. She shivered. Gabe glanced at her out of the corner of his eye. You should have worn a coat. It's in the thirties. She rubbed her hands up and down her arms. The light blouse wouldn't offer much protection. Thankfully, he thought she was cold and not afraid. I guess I forgot it. She owned a coat. It was hanging in her closet in the ice castle. Just then, the sleigh flew off the roof and right over their heads, startling Robin. She jumped and cried out, grabbing onto Gabe's leather jacket and leaning against him. Stinking Stella! She could make even Starling fly like a firstling. She did her best not to tip her head up and watch the streak of white and sliver against the black sky. SHH, Gabe held up a hand. What? Robin stepped even closer, the smell of leather and soap filling her senses. His arm was thick with muscles and warm to the touch, even through his coat. Funny, she'd never felt a temperature difference between her and another person before, but Gabe was definitely a warm body. He shook his head. I thought I heard, bells. Sleigh bells, she corrected before realizing what she'd said. She dropped his arm. He jolted as if the cold had smacked him. It probably had, because when she touched him, her magic protected him from the cold too. Let's go. He hurried to a small red pickup truck with rust over the back fender and a dent in the grill. He unlocked and opened the passenger side door for her. She grinned. Thanks. A gentleman is always appreciated. He chuckled. That's the first time someone's called me that, sketch. She tingled all over and grinned like a goof. Not at all sketch, but she didn't care. He shut the door and walked around to the driver's side where he settled behind the wheel. Let's get the heater going to get you warm. Thanks. She smiled softly. The sentiment was kind, and she was beginning to see a softer side to Gabe. He noticed things about her that no one else seemed to pay attention to. Of course, that could be his training as a security guard and wasn't an indication that he noticed her specifically. 
His phone buzzed madly, and he scrambled to get it out from the inside pocket of his coat. Several taps and a swipe later, and his face pinched. What is it? Robin asked, instantly knowing he sought understanding from her. Do you mind if we make a stop? His jaw set and his eyes flashed. Whatever came through on the phone left him disappointed and frustrated, though not with her. Of course. Whatever you need to do. I feel bad taking your evening. They're compensating my time, so don't worry about it. They rode in silence for a few minutes. He rested his elbow on the door and checked his mirror several times before clearing his throat. It's my brother. You have a brother? He signaled and turned left, taking them closer to a blinking dot on his phone. He's struggling. Sometimes he takes off. I need to pick him up. Sadness. Grief. A sense of loss and incapability filled the truck like the stench of rotten cheese. Before she could respond, he threw the car in park and hopped out. She knew she should turn away, to give them a moment of family privacy, but there was so much longing coming from the two of them that she was fascinated. Where are you going? Gabe demanded, his voice harsh through the windshield. Robin bit her knuckle to keep from crying out at him to stop. The boy was crying inside, crying for understanding and a sense of safety. Yelling at him wasn't going to soothe his wounds. The teen lifted a shoulder. He couldn't have been older than fifteen, and yet he was already as tall as Gabe. They had the same build, though Gabe had filled out in his chest and shoulders whereas his brother was still skinny, almost scrawny. She itched to make him a home-cooked meal. Roast beef and potatoes to start with fresh rolls loaded with homemade Christmas jam. Comfort food at its best. The kind families gathered around the table for on Sunday after church with brown gravy and sparkling cider. You have to stop this, it's juvenile. When are you going to grow up? The kid turned his head, catching sight of Robin in the cab of the truck. His wounded heart was made bare, the aching to be accepted too strong for Santa sense to ignore. Stop, she yelled, scrambling out of the car. Gabe and his brother both faced her, twin looks of trepidation on their handsome faces. They were so much alike, needed the same things, but were unable to give them to one another because of fear. What had they been through that made them so afraid to love? To be loved? She placed a hand on the boy's arm to steady herself, her need to comfort was overwhelming. She'd never been this close to a family crisis before. It was unsettling and destructive. You aren't running away because you're ungrateful or angry, she said, feeling like she was having an out-of-body experience. He clamped his lips shut. She'd moved closer to his pain and he retreated, hoping she wouldn't expose it to the world. Gabe stood motionless and quiet to the side. She silently pleaded with him to keep a clamp on his anger, to hold back his needs long enough for his brother to be reassured and the storm inside calmed. Hey, she spoke softly. You're a restless soul. You're searching for something, but you don't know what it is. He kept his mouth closed, but his arm relaxed under her touch. He was crying out for understanding, inching closer to trusting her despite his defenses telling him to back away. He just wanted someone to see him. She threw her arms around his body, pinning his arms to his side, and let her heart open to allow Christmas hope and love and joy to flow from her to him. He stood stiffly, holding his breath, until the magic began to seep into his being. Just so you know, she began, her cheek smashed by his zipper, this is the most awkward hug I've ever given. Finally, his shoulders slumped, and she could feel his smile come from his heart. A small chuckle bounced around inside of him. Gabe's emotional levels evened out. Interesting. It seemed his crisis was directly related to what was happening with his brother. There were still lingering doubts, a need for validation that would have to be addressed at some point. But for now, his issues were under control. You smell like ice cream, the kid offered. She laughed. 
Every Kringle sister had a distinctive scent. For Ginger, it was Christmas cookies or Ginger Snaps. Hence her name. Mom had recognized the scent the moment she was born. For Lux, it was peppermint chocolate. Robin's was vanilla bean, which could easily be mistaken for ice cream. You smell good too. She released him and stepped back to find him blushing furiously. You're right. That was really awkward. His shy smile asked if it was okay that he'd teased her. She pushed his arm, wishing she'd gotten Ginger's ability to know names. I'll bet the girls are all over you, you big charmer. He lifted a shoulder. Some of his confidence slipped, and she wondered how he was doing in school. Come on, let's get you two out of the cold and I can introduce you properly. Gabe lifted his arms, ushering them like a flock of geese toward the open truck door. It's not cold, said his brother. She realized she'd left her hand on his shoulder, offering him her protection from the cold. It's below freezing, she said, taking her hand away. He shivered, making her feel bad for letting him feel the chill. Gabe made introductions as they piled in, Nick taking the small seat behind Robin. She offered him the front, he had long legs, but he insisted she get the seat by the heat vent. Being a gentleman must run in the family. She smiled over her shoulder. Nick grinned. No one's ever called me that before. Robin sent a pointed look at Gabe. He'd said the same thing. Maybe these two weren't as far apart as they believed. Gabe smirked in return. Her phone beeped, and she checked the text from Stella. Here's the address to the hotel. Gabe put it in his phone. It wasn't far away, and she was disappointed that their ride was just a few minutes. He pulled into the drop-off zone at the front doors. You be sure to lock yourself in your room tonight. His concern was real, and it touched her heart. But she couldn't agree to staying in her room. She had a world's worth of stockings to provide goodies for, the chocolate coins alone would take twelve hours. I don't think that will be necessary, she hatched. I'd feel better knowing you will. His navy blue eyes bore into her. She internally cringed, searching for a phrase that was truthful but noncommittal. I'll be safe. I promise. Nick grabbed the back of her chair and stuck his face between them. What's going on? I'll explain it later. Gabe excused her from having to give a story. She climbed out of the truck, feeling like she was making a huge mistake. There was so much more going on with these two than just an argument. Their needs were so big, it could take years to sort them out. She rubbed her palms together, ready to offer to cook them a homemade dinner. The hotel doors whooshed open behind her. Robin, called Stella. There's an issue with one of the machines, I need to go. Gabe waved at her sister. I'll watch you walk in. She smiled, wishing she had more time, could give them more. But Stella was over toy production, arguably the biggest job at the North Pole. It would be selfish of Robin to keep her here when there were children's Christmas wishes on the line. Bye. Bye, the guys said in unison. She chuckled. They were like twins born years apart. She tore herself away and shut the door. Stella met her and hooked their arms together. There's an issue in the stuffing room and I need to get home, pronto. Let's do it. I have a night of baking ahead and need to check on the Alaska plant. If we can set up a facility in Oregon, I might be able to dip chocolate. Even as she said the words, her mind was back on Gabe and Nick. They needed her. And a part of her just might need them too, but she didn't have time to give them. Chapter 7 Later that night, Gabe sat in the front room with the lights off. A plate of uneaten pizza slices lay on the coffee table, where he'd propped up his feet. He wasn't hungry. Nick had run away again. Two times in as many nights. 
Robin had said he was searching for something, that he was a wandering soul. Well, if that was the case, he was going to push Gabe into an early grave. The glow of the television flickered in the darkness. He and Nick hadn't talked on the ride home. They both wanted to hang on to the peace Robin had brought into their lives, even if it was for a few minutes. Gabe was jealous of the hug she'd given Nick, at the same time, he was hugely grateful to her for giving it to him. Neither of them had a good female influence in their lives, maybe that was what was missing in all this. He was self-aware enough to admit that he wasn't the softest of caretakers. Nick ambled in and flopped onto the other end of the couch. He propped his feet up. What are we watching? 30-minute match. Gabe stared at the opening credits, wondering if Robin was as wonderful as he remembered or if he'd built her up in his mind in the two hours since he dropped her off. The woman would not get out of his head. And Nick was right, she smelled so good. His truck carried the scent of vanilla even now. Robin appeared on screen, and Nick sat up. Great. His little brother had a crush on the same woman he did. Gabe groaned. They watched the episode in silence. The producer had cut in footage of Kylo stomping through reception, screaming threats. There were beeps every five words or so. You should ask her out, Nick said when the show was over. A message appeared on screen, promising that they would try again for Robin the next night and inviting viewers to tune in. She's part of the job. Gabe wasn't sure who he was trying to convince, himself or his brother. She's pretty. Gabe turned to him, questions running through his mind about how big this crush was. Nick scoffed. I meant she's pretty for someone your age, all right? Invite her over for dinner. Okay, so not a crush. Phew. It was Gabe's turn to scoff. And serve what? Cold pizza? Gabe's lack of kitchen skills used to be a running joke between them. Lately, it felt more like a thorn in their relationship. You're always so ornery. Order takeout. She won't care. She's nice. He scratched his chin. And I caught her looking at you a couple times. Sure she was. He wasn't falling for that. Nick could save his peer pressure for his high school friends. Whatever. Nick was off the couch and halfway down the hall in a blink. Gabe wished he could call him back and have a real talk with him. He also wished he could invite Robin over for dinner. They could sit around the small, round table no one ever used and act like a family. He fell asleep on the couch with the thought running through his head like a playlist on repeat. Chapter 8 Robin hurried down the hall of Santa's past that connected the family living area to Santa's workshop. The jolly green carpet with the holly design woven in gold was wet around the edges, and several spots squished when she stepped on them. Nicholas the Seventh Eyes, painted cold black, followed her as she walked past his gold-framed portrait. For a Santa, he was grumpy. His dark brow was lowered and the lines in his face were severe. Or maybe he was silently condemning her for ruining his legacy. At the end of the hall, she shoved the door open and made her escape into the mail room. Hundreds of wooden filing cabinets lined the walls and created aisles through the cavernous room. Here and there, pointy elf hats with bells bobbed as Frost's helpers worked to sort out this year's requests. With only twenty-one days until Christmas, the mail sleighs overflowed with letters to Santa. Frost's beautiful secretary desk was covered in unopened mail, but her sister was nowhere to be found. Frost, she called, standing on her tiptoes. Under here, Frost answered from one of the workbenches. The bench was covered in piles of letters. Frost had climbed underneath and set up a nest, her favorite letter opener in one hand and a pile of letters to the left. In front of her were sorted letters, waiting for elves to pick them up and enter the info into the computer for Ginger to check against the naughty and nice list, twice. Where's Tannen? Robin carefully stepped around the piles and squatted in front of the opening. 
Frost's husband of almost a year was in charge of making sure she didn't exhaust herself in the pre-Christmas rush. He went for food. Robin cringed. Sorry. Normally, she'd be the one making sure the family had a nutritious meal. Instead, she was stuck down south in a television studio, looking for a chocolate chip of a man in a bag of flour. Don't feel bad, Frost said, her eyes scanning a page. We understand. Remember the mail shortage situation last year? I remember. While Frost was in Elderberry, falling in love with her lifelong pen pal, Tannen, and saving Christmas, the mail room had fallen into chaos and mail delivery had slowed to a trickle. Frost lifted her crystal blue eyes. We get it. Robin smiled. She used to consider her youngest sister an easy read. But since finding out she was the only Kringle who could tell a lie and not set off Robin's lie meter, she just had to trust what Frost gave her. Thanks. She held out her hand, and Frost took it, pulling herself out from under the table. Is there something I can help you with? Frost brushed off her palms. She absently reached for a sealed envelope and opened it. Robin needed to talk fast, before Frost was lost in crayon words and construction paper. Could children get any cuter? Their spelling was the sweetest. Dear Santa melted Robin every time. It was a good thing she wasn't in charge of mail, her sentimentality would slow the process. Nick Fowler's letters, please. That caught her sister's attention. She tucked the unopened letter into her cargo pants side pocket and started off down an aisle, her white hair flowing behind her. She navigated several tin buckets half full of water. There were large icicles dripping from the ceiling. Robin shuddered to think what would happen if one of them broke loose. Who is this kid? Frost asked over her shoulder. She moved like a fairy with long strides, using her tiptoes. He's the brother to the security guard at the studio. I saw the two of them earlier tonight. It was hard to watch. Why? She turned a tight corner. Robin hurried to keep pace, she could get lost in here. They were both reaching out, demanding love, neither realizing they had the power to heal each other. I was in physical pain just watching. I can't imagine how they live like that every day. You're more sensitive than most. He'd be in here. Frost yanked on a drawer but couldn't get it open. The moisture is making the drawers stick. She stuck her tongue between her teeth and put her foot on the drawer for leverage. Tannen appeared, carrying a picnic basket. Hey, love. He kissed Frost's hair, his eyes closing with the pleasure of being close to the woman he loved. Hi, Robin. How goes the manhunt? Hi. Was it any wonder Robin ached to be loved? She was surrounded by newlyweds every day of the year. It's fine. Same as always. Not great. But there's hope. Tannen gently moved Frost aside and yanked the drawer open for her. Frost grinned up at him, her pixie nose wrinkling. Thanks. She walked her fingers along the files until she came to Nick's. Robin reached for it, but Frost flipped it open, scanning and reading bits out loud, sounding like an audiobook set to 4X. These first two ask to live with his brother. Then there's a couple years that he's into remote-controlled cars. Then, oh. Her hand went to her lips. Here. She handed the letter to Robin and twisted her lips, waiting. Tannen put his arm around Frost, and she leaned into him. Seriously, did they have to make this marriage thing look so good? Robin scanned the letter. He wants a family. She looked up. But he has Gabe. Tannen took the letter and scanned it. I get this kid. For a long time after my cancer, my parents were highly functioning dysfunctional. 
I would see other kids playing catch with their dad or sitting between their parents at church, seemingly safe and content, while I was surrounded by stony silence and the echoes of trauma. Family doesn't mean the number of people you live with, it's a feeling. Frost gave me that feeling. He gave her a look so full of love it had a heartbeat. Yeah, but she was in love with you. Robin reread the letter, feeling the ache that seeped through the ink. Frost nodded in agreement. What can I do as an outsider? She tucked the letter back into the file and threw her body weight against it to slide it shut. Tannen lifted a palm. I don't know. Thanks, Robin said dryly. Frost's hands shook as she reached for the letter in her pocket. You need food and a letter, Robin observed. Stat, Frost agreed. She took the basket from Tannen and sprinted away. She'd be at her desk before either of them figured out the maze. Tannen chuckled after her. His prosthetic leg didn't allow him to run over ice well, even with the spikes he'd attached to his shoes. Eat first. Will do. She was already several aisles over, and her voice echoed off the ceiling, sending a sprinkle of water drops falling down. Robin wiped one off her arm. I know you want to help this kid, Tannen glanced around to make sure they weren't overheard. But you should probably focus more on finding Mr. Wright. I'm not sure how much more water the mailroom can take. I know. The guilt built up inside of her. I'm working on it. We're filming again tomorrow. Tannen's shoulders relaxed. No pressure, but we're counting on you. No pressure at all. She punched his shoulder. Feeling the burden of finding her needle in the haystack, she headed off to the kitchens to lose herself in baking and candy making. If she worked fast enough, she could outrun her not so nice list thoughts of Gabe, kissing him was at the top of her list of things not to think about. The man had a nice mouth, and it begged for some attention. That was one need she should ignore but had a hard time forgetting about. Chapter 9 Gabe switched spots with Ralph, the security guard assigned to Studio F for the day, so he could be in with Robin. Not that she needed him in particular, but because he wanted to make sure she was okay. And yes, spending time with her in the same room made him feel good. That didn't mean he liked her any more than any other woman he worked with, it just meant that she was a good person to be around. He was getting good at deluding himself. For her part, Robin looked even prettier today than she had yesterday. She wore a cream-colored sweater with tight black pants. The pants were shiny and made her legs look like they went on and on and on. He gulped. Her hair was pulled over one shoulder with soft tendrils framing her face, and her makeup was a little heavier. He suspected Stella had a hand in that and wasn't sure he liked it. Robin didn't have to try to be beautiful. She was naturally stunning. The show started out the same as it always did, with the theme music and the montage. Brian did a new introduction, telling everyone that Robin was a repeat guest and why. They cut to clips from yesterday, leaving out Kylo. He called the front desk this morning, irate that they'd aired the show last night. Sarah was still shaking after the things he'd yelled at her and the threats he'd made. The police were called, and the security department waited for their investigation. There was more to Kylo than any of them suspected. Robin was still his main target. He wanted to know where she lived. Of course, Sarah didn't give out the information. The woman was a Robin fan to her core. She'd finally transferred the call to the security office, and Kylo hung up. He didn't like the good guys that much but had no trouble intimidating a woman. The jerk had better hope he didn't run into Gabe anytime soon. Just the thought of him anywhere near Robin made Gabe's blood hotter than the gourmet cocoa Robin provided for the crew this morning. From there, the show went almost exactly like yesterday. Contestant 2 was an aspiring screenplay writer who was on the verge of taking off. Robin deduced that he wouldn't be able to commit until he chased down his dream. 
Contestant 3 had cheated on his last three girlfriends and promised Robin to get into counseling for the new year before he dated again. Bachelor number one? Robin asked. Gabe folded his arms, wondering what was wrong with this guy. The way Robin worked through them all was fascinating. Last night's show hadn't done that well when it aired, but the replay had gone viral. The whole studio buzzed with the news. Viewers loved how Robin called the guys out on their crap. Apparently, that was what had been missing from the show all along, honesty. And the drama that came with it. Even though Robin was as cool as Frosty the Snowman, the guys didn't take her assessments of their characters all that well. Yes? The drywaller, dressed in a new pair of jeans and a polo shirt, sat up taller. Gabe had forgotten his name. The determined look in Robin's eye meant he wasn't going to stick around for long, though. With three new contestants out of the game, Gabe was on high alert for another meltdown. So far, so good. Robin narrowed her eyes. You need to go back to your sweet wife. There was a collective gasp from the crew watching the show. Brian's mouth hung open. Camera number three got the host's shocked look on film. No doubt that would be a teaser for the episode. Gabe shook his head. If he'd known what he was walking into, the guy wouldn't have shown up today. We're divorced, the contestant protested. Robin narrowed her eyes. It's not finalized, is it? Her voice was crazy interesting. It wasn't that she threw the accusation out there. It was more like she caressed the truth. If she'd used that tone on Gabe, he'd want to tell her his deepest secrets. Contestant 1 dropped his head like a scolded child. No. Robin inched forward in her chair. She loves you. She tried so hard to make it work, and you were all caught up in your band and didn't see her. Do you miss her? He nodded. Yeah. Sniffing, he swiped at his nose. A lot. She used to love to watch me play, and then she stopped coming. That must have been hard. Did you ask her why? She said she felt ignored. Robin smiled softly. Grovel. Beg. Plead. Take care of her. And do it over and over again. She's amazing, and if you pass up this chance to get her back, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. He sat on his stool, staring at the floor. Robin pressed her hands together. What do you love more? The band, or her? He lifted his chin, revealing eyes full of tears. Her, he croaked. Jeez. Gabe looked away. Get a hold of yourself, man. Christmas is her favorite time of year. He sniffed again and rubbed at his eyes. She does it right, you know? Robin's smile lit up the studio. Run to her. He bolted from his chair. The cameras followed him all the way to the door before swinging back to Robin. She glanced at them and then at Brian, realization flooding her face. Oh no! I've done it again, haven't I? Brian chuckled good-naturedly. I think you just saved a marriage. Who can be upset about that? He was right. If they were looking for a love match, Robin had just created one. And what a whiz-bang way to make it happen, too. A Christmas reunion. Romantic. Sweet. Not to mention a twist ending. No one anticipated having a married man on the show. He hoped it worked out for the guy. Christmas was a lonely time when you didn't have someone to hold close. Gabe should know. Brian leaned on his fist. Christmas makes us all into hopeless romantics. Maybe that was what Gabe was going through. A huge case of holiday nostalgia. That must be why he had dreams of mistletoe's kisses and holding a certain rising television star in his arms at night. Sure, and reindeer fly. 
Maybe, if we knew a little more about you, we could find the right kind of guy. Brian dropped his arm and looked at the camera. What are you looking for in a man, Robin? She reached for her hair, thought better of it, and placed her hands in her lap. I'd like a man who's honest. One who will treat me with respect. And he has to love Christmas. That's kind of generic. How about some specifics? Hair color? Age? Occupation? Robin laughed. I guess I don't think that much about what he'd look like, and material possessions aren't important to me. I want someone I can connect with on an emotional level, someone I can laugh with on a daily basis and share the holidays with all year long. Brian lifted his palms. Is there a man out there who can win Robin's heart? Join us tomorrow night as we break out of 30-minute matches routine to find this woman a husband by Christmas. Cut, called Chelsea. Tomorrow? Stella rushed Jerry sending him back several steps. You didn't say anything about filming again. We're on a tight deadline here, and we both have jobs. They'd said Robin managed a kitchen. He wondered where. They were in a hotel. Would she consider relocating? He shook himself. He wasn't a bachelor on the show. He was the security guard and therefore not eligible to date the contestant. And in turn ran in gasping for breath, his face shiny. The phones are lighting up. We've had 52 guys offered to come on the show. They all want to meet her. Gabe's heart plummeted. Robin would have her pick of men now. The point of this was to find Robin a fiancé, Stella reminded everyone in the room. We need a wedding, people. We have to start with a date, said Chelsea. And we'd like to film it. That's what Brian meant when he said we were going to try something new. We'd like to skip the selection process and go right to dinner and flirting. But, Robin got to her feet and crossed to the camera. Gabe's eyes were drawn her to stunning legs in those shiny black pants, and he had to force them away. Robin gave him a side look and a sly smile, like she could read his thoughts. I'm not good at flirting in front of the camera. I'll get all nervous and flustered. You've been great here, prompted the intern. Add one more to the Robin fan club. Gabe glanced around. The crew had gathered close. Normally they'd be rolling up wires and cleaning up, but they loitered, interested in what was going to happen to their new sweetheart. Thanks, but, Robin stared. And it will give us two more weeks of work, added Jerry. After the response to last night's show, the network is willing to give us three additional spots for December. So I won't have to pump gas during the break, asked Jared. He had two kids and a wife and worked his tail off to make ends meet. Jerry scratched his neck and pointed at Robin. Not if she agrees to continue with us. All eyes went to her. Robin licked her lips, searching the faces. Her eyebrows came together, creating the smallest crease between them. Stella reached for her hand in a show of support. Her eyes were full of worry for her sister. Will we be out by the 23rd? Gabe asked. That was when most of the kids started winter break. He wouldn't mind the extra hours and pay, but Nick came first. Yeah. The final show will air the 24th, replied Chelsea. They all went back to watching Robin. Her face was red, like she was trying to hold back but words were forcing their way out. All right, I'll do it. She gasped for air. Stella patted her hand and shook her head. It was like she knew Robin wouldn't be able to say no. The group cheered and then dispersed, many of them whipping out their cell phones and sending texts. A few made calls to loved ones to arrange the new work schedule. Stella gave a huge sigh. I'll hash out the details. She hugged Robin. You've got to figure out how to put your needs first, she said quietly. How are you going to make stocking stuffers if you're here? 
I don't know, Robin whispered. Only Gabe heard the exchange. He wasn't sure how he'd gotten into their personal space, but he was suddenly there. He took a small step back, his mind puzzling over the importance of stocking stuffers. Robin smiled an apology at her sister as she rubbed her hand over her throat. Gabe also released a breath. He hadn't been aware he was holding it. But if Robin had said no to the longer filming schedule, then she'd leave town. She was staying in a hotel, which didn't imply permanency. Still, he wasn't ready to say goodbye. If he was in a better place, he'd invite her to dinner. Nick would love it. I'd love to, Robin said, looking up at him with those big gray eyes. Gabe looked around. It was just the two of them left in the middle of the bustle to wrap things up for the day. Love to what? He must have missed something she'd said, being so deep in his own thoughts. Go to dinner. She blinked at him expectantly. His heart thundered in his chest. Did I say that out loud? He blurted. He hadn't meant to, and he felt stupid for not realizing that he'd spoken. Her face pinched. I heard you ask me. He was making a mess of this, whatever this was. Was he asking her out? I mean, I didn't. I mean, he could have sworn he hadn't said a word, but suddenly, all he wanted was to take her home for dinner. Robin, we need you for a voiceover, called Stella from across the room. She lifted a hand in acknowledgement. I'll probably be here until five. Do you want to meet by the front desk, and then we can go to your place? Her lashes rested against her cheeks for a brief moment before lifting. He'd never noticed a woman's lashes before, but hers were long and thick, elegant. The world around them faded as their eyes met. Noises disappeared, and a thick fog of attraction surrounded them. He reached out and touched her arm. A zing went right from his fingers to his heart. I'll be here. Her whole face relaxed and brightened at the same time. She smiled, and he realized that all her other smiles that day had been half smiles. He'd gotten the best one of the bunch. Great. She hurried off to do what television stars did to make the show a success. The happy buzz he'd felt lingered for half a minute more before popping like a red balloon. Shoot. He grabbed for his phone and dialed Nick. Pick up, he said through gritted teeth. Sup? I took your stupid advice, that's what's up. Gabe began to pace as the state of their house loomed before him. Had he thrown out the pizza box? Robin's coming to dinner tonight. Yes. Nick replied. Yeah, you think. I'll take care of food. You get that place clean. And I mean clean. I'm on it. Gabe pulled the phone away to check the name on the screen. Yep. He dialed his little brother. The kid who would wear pants until they could stand up by themselves to avoid doing laundry. He clicked his tongue. What? She must have cast a spell over the two of us. We're acting like complete idiots. I don't care. I like her. Don't screw this up. Nick hung up on him. Gabe rubbed his hair, making it stand on end. He hurriedly patted it back down. He needed to figure out how to cook, and fast. Gabe, can you check in with security? We need someone to escort Robin to her hotel again, said Jerry. I'll do it, he said quickly, putting his phone away. One of the cardinal rules of security was to leave your electronics in your pocket. He put on his don't mess with me face. Take it up with your manager. Jerry walked away. Gabe nodded, hurrying to the security office. He doubted anyone else would volunteer for the extra work, but he needed to make sure he was on the schedule. It would be awkward to explain why he was picking Robin upright after they dropped her off when he shouldn't be dating the show's most popular bachelorette. 
he stopped dead in his tracks holy shoot. He was going on a date. If ever there was a Christmas miracle, this was it. Chapter 10 I think you should really get me a room at the hotel, Robin told Stella as they left the sound booth. The door swung shut behind her, but Stella was still on the other side, staring at her though the glass. What did you say? Her voice sounded like it was in a tin can. Robin rolled her eyes and opened the door. I said, I want a hotel room in town. I, I have a date. She stumbled over the words, not because she was embarrassed, but because she wasn't sure that going to dinner with Gabe was a date. He might not have actually asked her out. Sometimes, she felt things so strongly from others that they were like thoughts in her head. Since she'd been distracted by the change in filming and such, she'd responded to the need and agreed to dinner before she verified the invitation. With whom? Stella folded her arms and cocked out her hip. Her spiky-heeled black boots put a depression in the wood. Robin copied her posture, she was the oldest Kringle sister, after all. Not even Stella was going to outbig sister her. Gabe and Nick. Stella's head jerked back. Two guys? Even I don't go out with two guys at the same time. Ha ha ha. Robin glared. It's Gabe and his younger brother Nick. They invited me to dinner. I couldn't say no. Santa senses? Stella confirmed. Robin threw her arms out. They go nuts around these two. I hate to say they're needy, but they are. I can hardly control myself. It was the truth, so the words came out easily enough, but it wasn't quite the whole truth. She wanted to go. Gabe was good-looking, nice, calming, and he had a way of teasing her that made her feel special. Stella laughed. Fine. Take on your Christmas project, but don't get caught up in them. You're going out with the man of your dreams tomorrow night, and we don't need complications. Fine. Robin took a step before remembering the reason she'd started this conversation. So, the hotel? Stella rolled her eyes. Consider it done. Her thumbs tap-danced across her phone. Robin grinned. Thanks. It's handy having a sister around with your skill set. You owe me fruitcake. Robin groaned. Of all the wonderful things to eat in this world, from rice pudding to chocolate mousse, why did her sister have to love fruitcake? Though it wasn't labor-intensive, it took over a month of babysitting for it to cure. If we survive this Christmas, I'll make you one a month for a year. She offered her pinky so they could seal the deal. Aren't we a little too old for pinky swears? The day we're too old for pinky swears is the day you take away my hot pads. Stella laughed. Deal. They hooked pinkies and shook on it. Have fun on your double date. Robin stuck her tongue out at her sister as she walked backwards. Call it what you want, but I'm playing Santa tonight. Stella waved and then headed for the door that led to the stairs. They had a sleigh on the roof, and she had toys to make. Robin swung into the ladies' room and checked her hair. It was a little flat, so she flipped her head over and shook it out. When she flipped back up, it was all over the place, and she panicked, combing her fingers through it. What am I doing? She muttered as the sugarplum fairies in her stomach trilled in anticipation. She gave herself a hard look and flounced out of the bathroom. It didn't take long to meet up with Gabe in the lobby. You ready? He asked. He stuffed his hands in his black slacks and didn't look at her as he spoke. She nodded, not sure if this was how his usual dates went or if he was more friendly to other women. She wasn't even sure if this was a real date or if she'd ambushed him into taking her home for dinner. Because of that, her expectations were low, but her hopes were high. They headed out to his truck without another word. This time Robin knew what it looked like and didn't have to wait for him to show her the way. 
He walked slightly in front of her anyway, scanning the shadows and listening intently. The sky was dark and the overhead lamps in the parking lot were still a dull yellow. Maybe she could get Lux down here to brighten up the place, then Gabe could relax a bit. It wouldn't be a big deal to change out the bulbs, not when she had a flying reindeer at her disposal. He held the door open for her, which would normally make her think this was a date, but he'd done that when he'd been on the clock as her bodyguard. Ugh. This was so confusing. If she had just thought before she'd spoken, this would be so much easier. She resolved to be more positive. Whether he'd meant to invite her or not, he had the desire to do so. In fact, the desire had been strong enough to call out to her, so she should have more confidence. So, what's the plan? Wheel. He tapped his thumb on the steering wheel, signaled, and turned into a grocery store parking lot. I need to pick up some, uh, fresh ingredients. Do you mind coming in with me? I'm supposed to be protecting you tonight. Robin frowned. So is dinner part of the job, or is it extra? Dinner is definitely extra. He found a spot and pulled in. I don't want my boss to know we are hanging out, though. I'm not sure how he'd feel about that. His honesty was refreshing. Robin had been on enough first dates to know that not everyone said things as clearly as Gabe. Most guys embellished or told a fraction of the truth, the part that shed the best light on them. Stella said that was normal for a first date, but it grated on Robin. How could you build a relationship with someone if the first blocks laid were unstable? She hadn't considered that the fact that dating her might be a conflict of interest for him. I don't want to get you in trouble. I'm sure it will be fine. It's none of their business what we do outside of the studio anyway. She brushed her hand across his shoulder. The cab grew warm and her cheeks flushed because of the brief contact. What was that for? He asked, his voice deeper than before. She smiled. I was brushing that chip off your shoulder. His mouth dropped open, and then he smiled. Oh, so that's how it is? We get to call each other out, huh, sketch? His eyes sparkled. That's how it is. She laughed easily. That was how she wanted it to be. Always. Stay there. I'm getting your door. Bodyguard responsibilities, she teased, though she truly wondered. No. Someone called me a gentleman recently, and I liked it. He winked and hopped out. She let out a quiet squeal. This was definitely a date. They made their way inside the store, and he grabbed a shopping cart. She stepped back and took a picture. There are few things I like more than to see a man with a shopping cart. He pushed away, the front wheel rattling. His strides were sure, and he had a lift to his eyes that told her he was happy. Let me guess what the others are, man holding puppy? She shook her head. Man in a firefighter uniform? She laughed. Nope. All right, I give. Man in an apron. She fanned her face dramatically. A white, clean apron. It's so hot. That's weird, he said distractedly. He stopped in the produce aisle and glanced around like he was lost. Um, he headed for the potatoes, threw a bag of Idaho russets in the cart, and then grabbed a head of lettuce, a container of strawberries, and a bunch of green onions. A mental list of possible meals came to mind, all of them delicious. I can't wait to see what you're making. Gabe grew quiet. It's a surprise. She felt that answer out but didn't find a lie. However, his back hunched several degrees as they walked through the store, like he was getting ready to ward off an attack of some sort. Or a disappointment. He didn't want to disappoint her. That was sweet. What's your favorite Christmas candy? She pointed to a Hershey's end cap display. Don't know. 
he barely glanced at the treats. A few minutes later, she tried again. Do you have any special Christmas foods you and Nick prepare? Not really. He continued to throw things into the cart. With each addition, her list of possible dinners dwindled. He could be stalling, keeping her away from his house, but she didn't get that vibe. It was more like he was lost. When he grabbed seaweed wraps but skipped the rice, she took the cart by the handle. You have no idea what you're doing, do you? He cringed. Not really. Surprise lifted her eyebrows. Who didn't know how to shop for dinner? Unless. Do you know how to cook? She blurted the question and was immediately filled with his shame. Um, no. Not really. She laughed, hoping to lighten the mood. She smacked his arm. Then why did you invite me over for dinner? We could have gone out. He ducked his head. It was Nick's idea. I told him it was crazy. Her heart tumbled into her shoes. She must have misread everything. So you don't want me? His head snapped up. I do. I want to make a good impression. I figured I could watch a My Heart Channel video or something, but I didn't have time. His blue eyes filled with regret. Luckily, she understood that it wasn't aimed at her, it was that he wasn't able to be the man she thought he was. She shook her head. You're cute when you're humble. She bumped his hip with hers, scooting him out of the way and taking over the cart. I'll do the shopping and cooking, you keep me entertained, and we'll call it square. His whole body sagged with relief. That would be great. She walked them back up the aisles they'd just gone through, putting some things back and taking others. Why do you love Christmas so much? he asked. She mentally tripped over the obvious answer, my dad was Santa Claus. Couldn't really throw that one out there on a first date. My family is big into Christmas. I grew up knowing it was the most important day of the year. She pointed to the vanilla ice cream behind the glass, and he went in after it. What's your favorite Christmas memory? She asked quickly. Turning the attention on him would keep her from having to hide her family's identity or get creative with the truth. If she was backed into a corner, she'd blurt out something embarrassing like my best friend is an elf. Probably the first year I got Nick. He was six, and there was a fire engine under the tree. We spent all day playing with that truck. It was like I got to be six all over again and had a brother to boot. I can picture it. Her whole being warmed at the image he created. What she wouldn't give for a Christmas like that this year. We were the best of friends, he said quietly, looking at the floor. What's yours? He flipped the spotlight back on her, and she scrambled to find an answer that wasn't too telling. That's so hard. She stomped a foot and smiled. Probably the first year I got to stay home for Christmas. She headed for the self-checkout. Where would you go before? And if Christmas is so important to your family, why weren't you together? She reached in the cart for the tortilla shells and cringed while he couldn't see her face. She'd have to tread carefully. Christmas Eve is a huge night for the family business, so my parents would send us to my grandparents in Mexico. I was 12 the first year I stayed and helped. I felt so big and important. That was the first year she could see herself taking over for her dad as Santa. She watched his every move as he prepared the sleigh and packed the gifts, moving faster than even the elves. Of course, she hadn't gotten the chance to take over, that honor went to Ginger three years ago. That was a hard year. She'd lost her boyfriend and her lifelong dream all in one month. What does your family do? Gabe's question pulled her out of the past. We're in toys and candy. I'm over the kitchens and L, I mean, employee relations. Her throat burned with the almost lie. 
Elves weren't exactly employees, because they weren't paid. That's a lot of work. He helped her unload and scan at the self-checkout line, reaching for the heavier items. It is. And it's fulfilling work. I always spent more time in the kitchen than I did with the list or in the mailroom. When the ovens are on and the smell of sugar and butter fill the air, I feel peace and security. List? He handed her a package of raw chicken to scan. Flustered because she'd slipped, she tried three times to skin the chicken before the machine beeped. I think that's everything, she said, ignoring his question on purpose. Let's make dinner. She grabbed the last sack and set it in the cart. If she moved fast enough, he'd surely forget she'd skipped an answer. Her empathy for all the guys she'd gone on first dates with, who had stretched the truth, went up by three. First dates were hard. And being genuine was even harder when you had a magical family who lived at the North Pole to hide. She'd have to cut her next first date some slack. Her stomach clenched at the idea of being filmed tomorrow. She placed a hand over it in an effort to calm it down. What's the matter? asked Gabe as he unlocked the doors and began loading groceries. Robin tipped her head back and caught a snowflake on her tongue. It melted quickly, reminding her that her home was melting away as she chatted and flirted with a man who would not help her fix things. Guilt sat up and waved. She told it to lie back down. There wasn't much she could do tonight anyway. I'm nervous about tomorrow. Why? His forehead wrinkled in the cutest way. I'm a horrible first dater, she confessed. He finished loading and shut the door, leaning against it with his arms folded. A light dusting of snow blanketed the windshield and muffled the sound of carts on concrete and car doors closing. The world shrank to the two of them. You're doing great tonight. She lifted a shoulder. No cameras. Hey. He stepped forward, placing his hands on both her shoulders. She grew warm at his touch, his nearness. He seemed to take up all her senses as the soft scent of soap tickled her nose. Her ears tuned into his deep voice. She moistened her lips, feeling as though she could almost taste him. His eyes searched her face, pausing on her lips and then jumping up to meet her gaze. All you have to do is be you, and I'm sure this guy will fall all over himself. You think? She lifted her chin slightly so she could look deeper into his eyes, to detect the truthfulness of his words. Her whole body told her that he believed she was a woman of great worth. I do. He brushed her hair off her cheek, sending shivers across her skin. A new need hit her, one she wasn't familiar with, or rather, she was, but she hadn't felt it in a long time. Gabe was going to kiss her. She leaned closer her eyes dropping to his lips. She hadn't gotten far when he stepped aside and opened her door. I'm starving. She stumbled in the direction of the truck and then caught herself on the frame. She must have misread what she was feeling. Her ears burned with embarrassment. But she never misread a need. Yeah. Me too. She climbed in and put on her seatbelt. Gabe had wanted to kiss her but had held back. She couldn't decide if that was a good thing or a bad thing. And she had no idea if it was because he was worried about his boss finding out they'd been on a date, or if it was something else. What she could really use at the moment was a Santa motive discernment gift. Where was that when Christmas magic was handing out abilities? Chapter 11 Gabe That was incredible, Nick moaned. Gabe groaned his agreement as he leaned back in his seat and rubbed his full stomach. I haven't eaten that good in, well, ever. Robin blushed. Go on with you. She threw a napkin at him. All evening, her bright smiles and easy laughter had filled the house to bursting. He smiled lazily, enjoying the sense that all was right at this very moment. She'd pulled a Christmas print tablecloth, lined with green holly and a matching set of napkins out of her purse. 
He had no idea why they were in there. Did she travel with table coverings? Was that a thing for people who managed kitchens? When he asked, she brushed it off by saying something about always liking to be prepared. There were other odd occurrences that he was storing up but choosing not to look too closely at because he didn't want to break the spell she wove over his home. For example, he wasn't sure where the large baking pan came from, but she claimed she'd found it around here somewhere. He hadn't seen the long stem glasses or remembered buying sparkling cider, and yet he'd enjoyed both. The best part was, he was beginning to see what a woman's touch meant to a meal. The food was beyond comparison. It nurtured his soul at the same time it filled his belly. Nick stared at the table full of food. There's enough left over for tomorrow night. His voice was full of awe. When had they ever had leftovers? Never. TV dinners came in serving sizes meant for one, pizza was gone in a night, and burgers and fries disappeared faster than you could say takeout. I'm glad you liked it. Robin gave Nick a fond smile and patted his arm as she got up from the table. You're still growing. You need sustenance. Gabe was in a happy fog. Much like the one he'd had after eating her muffins. Did you put something in the food I don't know about? Yes. Robin laughed lightly, the sound filling the room with a sense of cheer. Gabe's thoughts dropped to a lower frequency, and he slowly got up. What? He'd worried she'd drugged him once already, and that was a small amount of food compared to what he'd eaten tonight. She might have given him enough to knock out a caribou. Christmas magic. She wiggled her fingers. He blinked, sure he'd seen glitter fall from her hands. Really? Really and truly. She laughed again. Come on, haven't you ever heard of a food coma? Nick brightened. Is that what this is? I feel like singing. He hummed an unrecognizable tune. Robin picked it up, humming along for a few bars, and then sang, is coming to town. Nick jumped in snapping his fingers. He's making a list. Checking it twice. Gabe was sure there were illegal substances involved. Nick never hummed, and he certainly never sang. And that silly smile on his face? That hadn't been there since third grade. They sang together, adding a goofy, big finish at the end that included Robin's jazz hands. Gabe sat back and watched his kid brother open up. Where had the years gone? Not wanting to think about time marching on, he grabbed several dishes and headed for the sink. Gabe has a great voice, he just doesn't want anyone to know about it. Nick elbowed him in the ribs as he dropped a handful of silverware into the sink. He entertains the shampoo in the shower every morning, though. Gabe's whole neck and face burned with embarrassment. He had no idea Nick could hear him through the walls. He should have, though, how many times had he yelled at his brother to turn down the music? That's something I'd like to hear. Robin glanced at him out of the corner of her eye. It was like she knew that he couldn't take the full scrutiny of having her study him and was nice enough to give him some space. He appreciated her consideration, and he really liked the flirty tilt to her lips. She had great lips. They looked like two bows touching at the ends. He jerked his eyes off her mouth and turned on the water to let it warm up. He wasn't going to sing. But if he did sing a carol or two, Robin would be the one he would feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable in front of. She had this way of looking at him that went right through his walls. However, there was no way on the snowy earth that he was going to sing in front of Nick. Hey, Nick, Robin asked, do you have homework? He nodded and then caught himself and cast a quick look at Gabe. Not that much. Busted, Gabe thought. He was about to start in on Nick for not telling him earlier, but Robin stayed his words with a soft hand on his forearm. Her touch was like a jolt of electricity, waking him up and lifting him off the ground. It also stuck his tongue to the roof of his mouth. 
I'll wash dishes if you do homework, and then we can have dessert in thirty minutes. How's that? Her sweet request was so much nicer than what ran through Gabe's head. He would have told Nick to stay up there until it was done, and he'd be skipping dessert if he was missing so much as one assignment. Sure. Nick headed toward the stairs as if it was no big deal for him to do homework, even though it was a very, very big deal. Don't let him fool you. He'll go up to his room and play video games for a half hour, Gabe grumbled at his back. Nick's shoulder hunched as if Gabe had thrown things at him. Robin's grip on his arm tightened. I trust him. If Nick says he's doing homework, then he's doing homework. Yeah, Nick threw over his shoulder before bounding out of sight. Robin nodded once as if that was that. Gabe decided to let it go. Nick had done a great job cleaning the house this afternoon. The counters were clear of dishes and wiped clean. The floor was swept and the rug straightened. There was a fine layer of dust on the entertainment center, but Gabe didn't know if there was pledge in the closet or not. In fact, he wasn't sure what cleaners were in there. Thankfully, they had dish soap for the dirty dishes. They weren't complete hooligans. While he'd been musing over his brother's newfound abilities, Robin had filled the sink with sudsy water and had already washed three plates. He stepped up to dry. We have a dishwasher, you know. She smiled shyly. Are you going to make fun of me if I say I like washing dishes? Yep, he quipped. That's sketch. She giggled. Fine. Then I won't say it. He liked her giggle. It was charming and throaty and downright sexy. His thoughts turned warmer, and he spoke low. Thank you for dinner. It was an experience. Her eyebrows lifted. How so? Well, he stacked the dishes as he dried. It felt homey. We don't get a lot of that around here. That's a huge compliment. It is? He wished he could draw back his surprise. Robin handed him a slippery, soapy glass. Her gray eyes had a light behind them, one that drew him in. He leaned closer to her before he realized what he was doing. Her body was warm, and he wanted to hold her close. It is. Home represents all the best things in life. Safety. Warmth. Family. Acceptance. Love. I wouldn't know, he said low. My life hasn't exactly been full of those things. She leaned into him, her gentle curves fitting against his side. I'm sorry for that. I wish I could change that for you. She hummed Silent Night for a moment. You know, most people only get two shots at a family, the one they are born into, and the one they create. You get three. The one you were born into wasn't all that great, but you and Nick get to make it what you want. You can choose to make this one all that much better. It's harder than I thought it would be. Anything that's worth as much as family is is going to ask everything from you. Her hands worked faster than his, filling half the sink with dishes waiting to be rinsed and dried. She hummed again, and soon the words filled his head. He began to sing softly. Love's pure light. Radiant beams from thy holy face. She hummed louder, a beautiful alto to his bass. This woman complimented him in so many ways and was so different in others. She was all Christmas and festive and positive outlook on life. And he was all grinchy without decorations or gifts under a tree, or a tree. If he were to look at his house as a representation of what he wanted in life, then he manifested emptiness and a lack of effort. Not that he was going to run out and buy a bunch of decorations. No, sir. He wasn't going to get sucked into the commercialism and give an easy buck for big business. Singing was nice with Robin, though. They finished the song, barely loud enough to be heard on the other side of the kitchen, and yet the words had been written on his heart. 
He'd never forget these few minutes and the peace they brought if he lived to be a thousand years old. He put his arm around Robin's back, drawn to her, wanting to hold her close and keep this sense of safety she brought into his house. She turned into him, her sudsy hands landing on his chest. Her forehead wrinkled. I just ruined your shirt. You didn't ruin anything. You can't. He searched her eyes, looking for a sign that she wanted out of his arms, that she didn't want the kiss he was dying to give. He couldn't find a reason to back away. What he did find took his breath away. She had the ingredients for a lifetime connection, including love, if he dared reach for it, enchanting humor, attraction, courage, power, and promise. Robin, I'm not like you, he whispered in warning. Your Christmas joy and caroling, I'm a Scrooge. She shook her head. You're more than that, Gabe. She brushed her fingers over his cheek, and he closed his eyes. Had he ever been touched so gently? He cupped her cheek with one hand and leaned in, brushing his lips over hers. In that brief moment, something inside of him shifted. He could hear carols, smell cookies baking, and taste vanilla. The whole experience was overwhelming, and yet it only whetted his appetite. He pulled her closer, her body molding to his in the most delightful way. Robin. He whispered her name on her skin. Hmm. Her eyes fluttered as if weighed down by the desire pulsing between them. He had to kiss her again, couldn't have stopped himself if he'd tried. This time, when their mouths came together, he angled her head and deepened the kiss. Robin's hands wound in his hair, and he was lost to her. Lost in her. This is what a kiss was meant to be, not the pale, drab versions he'd experienced before, but this thrilling, tingling, tumbling moment in time that felt like eternity and went by in a blink. Chapter 12 Robin paced the small hotel room, her phone in her hand and her sister's on a video chat. She brought them together because her small Christmas project was getting out of hand. After a short recount of the evening, in which she proudly explained Nick had completed three math assignments in 30 minutes, thanks to the promise of her chocolate mousse pie, she announced, I kissed him. No one moved. She thought the picture might have frozen on her phone, glitched. So she ran her finger over the screen. Hello? Suddenly, they all started talking at once. Woot, called Frost. I'm sending you three I just got kissed outfits for tomorrow. I wish I'd known about the date, I would have prepared your wardrobe differently. Ho ho ho, Ginger said over the top of her. It's going to be a holly jolly Christmas. Lux covered her flaming cheeks. I don't need details, but I'll take them if you're dishing out. What is the matter with you? Stella yelled, drowning out the cheers. You have a televised date tomorrow night with a man who could be the love of your life, and you're kissing the security guard. Way to kill the mistletoe buzz, groused Frost. She flipped her long, white hair over her shoulder. What's the big deal? asked Ginger. Kissing is a good thing. A very good thing. Robin winked at the camera. Lux covered her mouth and ducked to hide her giggles. Besides. Robin ran her fingers through her hair. I'm not sure I want to go out with this mystery guy. I didn't like the idea of them filming a date in the first place, and I do like Gabe. Maybe I should go after him. She bit her lip. No, no, no. Stella wagged her finger. If you like him, you have to go out with this other guy. I'm not following your logic. Lux folded her arms over her Captain America tee and gave Stella the stink eye. If things didn't add up, Lux was the first to point it out. Nothing makes a woman look more desirable than to have other men chase after her. Stella grinned, triumphant. I'm afraid Stella's right. Joseph appeared in the screen right over Ginger's shoulder. One of the things that drove me nuts was hearing about Ginger's other dates on the radio. 
Having contributed a male perspective, he kissed Ginger's cheek and moved out of the screen. Ginger's eyes followed his flannel back appreciatively. Frost leaned closer to her camera, blocking out the piles of letters behind her. Robin, the real question is, is Gabe the one? Robin leaned away, unsure of her answer. I don't know. They all rolled their eyes in unison. How can you not know? demanded Ginger. Yeah, you're the one with the unnaturally strong truth gene, added Lux. She'd done extensive research on their genetic makeup several years ago. Unfortunately, none of her breakthrough findings could be published, because their genetic code, having been altered by Christmas magic, was unique in the world. Scientists would spot the anomalies in a heartbeat and call her a liar and her findings false. Still, she had figured at what point their genes altered. So that was something. Robin tugged on her ear. It's difficult for me to separate my Santa sense from my own emotions. I knew he wanted, no, needed to kiss me. So, was I drawn in by his need and my instinct to care for others, or was it because I actually wanted to kiss him? I get that, said Frost. It's like when I see a pile of mail, I have to sort it. It's compulsory. Right, but this isn't reading letters, argued Stella. This is a kiss. Quick scooted next to Lux in the screen, his arm around her back. Can I chime in here? Robin buried her face in her hands. Was the whole family going to weigh in on her dating life? Might as well. While they were at it, they should patch in Grandma and Gramps, no doubt they'd have a few words of advice to give. I submit that you wanted to kiss him. Quick pointed at the tabletop. Lux turned her attention on her husband. Explain that hypothesis, please. Stella made gagging motions at their goo-goo eyes. Gabe can't be the first guy to want to kiss Robin. He lifted his finger and shook it. And yet she hasn't gone around kissing every guy who has that desire. Ergo, she wanted to kiss him. Robin sealed her lips shut. The truth, that there were precious few men who'd wanted to kiss her over the last three years, did not need to come out of her lips. She'd been on enough dates that they could go ahead and think she was a hugely desired woman. Her throat squeezed, and she gritted her teeth. When the pressure was too much, she finally gasped, I haven't had the opportunity to test that theory. Stella sat up. That's perfect. What, everyone asked at once. We'll use the date tomorrow night to test that theory. If this guy wants to kiss Robin, and she can resist him, then we know she wanted to kiss Gabe. Lux and Quick were the first to nod. It's an awfully small control group. Normally we'd like to use at least ten other men, said Quick. I'm not going out with ten men, we don't have time. Robin pointed out. That got her another round of head nods. We're twenty days away from Christmas Eve, which is the last possible moment I could wrap this up. You're punny. Ginger winked. Robin rolled her eyes. Speaking of deadlines, how are things back home? Roxy's report was not good. The Alaskan kitchen was doing fine, but they couldn't make enough treats for the world. The North Pole kitchen struggled at best. Stella cleared her throat. We're doing fine. The toy machines have been tarped off. Our biggest problem now is rusting. The older equipment has been here a long time. I think Christmas magic kept the elements from interfering with production, but the water breaks metal down. It's happening at an accelerated rate. The mail room is slowly flooding. Preservation is an issue. Frost twisted her white hair through her fingers. We're working on channeling the water to the stables, where it can run outside. But that's creating a problem of its own. How so? asked Quick. It freezes once it hits the edge of the ice castle and creates a dam. The stable elves break it up and throw it outside, but it's a constant task. He nodded. 
Let me come take a look at things. Maybe if we pipe the excess water straight into the ocean, we'll have a better time of it. I'll take all the help I can get. What about the kitchens? asked Ginger. Robin checked her notebook. The off-site baking can't keep up with worldwide demand. We're going to be short this year. I won't stuff the stockings so full, then. Ginger's crestfallen face was enough to pile a mountain of guilt on Robin. I promise, I'm trying to fall in love. It's just, not easy. We believe in you, said Lux. The others echoed the statement. For a Kringle, the words I believe in you were stronger than any others. Believing in Santa, even when you grew too old for dolls or trucks, was a magical gift, a way to give back to the man, or woman, who dedicated time and energy and love to making others happy and bringing Christmas cheer to the whole world. Robin took courage from their faith in her. I appreciate it. Stella grinned wickedly. You know, if you want to test this kissing theory out, I could arrange more participants. Robin shuddered. The idea of lining up a group of men under the mistletoe scared her to death. No. Thank you very much for the offer, but I'm happy with our sample of one. Maybe I'll test it out, then. Stella winked. Stella, Ginger warned. I will put you on the naughty list. Stella lifted her chin. Wouldn't be the first time. Robin laughed. Stay off the naughty list for me this year. I have enough to worry about, okay? Stella huffed, crossing her arms over her chest. It wasn't an agreement, but knowing her sister, it was as close as Robin was going to get to one. Another worry popped up. How am I going to know if he's jealous? All her sisters started laughing. Robin's hackles went up. She hated being laughed at. Call it a firstborn thing, but she liked to be taken seriously. Believe me, said Ginger between giggles, you'll know. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. I'm going to bake something now, and I'm not sharing with any of you. Robin tapped the end call icon and glanced around the crowded hotel room. She had a mini fridge and a microwave. This wouldn't do, not if she was staying in town for the next week or so. She sent an SOS to Stella to find her a place with an oven. Then she pulled the ingredients for caramel popcorn balls out of her purse and set to work. The challenge of creating greatness with only a microwave took up enough of her attention that she was able to put her nerves on the back burner. However, as soon as she was in front of a Hallmark movie, enjoying her treat, her stomach flipped over like Donner enjoying a night out. She ate three caramel balls before she could breathe normally. Kissing a stranger was way out of her comfort zone. Kissing Gabe, however, had felt totally natural. She wasn't nervous as he looked deeply into her eyes and leaned in. She hadn't second-guessed where her hands should go or if she was too into it or not into it enough. She just kissed. And it rocked her world. She dropped her head in her hands. If only she could hear her heart under all the Santa jeans that seemed to take over when she was around Gabe. With a new determination to face her challenge the next day and understand her heart, she went up to the roof to intercept Frost's delivery and pick an outfit. The best way out of their current problem was for her to find true love and get married. She could do this. Chapter 13 Gabe stood behind camera number two, his arms folded and his hands in fists. He should be happy. Robin's blind date was going great. She and Stephen hit it off right away. Stephen was in big business. He wore a light gray suit with a blue striped tie and a white shirt. Wardrobe had him wearing makeup. From here it looked like they'd sprayed on a tan, but from experience he knew the guy would come across as healthy looking on camera. Gabe hated his successful, happy guts. What did Stephen know about anything in the real world? He'd been handed a master's degree by his one percenter parents and given a company to run when his dad wanted to spend more time in Nantucket. 
Robin's laughter pealed through the air. Gabe spun on his heel, scanning the Italian restaurant. The studio had rented out the place for the morning. There were extras pretending to eat at several tables, giving the viewer the idea that this was a hopping joint. They'd also darkened the windows so it looked like night had fallen, even though it was 10 in the morning and they should have been serving pancakes. He could really go for one of Robin's feel-good muffins right about now. The sounds of flirting faded into silence, which was much worse than the laughter. He could imagine all sorts of awful things happening in that silence. He spun in time to see Stephen offering Robin a taste of his meal from his fork. PFT. Gabe scoffed. Robin wouldn't fall for that cliché move. SHH, Jerry, the producer, glared at him. He nodded, clenching his jaw to help him keep his mouth shut. Jerry might not be his boss, but he had a direct path to firing Gabe if he interfered with any part of filming the show or degraded the participants. Security was supposed to be seen and not heard. Robin leaned over and accepted the bite, her beautiful bowed lips closing around the fork. Gabe wanted to throw something. Dude, chill. Nick sidled up to him. His brother's sudden appearance caused his anger to poof out and then deflate like marshmallows in the microwave. What? How? He stammered, wondering what Nick was doing there. The tracking app goes both ways, bro. Nick smacked him on the back. You guys were talking about filming on site today, and I wanted to check it out. Gabe widened his eyes and whispered harshly, you should be in school. I'm skipping, Jim. He shrugged. Gabe bit back several curse words and a long lecture on sloughing any class. The fact that Nick's eyes were alight and they were having an actual conversation, no cutting marks included, took all the bluster out of Gabe's sales. Nick's eyes narrowed. Who's the windbag? He jerked his chin toward the table. Stephen. Gabe couldn't think the guy's name without a bucket full of sarcasm, saying it out loud was worse. He's not worth her time. Gabe grinned. That's something we can agree on. But, he glanced around quickly, Jerry had moved over to camera one. I need this job, so keep your voice down. Yeah, yeah. Nick waved off his concern. I'm going to look for food. Behave, Gabe hissed after him. The studio didn't film anything without a buffet of some sort. There was a table in the lobby full of candy bars, bags of nuts, and other goodies to ward off hunger and the accompanying bad mood. Nick could graze there for a while. Gabe went back to watching the date through the small screen on the big camera. It was easier than seeing it happen in person, a level removed. What are your five-year goals? Stephen asked. What is this, a job interview? Gabe huffed, careful to keep his thoughts to himself. Well, Robin daintily dabbed her napkin at her lips. I'd like to be married with a baby by then. Gabe's head jerked back. A baby? She hadn't said anything about having babies last night. She'd be stunning with a child in her arms. He scowled, wondering if she felt more comfortable with this pretentious jerk than she had with him. Stephen didn't react at all to her announcement. I mean, career-wise. Is there an opportunity for advancement in your family business? Um. She set her napkin on her lap. Not really. Then I think you should look elsewhere, move on. He took her hand and gazed at her fondly. Robin's mouth fell open. Move on? He used his other hand to rub small circles across the back of her hand, as if he could soothe away the shock he plastered on her face. I've seen it time and time again. Staying in a family business clips your wings. Your parents will never see your full potential. You don't know my parents, she said dryly. I know that a woman like you can be an influencer in the world if you get out from under your parents' thumb. She bit her bottom lip. 
not in the fetching way she had at other times, but in a way that said she was trying to hold back words. Her eyes darted to her sister, Stella, whose face was as red as her blouse. These two were tight, which meant the whole family was probably close. Insulting their parents was not a good move. Even Gabe, with his little dating experience, could figure that one out without much effort. He passed his hand over his mouth to smother his smile. Stephen was blowing their date in a major way. Stephen couldn't see the warning signs written all over Robin's face. What you really need is someone with a fresh perspective on your life. Someone who can see the amazing woman you are inside and out. I can break you free from the cage you're trapped in. I'm anything but trapped. Robin pulled her napkin off her lap and set it firmly by her plate. I love what I do. Managing an industrial kitchen is fine, but it's not life-changing for anyone. Robin was half out of her seat. Are you saying that a child's happiness on Christmas morning doesn't matter? A fire lit in Gabe's chest. Half of him was incensed on her behalf. Who did this guy think he was to judge her career choice? The other half of him was impressed with the warrior princess rising up to defend herself. That was hot. What do children have to do with anything? Stephen took on a tone of condescension. Children have to do with everything. Robin slapped her palm on the table, making the silverware bounce. Really? I would think you'd be above shackling yourself to a nursery. Stephen glared. I've seen the way a child brings a woman down. She goes from a powerhouse to a powder puff in nine months flat. Gabe grunted in disgust. Stella bared her teeth. Robin's look could have frozen over the tablecloth. Just then, Nick walked past, wearing a white apron and carrying a serving tray. He pretended to trip on the carpet, and an entire cherry-covered cheesecake landed in Stephen's face. Stella let out a whoop. The director clapped her hands and then slapped them over her huge smile. Robin stared at Nick for a brief moment before realizing she should pretend she didn't know him. Gabe prayed he was the only one who caught the look of recognition. His heart hammered. He should step in, but if he did, then he could lose his job. Stephen sputtered, shaking cake from his face and wiping cherries off his white shirt. He left behind pink smears that were never going to come out. You stupid, clumsy. Robin reached across the table and grabbed a handful of Stephen's suit. He scrambled back in shock but had nowhere to go while still sitting down. I will never kiss you. Her voice dripped with ice. The feeling was so strong that several people, including Stephen, shivered. She shoved Stephen away and backed up, her hands shaking with rage on behalf of his brother. Gabe surged forward, his whole being needed to insert himself between Stephen and Robin, who held onto Nick's arm in a possessive way. I didn't sign up for this. Stephen spat. Gabe made it to the table just as Stephen got to his feet, dripping cheesecake all over the carpet. He jumped into the fray and puffed out his chest, spreading his arms out to keep Stephen from getting to the people he cared about more than anything else in this world. Robin's hand landed on the small of his back, filling him with warmth and happiness even as he wanted to tear into this guy for calling his brother names. Nobody called Nick stupid. Chelsea surged forward, her hands out in front of her as she tried to calm Stephen down. We'll compensate you for the suit. I'm so sorry. A chunk of cream cheese fell off Stephen's face. I'd like to get cleaned up and give this another shot. He pasted on a fake smile. I'm really interested in you, Robin. I was just taken off guard. It's not every day I get a cheesecake in the face. Chelsea twittered. Who does? We were all shocked. She looked closer at Nick. I don't remember your name. Nick glanced at Gabe. I, uh, don't think we've met. Robin put her hand on Gabe's arm, gently pushing it down so she could step into the conversation. It doesn't matter. 
What does is that I've seen the real you, Stephen. You're driven, and you're going to be successful in whatever you do in this life. But I don't think we have the same long-term goals. I want a family, and you want to make yourself look good. Those two things can work together. Stephen reached for her. She recoiled into Gabe's chest. His arms wrapped around her without a thought, and he held her. The mood in the room shifted. Chelsea glanced at the two of them, something clicking in her eyes. Stella ran forward and ushered Stephen out of the dining area. Perhaps a dry cleaner can get the stains out, she looked back and then pushed him along with a little more force. Her actions spurred the rest of the crew into movement. It was like they'd all forgotten they were here to film and do a job, they'd been caught up in the drama. While Chelsea threw out instructions for cleaning up the trail of graham cracker crust crumbs he left in his wake, Robin whispered to Gabe, get Nick out of here. He looked at her. But, you. I'm a big girl. He's the one who needs to escape, quickly. She nudged him. While they're all distracted. He nodded. Lifting her hand, he pressed a quick kiss to her palm and then grabbed Nick by the back of his shirt and hauled him into the kitchen. What? Nick growled. Stop wiggling and look contrite. Gabe gave him a little shake. Nick stuck out his lower lip and hung his head in the worst impression of humility Gabe had ever seen. He worked to stifle his guffaw. His brother was not an actor. Once they were through the employee door and in the alley, Gabe let him go. Admit it. Nick's whole face was alight. You're glad I smeared him. Gabe finally let the lid off his laughter. The look on Stephen's face, priceless. Get on back to school before someone figures out we're related. He pretended to kick Nick in the backside. Nick danced out of the way. Hey! Bring some of that garlic bread home. It smelled really good. Gabe shook his head. You're lucky you're not grounded. Robin wouldn't let you ground me. Robin isn't your mom. No, but she could be my sister-in-law. He walked backward a few steps. Think about it. She has to marry someone by Christmas for the show, right? Why not you? Gabe's chest felt heavy. We're two very different people. Who make out in the kitchen? Nick snickered. Hey. Gabe lunged at him as if he were going to tackle him. Nick evaded capture, laughing lightly. Gabe and Robin kissing by the sink, he sang. Get out of here. Gabe pointed to the end of the alley. Nick went, still singing. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love. Then comes marriage. Then comes a baby named after me in the baby carriage. Gabe Mock glared after him until he rounded the corner and disappeared. As soon as he was gone, Gabe deflated and kicked at an empty box. Yeah, marriage would be great. But it wasn't like he and Robin ran in the same circles. She dated guys in suits, not uniforms. When he really thought about the two of them together, all he could see was their differences. Discouraged, he went inside. He had to at least act like he was doing his job. If anyone found out that the kid who snuck in was his brother, he'd be in the unemployment line in a heartbeat. He might not get the girl this Christmas, no matter how much he wanted her, but he'd make sure he filled Nick's Christmas list. That was something he could make happen. Getting the girl for Christmas, he wasn't sure was even a possibility. Chapter 14 Robin handed the casting assistant a wet wipe she pulled out of her magical purse. Thanks. Jen cleaned her hands while studying the information in front of her. She'd run her hand across the dry erase board and come out all inked up. You're welcome. Robin continued around the room, coming up with solutions to problems almost before people knew they needed them. 
She gave out a red pen, a two-foot piece of string, and a hair clip before she felt Jerry needed to talk to her. Bounding over, because it felt so good to give in to her Santa side and serve others, she grinned. What can I do for you? He took her sudden appearance in stride. First of all, I'm sorry about Stephen. He ran a hand down his face. He noticed he needed a shave, and therefore Robin noticed. Her fingers itched to pull a battery-operated razor out of her purse and hand it over. However, that level of insight into people was hard to explain away. She'd leave it on his desk later. He continued with his apology. He hit all the right marks on your profile, including a love of Christmas. My what now? He reached out a hand, and his assistant slapped a pile of papers in his palm. The profile you gave us on your ideal man. Robin zeroed in on the top page and found Stella's handwriting. Of course! She could only imagine what type of guy Stella thought she should be with. Well, she didn't have to imagine, because she just sent him out the door with a cherry on top. Bless Nick! She could have kissed him for landing that cheesecake in Stephen's face. As soon as she had a moment, she'd send a text to Ginger and have Stephen etched onto the naughty list for the way he'd spoken to Nick. We're working on another candidate. He's actually a brother to a staff member, who will vouch for him. I want you to know that I'm personally invested in this project. The idea of finding you a husband and having a Christmas wedding has taken over all of our thoughts. We're rooting for you, Robin. We want you to find love. His earnestness was endearing. I'm not upset. I've been trying to do this for over a year now. It's not an exact science. Thank you for trying, though. Jerry leaned closer. I have to confess that my wife is all over this. She begs me for information about the show and even you. It's the most we've talked in months. His desire for a happy marriage flooded Robin. He loved his wife with all his heart and felt like he let her down with how many hours he worked. Bring her with you tomorrow. I'd love to meet her. His face brightened. That's a fantastic idea. He wanted to be seen as successful and for his wife to know how much he put into making the show a success. For her to see how many people's jobs depended on him doing his. He wanted to be her superman. Not because he was prideful, but because he cherished her opinion. A bud of hope grew in Robin's chest. If Jerry was a man like that, then there were good men out there. What's going on? Stella sauntered over. She winked at Robin to let her know that everything with Stephen was all smoothed over. Stella had Santa's charm and wasn't afraid to use it. Where Robin often had to fight her instincts in public, Stella just let them all gush out, and people adored her for it. So. Not. Fair. We were just discussing tomorrow's show. Jerry filled her in. I'm not sure there's going to be another show. Stella gave Robin a look full of meaning. Yeah, Robin had jumped into Gabe's arms in front of everyone and been quite happy to land there, but that didn't mean he was her one and only. They hadn't had the chance to run the kiss test because Stephen morphed into a South Pole elf before she got the chance. Boss. Gary, the production assistant, held out his phone. We got another one. Play it, Jerry instructed. Here? Gary glanced at Robin and Stella. A strong sense of protection came from him. Whatever was on that phone didn't bode well for the Kringle sisters. Yeah, they need to know. Okay. He tapped the screen, and a familiar, menacing voice came through. Robin needs to go away. Either you guys stop filming with her, or I'll make sure she doesn't make it to her next date. And take my episode down, today. I'd threaten to get a lawyer, but I'd rather take care of things myself, if you get my drift. Stella put her arm around Robin. Jerry scrubbed his cheek. 
This isn't the first threatening message he's left. It's the meanest, said Gary. Call Officer Taggart, send him a copy. Let him know we're filming out of the studio today. And get the rental ready. We're sending her over tonight. Jerry sent Gary off to take care of the police and turned on Robin. I need to know how you knew those things about the contestants. Specifically Kylo. The truth was hard to explain and scratching at the back of the throat. I told you, I had a feeling he was hiding something. It came across in his voice, he's dark. That was an awfully specific feeling, Jerry pressed. Did someone leak his name? The police want to know. They ran a check on him for us. He's been in jail and has a string of suspicious bodies behind him only lacking evidence or a solid testimony. He's a really bad dude to mess with. I'm trying to figure out how he got through our screening process and what his motives were for being on the show. Robin put her hand on her throat, the pressure building with the words piling up inside of her. I found out, Stella jumped in. I stumbled into their names the first day and googled them. What were you doing by my office? Jerry asked. Looking for Robin. She was helping someone, the accountant, was it, organize a drawer or something? Robin sagged with relief. Yes, I was organizing a drawer. I have a lot of energy and don't sit still well. Jerry nodded. I've noticed that about you, both of you. He looked back and forth between them. Well, I guess that clears that up. Okay, I don't want either of you to worry. We have a new plan. Gabe, he called, and he motioned for him to come over. Robin's heart rate spiked like she'd eaten a dozen chocolate-covered pineapple slices. She grabbed Stella's hand and squeezed before letting it go again. Stella pinched her side. Gabe came to stand beside her. She felt something strange from him, a need she didn't recognize. It was confusing but also, wonderful. Like the first sip of almond-flavored hot chocolate. She wasn't expecting the additional layers of flavoring, but they were welcome. She bit back her questions. Gabe had told her he didn't want his boss to know they'd gone out, and acting too familiar would raise questions. He already kissed her palm, and she was pretty sure Chelsea had caught the exchange. For some reason, the director was nowhere to be found. Can I help you with something? Gabe asked. He brushed Robin's arm with his, causing goosebumps to appear. She stared at her arm. Never having seen her skin react that way before, she had trouble processing. We have a situation and a possible solution that hinges on you. Jerry turned his full attention on Gabe. The threats against Miss Kringle have escalated. Robin wiped her smile away. Jerry wouldn't be calling her Miss Kringle to Gabe if he knew they'd kissed and kissed well the night before. Gabe glanced at her out of the corner of his eye. He was thinking the same thing. Her body flushed. We'd like to increase the security we provide. I asked the security director for someone with experience as a bodyguard. He said you had worked in the private sector before joining Spritzworks Studios. Gabe stood a little taller. I did. Robin's mouth fell open. I didn't know that. Stella elbowed her in the side to tell her to shut her mouth. Thankfully, Jerry continued on as if she hadn't spoken. We've rented a house in a secure location and would like you to stay with Robin 24-7 until the show is over and she can return home. Whoa! Stella put up her hands. We Kringles don't go around spending the night with guys. I'm not sure, Robin began to protest. She could just see her mother's expression when she explained that she was moving in with Gabe. Maybe if he didn't make her heart rise like bread dough in the proofer, it would be one thing. But she was seriously attracted to this man in uniform. Dang, he looked good in black. I have other responsibilities, Gabe threw out. 
It's not like I can just walk away from my life. All of them spoke over the top of one another. Jerry stuck his fingers in his mouth and whistled. They all stopped talking and stared at him. The house has five rooms. Which means Stella can stay. And your family can come too, he said to Gabe. Stella's the kind of babysitter who shows the kid where the candy stash is and encourages them to jump on the bed. Robin folded her arms. Her sister would have a roaring fire in the hearth, two mugs of ambrosia cocoa, and chocolate-dipped strawberries awaiting them. Then she'd disappear for hours on end, hoping Robin would wear out the mistletoe. With all that romance in the air, Robin would never know if she kissed Gabe because she wanted to or because he wanted to kiss her. She pressed a couple fingers to her eyebrow, the whole situation was making her dizzy. Why do you need a babysitter? Jerry asked. His gaze hardened as he glared at Gabe, do you not trust him? That's not it. Robin waved her hands frantically. This whole thing is unnecessary. I promise you, my home is the safest place in the world. It's practically a fortress. Good, then Gabe can go home with you. Stella sucked in through her teeth. Robin balked. That's impossible, she blurted before she thought of a kinder way to express the fact that if she took Gabe home, he'd die of hypothermia. Only Kringles could see the ice palace and experience the protective benefits of Christmas magic. Look, we all want what's best for you, Robin. So, either you take the protection we can offer, or we cancel the show. I can't in good conscience put you in danger. Robin glanced around at the people scurrying to get the restaurant ready for the afternoon rush. Under the layer of productivity was the stress of paying for the holidays. Not everyone felt it, but there were people counting on the extra filming to make the season a little brighter this year. If she pulled out now, she'd let them all down. Safe house it is. She smiled. Wonderful. Jerry clapped his hands once and took off without saying goodbye. He did that a lot. It was like he had running conversations with everyone on the crew and he picked them up and set them down easily. Gabe made eye contact with her and her breath caught at the intensity burning there. I'll protect you, Robin. I promise. That same feeling she had before, his need she didn't know how to feel, wrapped around her. Stella snickered. I think it's you she's going to need protection from, big guy. Gabe scowled. Don't worry. I'll be the perfect gentleman. His tone implied that he wouldn't kiss her again. Indeed, Robin picked up on his resolve to keep her at arm's length. She gulped. Right at this very minute, she didn't want to kiss him. But he looked grumpy, so who wanted to kiss a Grinch? Then again, it wasn't like she was completely repulsed either. She still found his big arms and broad shoulders extremely attractive. I'm not scared of you, if that's what you're thinking. It's not. He pulled out his phone. I need to text Nick. He should pack. She brightened. Tell him thank you for today. Gabe's cheek twitched like he wanted to smile but fought against it. You can tell him tonight. I'll arrange to have someone else drive you to the safe house so I can pick him up. He nodded to Stella as he walked off. What do you see in that guy? Stella asked. Robin grinned. Right now, she was seeing his very nice backside. Potential, she responded. Ugh. I'll take finished product any day. Stella pulled out her phone. I'm calling the family and sending an update. I'll check in with Roxy. She should know I'm not going to make it tonight. Robin's cheer slipped away. I'm scared for Christmas, Stella. What if we don't make it? Stella bit her cheek and hit call. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. If the North Pole continues to melt, we're going to need a bridge to get out of it. Stella chewed her lip. 
Maybe you should work on that kissing thing a little more. Robin nodded. I think I want to kiss Gabe again. You think? Okay, I do. Then get on with it. She shooed Robin away. Hey, Ginger, Frost. Where's Lux? She wandered off to give the update. Robin pulled out her phone and stared at the screen so she didn't look like a complete basket case, staring at nothing while she thought about how, exactly, to go about kissing Gabe again. She wasn't exactly versed in the fine art of seduction. Whatever she did had to be subtle and yet make her intentions clear. What exactly were her intentions? Did she want to marry Gabe? That was a very good question. One she didn't have the answer to. But she was sure she wanted to explore the possibility with him. That was a step in the right direction. She just wasn't sure how many steps she'd have to take before she knew if Gabe was the one for her, and Christmas Eve was only 18 days away. Chapter 15 Gabe punched in the key code his boss had texted him, and the front door to the safe house clicked open. From the empty driveway and lack of tire tracks in the fresh snow, he deduced that he and Nick were the first ones to arrive. A good thing, because he wanted to get the lay of the land. He'd been out of private security for years and needed to brush up on a few things. He grabbed his old manual from work and watched a few My Heart Channel videos posted by the guys at his old firm while Nick packed. By the time he shoved his .45 into his holster, his confidence had returned. Whoa! This place is lit! Nick dropped his bag by the door and sauntered into the living room, where a giant flat screen called a siren song. Gabe shook his head. Be cool, man. Act like you've been here before, you know? I would if I'd been anywhere close to this. Nick landed on the couch and propped his feet on the coffee table. I could get used to living here. Gabe ignored the dirty sneakers on the pristine wood tabletop as he stepped over Nick's legs. The house was impressive, with vaulted ceilings, a large barnwood fan with silver accents hanging from the ceiling, and a floor-to-ceiling fireplace. Leather couches and a love seat ringed the shaggy carpet, and rustic lamps adorned the end tables. Just as he was about to sit down, a rustling sound came from the kitchen. Nick's feet jerked back. Did you hear that? Yeah. Gabe drew his sidearm. Stay here he whispered. Nick's eyes were huge. He shook his head. I'm right behind you. The last thing Gabe needed was Nick caught in crossfire. But he'd probably be safer standing behind Gabe than he would out here in the open. Gabe jerked his head for him to follow. He should have thought twice before bringing his kid brother into a potentially dangerous situation, but what else was he supposed to do? If he turned down the spot as Robin's security, then some other guy would be here. No one would watch over her like he would. They crept along the wall that separated the living room from the kitchen, keeping their backs to the sheet rock. The sound came again. He judged it to be ten feet from the doorway. Leaning his arms around and keeping most of his body behind the wall, he yelled, Freeze! A man dropped a bag of flour on the floor and threw his hand in the air. The flour puffed, concealing him from view for a moment before it began to settle over every surface in the kitchen. Gabe registered that this wasn't Kylo. He had a trimmed-up beard and wore a red plaid flannel shirt with beat-up jeans. The scent of pine hit Gabe's nose. Not the kind that came in a cleaning bottle, but the Christmas tree kind. Who are you? he barked at the intruder. If Kylo had sent a minion to do his dirty work, then Gabe was going to send a message right back. I'm Joseph Bear. I don't know that name. Gabe adjusted his grip on his gun. I'm Robin's brother-in-law. Nick tugged on the back of his shirt. The fireplace, he whispered. Not now, Gabe hissed. What are you doing here? he asked Joseph. Special delivery, chirped a woman's voice from behind him. 
he turned, keeping his gun on the man, to see a beautiful woman dressed all in a red velvet skirt and blouse. The skirt went to the floor, but a pair of black boots poked out from under the hem. She had a sweet girl standing at her side, dressed in a short green skirt with leggings and a fuzzy sweater. They had bags of groceries in their arms. The scent of ginger snaps made Gabe's stomach growl. Excuse me, Gabe. She smiled, and her eyes sparkled. You're blocking the door. Gabe looked at the gun, the guy who only had eyes for this woman, and then Nick, who cast worried glances at the fireplace. Nick, she said his name so sweetly. Can you take these for me? Sure. Nick stepped forward and took the bags, grunting under their weight. He was almost a full head taller than the woman, but he staggered where she had glided. So much for catching the bad guy on his first day. These people were obviously Robin's family. They all shared the same sense of jolliness, like an aura of goodwill about them. Gabe put his gun away and folded his arms. Sorry about the welcome. I didn't know you would be here. It was a last-minute decision. I'm Ginger, by the way. You've met my husband, Joseph, and this is Layla. She indicated the girl standing next to her, casting shy glances at Nick. We knew Robin wouldn't be able to sleep tonight without baking something, so we thought we'd bring her supplies. I didn't see a car out front, he prodded. Something didn't add up. His protective skills weren't that rusty. He'd given the exterior of the house a once-over before he and Nick had made their way inside. Auntie Robin! Layla rushed past him and threw her arms around Robin's neck. Robin, who had just entered the room, lifted her up as she hugged her back. They were almost the same height, which meant Layla was probably 14 or 15 years old. He glanced at Nick, who was busy unloading the groceries and shoving them in random cupboards in an attempt to look helpful. Ginger followed behind him easily straightening things out without him seeing. You're even more beautiful today than yesterday. Robin beamed at her niece. You say that every day. Layla laughed and hopped away. Gabe couldn't help but notice the difference between his brother and this girl. Layla was confident in her place in this family. She'd obviously been showered with love and attention that helped her blossom into a confident young woman. He'd bet she was on the student council and in the choir. Nick just wanted to fit in somewhere and had no idea how to make that happen. Gabe once again felt his shortcomings as a guardian. Stella followed Robin in, glanced Layla over, and pulled a beautiful necklace out of her purse. Here. She gave it to Layla. Layla held it up to her shirt. It was the perfect accessory to her fitted cream sweater. I love it. I thought of you. Stella winked like they had an inside joke. The room was getting full. Speaking of which, how'd you guys get inside? As far as he knew, the only two people with the code were him and his boss. The fireplace, Layla quipped. There was a beat where Robin and her family exchanged glances. Then everyone began talking and moving at once, unloading sacks and asking after other family members. Stella gave Nick a high five for the cheesecake incident. Soon, she was reenacting the whole thing for everyone. Gabe frowned. They'd ignored his question. I set the tree up in the front room, said a woman right behind him. He jumped, startled that she'd been able to sneak up on him. Sorry. She glanced up, looked down at the folder in her hands, and then stuffed it behind her back. I'm Frost. She smiled big, her white teeth matching her white hair. If he didn't know better, he'd think she was a Barbie doll come to life in her 1940s plaid pants and matching sweater. Her hair was even pulled up in a high ponytail that swished when she walked. Gabe, he responded. How did you get in here? Ginger hopped between them. Frost, you have to hear this cheesecake story. 
She pulled the pixie-sized woman away before she could answer. And we're going to make Christmas cookies with Nick. Nick was listening to Layla rattle off the possible cookie options. She said chocolate chip, and his whole face lit up. Gabe stormed into the living room, needing a little space. The kitchen was too crowded, and no one listened to a word he said. He stopped short and jumped back against the wall at the sight of a giant evergreen tree in the corner of the living room. That hadn't been here when he'd walked in. He had less than a minute to contemplate how a little thing like Frost could carry a tree five times her size in the house before Robin walked in with an armful of greenery. Where is Lux? she asked Ginger, who had five large red candles tucked into the crook of her arm. She's supposed to wire this place for lights. Gabe watched in fascination as the two of them had the mantle decked out for the holidays like pros. They moved so quickly and he was so quiet that he didn't think they knew he was there. There was something fishy going on with this family. They were all just so nice. Ginger shrugged as she pulled a large snow globe out of her purse. Call her. Robin fished her phone out of her back pocket. Gabe tried not to notice how nicely shaped she was, but there was only so much professionalism a guy could muster when he already knew how sweet a kiss from those lips tasted. She connected the call and put it on speaker so she could fluff the greenery. Lux? You're on lighting. I've got a water situation in the control room. Quick and I are working on a plan for a controlled melt to create a canal system. Robin's hands froze. She locked eyes with Ginger. Is it really that bad? She asked both of them. It will be. This is preventative, Lux replied. Keep me posted. Robin turned off the phone. I'm so sorry, she whispered to Ginger. You're doing your best. Ginger rubbed her back. The weight Robin carried was too much for Gabe to watch, even though he had no idea what she had to be sorry for. I can do lights, he said, making both women start. Ginger recovered first. That would be a huge help. She handed her purse to Robin. They're in here. She grinned another one of those secret smiles that were starting to grate on his nerves. I think the ladder is behind the tree. She stepped out of sight for a moment and came back with a step stool that would allow him to reach the highest branches with ease. Here it is. Gabe gave up trying to figure out how she'd gotten the ladder back there, or when. Or how they came up with all these decorations when the house was without a crumb fit for a mouse and he was done worrying about the secret looks they passed. It must be a family thing, and he and Nick had no idea about how it all worked because they didn't have a family. The situation was giving him a headache. I'm going to help with cookies. Ginger headed to the kitchen. You know I'm going to make more, don't you? Robin teased. Ginger flipped around and rubbed her belly. I can never have enough cookies. Robin rolled her eyes. The only woman in existence who has the metabolism to eat a world's worth of cookies and not gain a pound. She blinked, seeming to realize he was still there. You don't have a problem with heights, do you? Robin asked quickly, tucking a strand of hair behind her ear. Her gray eyes sparkled in the candlelight. Christmas carols blared from the kitchen and then turned down to a manageable level. No. I'm fine. He stared for a beat too long before catching himself. He took the end of the lights, his hand brushing hers. Suddenly, his attraction to her was up full force and fogging his brain. He climbed the steps, doing his best to keep from taking her in his arms. She was like a drug or something tempting him with a look or a touch. One of the subsections of his bodyguard manual laid out specific rules for keeping the person you guarded out of your heart. Emotional entanglements led to disasters and mistakes. He snaked the multicolored lights around the top of the tree. Looking for the end of the strand, he saw the cord running into the bag. How long is this thing? He didn't want to run out of lights. 
Robin pressed her lips together for a brief moment. Probably just as long as we need it to be. He went back to work. You've got more stashed somewhere? We have enough of everything. She smiled up at him. He focused on not falling off the ladder as he got down. She was so pretty it knocked him sideways sometimes. I've never had a real tree before. It's nice. But. But what? She asked, pulling more slack out for him to use. Now I know what I've been missing. His voice held a note of melancholy he wasn't aware of before, and he hoped Robin hadn't picked up on it. They worked together in silence for a few minutes until he got on his knees to finish off the bottom. There was a lot of room under this tree for presents. Too bad they wouldn't be here for Christmas. Maybe he could talk to his boss about him and Nick staying a couple extra days. It could be his surprise for Nick. With the extra filming, he should have the money. She answered him quietly. Now that you know what you're doing, you can recreate it. If there's one thing I've learned over the last three years, it's that Christmas is what you make of it. She handed him the end of the lights, and he plugged them in. The tree lit up, and Robin clapped, squealing happily. It's beautiful. She got down beside him and tugged his arm. Come here, you have to see this. Lying on her back, she shimmied herself under the tree until all he could see were her long, luscious legs. He shook those thoughts out of his brain, as best he could, and followed her under the tree. She scooted to make room for him, but their shoulders touched and her hip was against his hip. Look up! She said. He turned and found a beautiful sight. The lights, in red, blue, yellow, and green, glowed softly among the branches. It's so magical, Robin whispered. The tree was beautiful but Robin was more so. He angled his head to look at her instead. Her skin had a soft, timeless glow, like one of those old black-and-white photos of movie stars. He lifted his hand and ran his fingers down her cheek. I've never met a woman like you. You say that like it's a bad thing. He smiled softly. I'm just trying to figure you out. She cupped his hand to her cheek and laughed. Good luck. He blinked at her humor laced with a bit of sarcasm. She recovered. I mean, men have been trying to figure out women since the dawn of time, and no one succeeded. She scooted out and sat up. He did the same, catching her rearranging her hair. There was a pine needle stuck in the front. He retrieved it and tossed it into the fireplace. I guess we'd better get some ornaments on this tree, she said slowly, like she was testing out the thought of getting up or getting closer. Their eyes met and held. Um, they turned to see Frost standing by the fireplace. I really, really need to get home. She widened her eyes at Robin, sending her a secret message. This time, Gabe knew there was more to her request than wanting to say goodbye to her sister. Robin hopped to her feet. Thanks for coming down. They hugged. Gabe slowly got up, dusting the pine needles off his shirt. How had he ended up with dozens while Robin got away with just one? Gabe and I were just going to hang the mistletoe in the hallway. She dug in Ginger's purse and pulled out a large sprig of real mistletoe with a ribbon attached. She grabbed his hand and took him toward the back rooms, stopping just out of sight of the living room and looking around. Where do you think we should put it? She placed herself between him and the living room. He watched her, all his senses going off that she was hiding something. He went to step around her, and she moved in the same direction, bumping into him. Oof! Sorry. She giggled. The sound of jingle bells rang out overhead, and then there was a clomp-clomp. What was that? He moved her to the side and ran into the living room. Did you hear that? He looked around wildly, then looked up. I think it's the music. Robin pointed to the kitchen, where jingle bells played. 
I think I'm on Christmas overload. He rubbed his temples. Robin laughed, setting the mistletoe on the end table. Maybe we should leave the tree and mistletoe for another time. You look like you could use some cookies. She took his hand and pulled him into the kitchen. He slammed on the brakes in the doorway. Paper snowflakes hung from the ceiling, and there were lights in the windows. I thought the front room was festive, but this place looks like Santa's workshop. They all froze in place, like wax statues at Ripley's Believe It or Not. Museum. Ha ha ha. Ginger's laugh was too high and forced. All we need are some elves. There were nervous chuckles passed around. Nick grinned like a fool. Gabe narrowed his eyes. No, Nick grinned like someone who'd been let in on the joke. Great, now he was the only outsider. That was a welcome feeling. Robin pulled him right up to the bar and handed him a warm chocolate chip cookie. Try this. At her words, everyone started moving again, talking over the music or singing a few bars. He tasted the cookie. Well? He set it down and frowned. I can tell you didn't make it. She cocked her head. How? It's missing, you. It was a good cookie. Any other time of year, he would have snarfed it down and gone for another. She melted against his side. That is the sweetest thing anyone's ever said to me. I saw a flyer for the Christmas festival today, Ginger said, inserting herself into their conversation. She elbowed Joseph. He rubbed his side. Oh, yeah. You should go, Robin. He sounded like a kid reciting his lines for a Christmas play. You love Christmas festivals. Ginger frowned. It's probably not safe for you to go alone. You should take her, Nick added, pointing at Gabe. His acting was bad as Joseph's. Then she'd be safe. Robin's cheeks dusted a fetching shade of pink. Though it was an obvious setup, Gabe wasn't going to let the opportunity pass him by. He cleared his throat. Would you, uh, like to go to the festival? She grinned. I would. Thanks for asking. Layla clapped her hands. It's a date. She turned and gave Nick knuckles. Gabe shook his head, but it was all for show. The fact that this chaotic crew had cooked up a skit to get him and Robin out on a date was oddly inclusive. He felt like he'd passed some sort of initiation into the family, and it felt good. So good. But he'd be lying if he said it was anywhere close to how much he was looking forward to tomorrow night when he'd have Robin all to himself. Later that night, after the kitchen had been cleaned and they'd all consumed enough pizza to feed a reindeer, according to Layla, Gabe headed to his room to unpack. He had a queen-sized bed with a firm mattress, which he discovered by throwing his duffel bag onto it and noting that it didn't sink three inches. The walls were cream-colored like the rest of the house, and there was a painting of a horse with a wispy forelock above the bed. There were three pillows on the bed with the same furry look. He liked the whimsical touch. He'd only been in there for a minute when there were footsteps in the hallway. Gabe. Joseph tapped lightly on his open door. Do you have a minute? Yeah. Gabe stashed his shirts in the dresser and shut the drawer. Listen. Joseph looked over his shoulder to make sure they were alone. I wanted to give you a couple pointers on the whole dating a Kringle thing. Gabe nodded, all ears. Yeah. Christmas is it for these ladies. They go nuts over everything from wrapping paper to ornaments and decorations to gift giving. Crank it up tomorrow night. The way into Robin's heart is through Christmas. Give her a magical holiday, and she'll fall in love with you like that. He snapped his fingers. Gabe's face burned. I wasn't exactly. Joseph placed a hand on his shoulder and gave him a little shake. That's the other thing you need to know. 
Robin's playing for keeps. If you can't commit to forever, then you need to step aside. Gabe's heart plummeted at the words. Step aside? As in, let some other guy win her heart. I know it's hard to hear, but you're better off knowing up front, and so is she. Joseph gave his shoulder one more pat and then left. Gabe sat on the bed, his hand over his churning stomach. The pizza and cookie combo wasn't sitting as nicely as it had a few minutes ago. He wasn't the type of guy who jumped into anything. Playing it safe kept him and Nick on even ground and out of trouble. Joseph was right, though, it wasn't fair to Robin to give her false hope. The thing was, she was a woman worth taking a risk for, which meant he was going to have to step out of his comfort zone and dial it up to speed dating, Christmas style. He groaned. He might be able to handle speed dating, but Christmas? That was pushing it. Chapter 16 Robin Robin pulled a dark pink lip gloss from her bag. She liked the way the color brought out the auburn shades in her hair and hoped Gabe noticed. Frost was in the corner on the floor, stacks of letters around her. She'd flown down a new outfit for Robin to wear tonight. The gray pants were skinny and tight, stretching slightly as she shimmied into them. She had on a jade green shirt and, over that, a green and gray plaid wrap. The calf covering leather boots were a shade darker gray than the pants and matched a thin line in the plaid wrap. A green knit hat topped off the outfit. There was a pair of matching gloves to go with it. She'd worn her hair down, in waves with more shine spray than she cared to admit. Though she was covered from head to toe, without an inch of skin showing, she felt as stunning as if she were in an evening gown. Stella sat on the bathroom counter, watching Robin do her makeup and pouting. I just don't think it's a good idea to get too close to the security guard when you're working on the show. Why not? Robin pressed her lips together and then popped them open. Gabe had his reasons for keeping their relationship under wraps. So she wondered what Stella's objections were. Because you're trying to find a husband. What if Gabe is the guy she's supposed to marry? asked Frost, her eyes not leaving the page in front of her. She picked up a letter, scanned it as she moved it across her body, and then flipped it over on the done pile. Her mind held all the names and requests, and she'd spend twenty minutes or so adding the information to the computer system so Ginger could check it against the list. Stella threw her hands up. If that's the case, why are we going through all the song and dance on national television? You're too deep into thirty-minute match to ruin it all now. Robin glared. I thought the purpose was to save Christmas. It is. You don't get it. She tapped her fingers on the countertop. You're a Kringle. Christmas magic runs through your veins. You can't marry a Scrooge. Who says Gabe is a Scrooge? asked Robin. Wheel, Frost said from her perch. His house is the only one on the street without lights. Robin frowned. He's a single parent. He didn't stick around to make cookies and sing carols last night, Stella added. He had to unpack. Frost looked up, her large, amethyst eyes seeming to speak more than her words. The only thing worse than not falling in love is falling in love with the wrong man. Her motive came through Robin's Santa sense, she wanted to protect Robin's heart. Exactly! Stella pointed a finger in the air. Her motives weren't as easy to read, they were layered like colors in candy corn. I'm not marrying him tonight, it's one date. Dating is the intent to marry. Stella put her hands to her hips. If that were true, then you'd be married 245.4 times in the last three years. Frost winked at Robin. Robin took it as a sign that she was on her side and began sidestepping toward the door to make her escape from this conversation. Wait. 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 Stella waved her arms. Point four. Frost nodded. 
I'm counting your sleigh ride with the preacher last Christmas Eve as point four. You asked him to take a ride with you, and he agreed. But you didn't finish the date or spend all that much time with him in Oregon after my wedding. So. 4. Stella dropped her head back and stared at the ceiling. I'm never going to live that down. Well, perhaps if you'd ask him out again. The rest of Frost and Stella's conversation faded out as Robin made her way down the hallway. There was something anticlimactic about a guy picking you up in the living room versus having to answer the door. She kind of missed the grand unveiling moment. She shouldn't have been worried at all. Gabe's eyes widened, and he took her in like a man who had been without chocolate for far too long. You look gorgeous. Robin grinned and then pulled her enthusiasm back a little. You look great too. He wore a long-sleeved button-up shirt with a matching wool scarf. He had a leather jacket slung over one arm and a beanie hat in his hand. He motioned for her to precede him to the door, which he opened for her. I'm glad you dressed for the weather. Half the time, I worry you're going to freeze to death. The weather is delightful. She put out her palm and caught a giant, fluffy snowflake. They drifted to the earth in a slow, steady pattern. I couldn't have ordered a better evening. He shook his head. At least the plows can keep up tonight. If it was coming down any harder, I'd be concerned about our safety on the road. He opened the truck door for her, and she climbed inside. They made small talk about Nick and her family. He wanted to know just how many sisters and brothers-in-law she had. And Layla is your niece? She played with her gloves. Not technically. She's Joseph's niece, but he's raising her. Where's her mom? We're not really sure. She left Layla three Christmases ago, and Joseph hasn't heard from her since. But we've adopted Layla as our own, and she's flourishing. I can see that. Robin beamed. You know all the right things to say. Layla, and my nephews, are a soft spot for me. He smiled as he pulled into the parking lot at the park. Bright Christmas lights lit up the night. There was a section of booths with food and crafts and a path to wander through the lights. Robin's spirits soared. A small town Christmas was a thrill. The energy. The enthusiasm. All of it brought her to life. Let's go through the booths first. I want to see if there's anything for my mom, she's the hardest woman to shop for. Why is that? He seemed genuinely interested. She wondered if he ever thought about his birth mom, if he knew her name. She would be lost without her mother and could scarcely believe the amount of bravery and strength inside of this man. It must have taken a mountain of courage to face the world without a mother. She hooked her arm through his. Because she doesn't ask for a thing. And believe me, Christmas lists are a big deal in my family. But she's so content, the trick is finding a gift she didn't know she wanted. Tough. He said with a flirty dose of sarcasm. She shoved his arm. They stopped at the first booth, which was filled with hand-knitted hats, scarves, and socks. They were beautiful, with snowflakes and snowmen in the patterns. Robin picked up a red pot holder with a nine-point snowflake in cream. I love this. Gabe nodded. It's nice. It reminds me of you. He fingered the yarn. Let's get it. Robin felt silly. I didn't pick it up so you'd buy it for me. I know. He took the pot holder and handed cash to the woman behind the table. But I liked the way your eyes lit up when you saw it. And now, every time you use it, he looked into her eyes. You'll think of me. Breathless, Robin couldn't look away. That same strange and amazing need she'd felt in Gabe before was back in droves, making her heart pound and her skin flush. She suddenly realized what it was he needed to take care of her. To protect her. 
too, to love her. Gasping for breath, she reached toward him, to feel him, to make sure he was real. In all the world, she'd never met a man who put her needs above his own. In a quick move, she grabbed the front of his shirt and pressed her lips to his. Releasing him a moment later, she was able to draw a breath. What was that for? Gabe asked, gasping as much as her. Because I wanted to. She giggled and threw her arms around his neck. I want to kiss you. She knew it. She knew as clearly as she knew that the ovens would preheat to 350 degrees in 11 and a half minutes. Love bubbled up inside of her like cream and sugar going into a full rolling boil. He laughed. I'm good with that. He lowered his mouth to hers and sent fizzles through her entire body. The woman behind the desk cleared her throat. Excuse me, folks, but I got paying customers behind you. Oh! Robin jumped back. Sorry. She tucked the pot holder into her purse and moved away from the table. Gabe took her hand and pulled her to another booth full of nutcrackers that smelled like cinnamon and nutmeg. They had a roaster in the back and candied nuts for sale. The whole thing was adorable. Gabe glanced around as if he wasn't sure. You look overwhelmed. I have to admit, he picked up a soldier nutcracker and moved the lever to make it open and close its mouth. This all seems a bit much. It does? She looked around too. There were a half dozen places she'd add greenery, bows, lights, or sprigs of holly. I guess that's why I don't do Christmas. He set the decoration back down. It's so much work for just one day a year. Robin drew her eyebrows down. If anyone knew about work, it was a kringle. It's a ton of effort. There's the baking, chocolate molds, cooking, the more she thought about what she should be doing and not where she was, the higher her stress level went up. Not to mention the packaging and wrapping. Getting a chocolate Santa's wrapping to match up with the shape is not easy. And then there's the elf disputes, there's always one or two during the holidays. Gabe tugged her to a stop. Elf? She was brought back to the here and now in a blink and laughed nervously. Well, you know. It feels like there's elves running around the factory. Because there were elves running the factory. He signaled to the hot chocolate vendor that they take too. I'll bet. She let out a slow, quiet breath as her throat went slack. That was too close. Gabe handed her a cocoa, and she contemplated the cup in her hand for a moment. At what point would revealing her true identity be a good idea? Maybe she should text her sisters the question. She took a sip of the scalding liquid and grimaced as her tongue burned. She'd wait to send that out, she could only imagine what Stella would have to say on the subject. Ginger would probably tell her to wait until they'd said I love yous. She frowned. Exactly how was that supposed to come about? The entrance to the lighted path was off to their right. A tunnel of bright white lights blinked in succession. Perhaps a little holiday romance would speed the moment along. Let's take a walk. She tugged him toward the path, her heart full of hope and her head full of questions. Chapter 17 Gabe Gabe held fast to Robin's hand as they walked the path through the park. Red, green, white, and even purple-lighted Christmas trees were grouped together. Blow-up lawn ornaments dotted the path. Frosty the snowman waved from one clearing. Look at that! Gabe pointed with his free hand to a sleigh with a live reindeer harness to the front. The sled was apple-red, and the brass runners were shiny. It's amazing! I wonder what kind of permits they had to get to bring the animal in here and leave it unattended. He looked around for someone with an official-looking coat, but they were by themselves. The reindeer saw them and pawed the ground, shaking his antlers and making the bells on his harness jingle. Gabe moved between it and Robin. Do you think it's safe? 
Robin glared at it. He's too old to cause much trouble. Gabe looked closer and saw a tuft of gray in the hair. It dug both feet in and snorted at him, raising a giant puff of air. He thought he heard Robin whisper something. What did you say? I was just telling Dunder to calm down. He seems a bit overprotective. She spoke through gritted teeth toward the animal. Dunder? How do you know that's its name? He looked right into her eyes. She swallowed. It's on his harness. He whipped his head around and craned his neck to see the green letters running down the sideband. Huh. I must have missed that. He chuckled. We'll move on. Then he'll calm down. Don't worry about him, he has a hard time with any man. Robin brushed her hand through the air as if she could brush away his worries. She stepped lively, as if the cold air invigorated her. How do you know that? He trotted to keep up with her. She walked like she was determined to put as much space between her and the reindeer as possible. She shrugged. I've seen it in other animals. Oh. He was about to ask her what other animals when a brightly lettered sign caught his eye. Last stop, Santa. Joseph had told him to Christmas up the date, and so far the advice worked wonders. He'd gotten an amazing kiss over a potholder, of all things, Santa was sure to win him some points. It wasn't just a kiss he was after. There was something about seeing Robin happy that lifted him, made him feel like more of a man. That's why he'd bought the potholder for her, her happiness made him happy. She pulled back on his hand. We don't have to stop. It looks busy. Several children in coats and gloves crowded around Santa and Mrs. Claus. He was listening to their chatter about school and Christmas gifts and everything else. They were winding down and their parents called for them to get going, there were other errands to run. Come on, it'll be fun. He tugged her, and she stumbled forward. You asked for it, she muttered. I think I can handle a visit with Santa, he teased. Although he was already looking forward to the quiet ride home in his pickup, where carols didn't fill the air. Mrs. Claus, dressed in a red velvet skirt lined in white fur, saw them first. Robin. She grabbed Robin in a hug and held tight, necessitating Gabe let go of her hand. I hoped we'd run into you. What? Gabe watched the two and found similarities in their hair color and the shape of their mouths. This couldn't her mom, could it? The last child scampered off, and Santa gave them his full attention. How's my girl? Robin rolled her eyes. I'm fine, Dad. Gabe's stomach dropped. He'd unwittingly stumbled into a meet-the-parents moment. What made it worse was that Robin had tried to avoid it. Did she not want him here? As if she could read his mind, she hooked his elbow and pulled him deeper into the conversation circle. Gabe, these are my parents, Harvey and Gail Kringle. Mom, Dad, this is Gabe. Gabe looked at them and burst out laughing. This explains so much. You have the Christmasiest family I've ever met. Harvey put his palms on his round belly and let out a ho-ho-ho that's nice of you to say. Gabe cringed internally. He hadn't meant it as a compliment so much as an observation. The whole idea of having a mom and dad who dressed up like Santa was kind of weird. Did Harvey keep that beard all year long? Did he think it helped him in the candy business they were in? Was that his angle? The sisters had bought right into it, had thrown themselves behind the whole Santa persona especially Ginger in her get-up the other night. Did they all dress like that? He'd never make it in a family that wore costumes all year round. He was already having a hard time with how their level of holiday cheer, it couldn't be real. No one was that happy all the time. As much as he liked Robin, maybe even loved her, Father Santa was hard to swallow. 
Gail pulled him in for a surprise hug. She smelled like a pumpkin pie, cinnamon and warmth. It's so good to meet you, Gabe. My girls have been talking about you nonstop. I'll bet they have, Robin groused. Don't listen to a thing Stella says. Gabe stepped back, his neck warm with embarrassment. I don't think she's my biggest fan. Gail swatted at the air, just like Robin had a few minutes before. The more time he spent with her, the more he could see where Robin got her beauty. Thankfully, she'd taken after her mother. The snow-white hair was pretty on frost, but he couldn't imagine Robin without her dark curls. Don't worry about her. She'll come around, Gail assured him. Gabe rocked back on his heels, trying to come up with something to say. The elephant in the room was just too big, and he had to point a finger in that direction. So do you guys do the Santa gig every year? Harvey ho ho hoed again. I used to do a whole lot more, but I'm semi-retired now. More? More. What more was there to do than greet children? I'll bet the kids in the park love it. You certainly fit the part. Everyone laughed as if he'd said something really funny. He smiled, not sure what the joke was about but not wanting to come off rude. They could have been laughing at him. A general sense of unease settled in the back of his mind. He pushed it back, trying to just be in the moment with Robin and focus on why he liked being with her. Her family was important to her, and therefore he'd try, no matter how wacky they seemed. And they were wacky, there was no doubt about that. And they were close. Her sisters dropped in whenever they felt like it at the safe house. He never heard them coming, but they'd be there, baking, reading, talking, singing, and generally filling the place with noise. Let's get down to business, shall we? asked Harvey. Business? Gabe echoed. Your Christmas wish. I can't make it come true if I don't hear it. Harvey tapped the back of his ear and winked. His blue eyes sparkled. Wow. He was good at his job. Gabe had met several of Santa's helpers through the years. There were guys in fake beards and red suits that stopped by the foster homes with a bag of gifts. When he was seven, he saw the giving tree at Walmart and realized where those presents had come from. Though he was grateful for the kindness of strangers, the magic of Christmas was lost. He hadn't sat on Santa's lap since. Gabe angled away from him. I'm not wishing tonight. We're here for Robin. He wouldn't have come to the light show at all if it weren't for her. I think we already know Robin's Christmas wish. Gail winked. So that means all we have to do is get yours. Harvey patted his stomach again, his white gloves in deep contrast to his red suit and black belt. There probably wasn't even padding under there. He really made a magnificent Santa. But that didn't mean Santa was real. Just like all the other hopes and dreams Gabe had through the years that faded with the responsibilities of caring for a kid brother when he was still a kid himself. Santa was a farce. He looked into Robin's eyes and saw hope brimming there. She wanted him to make a wish. He thought for a moment, but his mind was blocked. He just couldn't. No, thanks. He glanced at the hard-packed snow beneath his shoes. It was nice to meet you, but I think it's time we head back to the safe house. He headed for the exit. There was already a line of fifteen kids not so patiently waiting their turn with the jolly old elf. The night had taken a turn towards the cold, and he shivered. Hunching into his coat, he tried to hold off the black cloud that threatened, but it just wouldn't leave. Meeting Robin's parents was interesting and disheartening. Where they were smiles and winks, he was seriousness and paying the bills. Where they were Christmas cheer, he was a Grinch. Where they were wishes and hope, he was reality. They dressed up as fictional characters, and he couldn't even make a Christmas wish. Robin was all things Christmas. She was joy and hope, 
giving in surprises. They say opposites attract, and they had. He'd been drawn to Robin the first minute he saw her. But they never said that opposites could last. He could see their future as easily as he could see the lights on the trees and the shadows behind them. He was the shadow, the darkness, the drab holidays that would forever pull Robin down. One day, she'd realize that and shake loose, bursting to shine like God intended her to. She'd leave him. Joseph had been right. It was better to know now, before either of them fell in love, that they weren't truly compatible. He clutched his chest, feeling like an icicle was growing right through his heart. But it was for the best, for both of them, but mostly for her. He'd be nothing but a stone in her stocking every year. She deserved so much better. Chapter 18 Robin exchanged worried looks with her parents. She went to run after Gabe, but her father's hand on her arm stopped her. Is he the one? he asked. Why yes, she stammered. Realizing that it had to be true, because she couldn't tell a lie, she broke into a wide smile. There was something magical about knowing her heart. Go get him. Dad tapped the side of his nose. Robin nodded and jogged in the direction Gabe had gone. He didn't mean to leave her behind, he just needed space from the situation. It wasn't long before she saw his outline, all hunched into his coat and walking like a Scrooge without a cane. Gabe? She caught up and put her hand on his arm. He instantly relaxed as she shared her magical warmth with him. Growing up, none of the girls had found their ability to warm others all that handy, but Lux had saved Quick's life with her inner boiler after he fell into a frozen lake. Ginger said she'd warmed Layla several times in Alaska, before she and Joseph came into the family. She liked seeing Gabe more comfortable, more at ease. Except his face was full of worry lines and his eyes were hard. Gabe, she asked again, not liking the feeling he put off. It was noble and scary all at once. He took a deep breath, filling his chest all the way. She had the distinct impression he had to say something he didn't want to. The feeling was familiar in the way a nightmare could draw you in. Her ex-boyfriend, Elmer, had had the same intent when he'd broken up with her after three years of dating. She hadn't recognized it then, but she did now. She drew back, expecting the emotional blow but not sure how to really prepare for it. She'd never felt for Elmer the things she'd felt for Gabe. Gabe's eyes softened. I can see why you guys are such a joyful family. You have all the love and attention you could ever want, and money isn't an issue for you. We were raised so differently, I'm just not sure that we're compatible. In exactly what way? Certainly, they could overcome any obstacle with love. She'd seen her sisters and brothers-in-law hurdle obstacles like ex-wives and possessive parents. You're all Santa and cookies and live in this bubble where problems don't exist. Robin balked. You think I don't have problems? She jammed her hand into her hip. Do you have any idea the overwhelming issues we're dealing with each Christmas? He shook his head quickly. That's not what I mean. He blew out a breath. See, we can't even have this conversation like a normal person. I'm messing it up. Robin reached for him. I'm not even sure what this conversation is about. What are you really saying? I'm saying. I don't think I fit in, in your world. And I don't want to drag you down to mine. Robin's heart seized inside of her chest. She clutched at it, desperate to release the numbing pain his words inflicted. Not fit into her world? Her world would adjust to include him if he'd give it the chance. It doesn't have to be that way, Gabe. It already is that way. He sighed heavily. That breath was like a wind blowing the two of them apart. He'd resolved to see their differences instead of their strengths. He decided not to see the love or the possibility of a greater love than either of them had ever known blossoming like poinsettias. 
His resolve was complete because he thought he was doing it for her. That was the biggest batch of burnt cookies. Come on. I'll take you home. His need to take care of her, to end this with some sort of friendly action, pumped her direction to justify the action. He hoped to not make a scene and to save himself from the pain that threatened. Riding in the cab of his truck with his soapy clean all around her, knowing he'd chosen to not love her, was too much. No thanks. I'll get a ride home with Dunder. She took several steps away. The reindeer? He stumbled after her. You can't be serious. Yeah, I am. He's a male I can always count on. She threw the words at him like snowballs. Robin. He bowed over as if she'd hit him right in the gut. Good. Because he'd shredded her heart. He deserved to ache for her like she would for him. Her mean thoughts weren't very Kringle-like, but she didn't even care. For once, she let her feelings overrule his need. Hot, angry tears threatened. She wouldn't give him the satisfaction of seeing them fall. She flipped around, her cute wrap spinning out like a billowing skirt, all dramatic-like. The vision of herself leaving was stunning. Let him remember this moment and wish he'd taken her in his arms and begged her to stay. I'm supposed to protect you, he called after her. Ha! He'd done a horrible job of that. She was emotionally bruised and battered. I don't need your protection. She hurried away, needing space. The farther she got from him, the worse she felt. Every cell in her body said that Gabe was the one she was meant to find. Her soul cried out for her to run back to him, but her pride wouldn't let her beg a man to love her. And she was grateful for that. She couldn't change him or his heart any more than she could rewrite the naughty and nice list. Later that night, she curled up on the sofa in the family room at the North Pole, her sisters piled around her like a litter of puppies. There were large pots around the room to catch drips from the ceiling. The carpet had been rolled up and stashed against the wall to keep it from molding. There were slippery puddles in the hallway and a tarp over the rockers to protect the wood. She'd met up with her parents as they were saying goodbye to the last child in the park. Tears flowed the moment she'd made eye contact with her mom. They'd flown over the safe house on their way home and seen Gabe's truck parked out front. The front porch light was on. Dad wanted to pop down the chimney and give him a good shaking, but Mom insisted they get Robin home, where her sisters could cheer her up. I don't think I'll ever be cheerful again. She sniffed. Ginger rubbed her arm. He doesn't know what he's missing. Robin trembled. She'd started shaking after landing on the sleigh's padded seat and hadn't stopped. I didn't ever tell him who I was. Maybe if I had, her thoughts trailed off. If you had, he would have thought you were a nutcase. Stella handed her a cup of orange cocoa. Liquid coping skills. She lifted it to Robin's lips, encouraging her to take a sip. Robin blew across the top before she tasted it. The orange flavor played with the dark cocoa. It's delicious. The liquid quivered in the mug, and she grasped it with both hands. You guys are so great, working so hard to help me feel better. You've put off your own last-minute Christmas preparations for me. I'm sorry I'm not getting better faster. She swiped away an errant tear. On top of aching over Gabe, she now felt guilt for pulling the attention toward herself. Frost was behind her, brushing Robin's hair out with long, soothing strokes. Don't think one moment about work. It's seventeen days until Christmas Eve, observed Lux. Stella, Frost, and Ginger glared at her in unison. If Robin was in a better mood, the moment would have made her laugh. Lux lifted her rectangular glasses higher on her nose. I'm not trying to be a downer here, but maybe if we talk about moving on, then it will help Robin forget about that guy whose name I don't want to say out loud. 
Being proactive is healthy, and a body in motion stays in motion. What does that have to do with Robin getting over Gabe? Stella poked Lux's shoulder. If she stalls here, in this breakup, then she loses momentum. She's got to push forward. Robin sat up, making Ginger, who had been leaning on her, fall into the cushions. She's right. I can't sit around. Children are counting on Christmas, on Santa. There's so much more at stake than my silly heart. Ginger patted her hair, making sure she hadn't ruined her cute braid when she'd fallen into the couch. Your heart isn't silly to us. In the grand scheme of things, it's tiny. Robin made an inch sign with her fingers. Lux shook her head. Stella gave a mighty frown. You guys. I don't have the luxury of wallowing in my broken heart. I've got to get back to finding a husband. Who knows? Maybe I'll find a guy who's even better than Gabe. Her voice cracked, and she had to swallow three times to hold down the tears. She struggled to get off the couch. I'm going back down to the show Monday morning and see who they have picked out for me. Stella stood too. I'm coming with you. Robin touched her arm. Thank you, but I'm doing this alone. You're already behind, and I don't want one child to go without a toy because of me. The thought made her skin feel heavy. Lux hopped up. I'll go. Quick can manage the conductor for a day without me, I think. Her eyes glazed over like she was doing calculus in her head. A moment later, she perked back up. Yeah, he should be okay for 8.37 hours. Thanks. She squeezed Lux's hand. I sincerely misunderstood the difficulties of finding a husband. It's good to have support. Of course. Ginger stepped in and hugged her. We'd do anything for you, Robin. She felt the sincerity of Ginger's words sweep through the circle and knew that they would put themselves and Christmas in danger for her. She vowed never to let that happen. If life had taught her anything, it was that the members of her family were the only ones she could count on. Whoever she ended up marrying wouldn't have to live up to that standard. She already had everything she needed in this room. Chapter 19 Robin hadn't considered the issues that would pop up having Lux on site as they filmed. She should have thought twice before accepting her offer, but she didn't, and her sister had done a number on the sound system, the generators, and the portable lights. The crew absolutely loved her, and she was a star for the day. But she was so busy making anything and everything electrical run better that she didn't hang out by Robin all that much. So when Gabe arrived, spitting mad, she didn't have a human shield to hide behind. Robin, he ground out. Gabe, she answered flippantly. He glanced over his shoulder. Where did you go? I've been trying to find you all weekend. A cookie crumb of hope landed on her heart. Had he regretted his actions and wanted to reconcile? You were? I didn't know you were here until my boss called and told me. He ran his hand through his hair. I got chewed out for leaving you unprotected. The hope crumb dissolved. He wasn't upset because he wanted her back, he was mad because he'd gotten in trouble. Well, that was just too bad for him. I went home with my parents, and I'll be staying there from here on out. I won't need your protection, so you can go on back to your Grinchy house and forget about me. She turned to leave, but he stepped in front of her, blocking the path with his wonderfully shaped shoulders. Her breath sped up, and her body flushed with an awareness of him. I don't quit a job because it gets tough. She jumped back, needing the distance to clear her mind. I thought I was more to you than a job. He opened his mouth and slammed it shut again. She forced her emotions down her throat and headed toward the producer. She wasn't sure what she was going to say to him, but she needed to talk about something, anything that could take her mind of the way Gabe affected her. 
Jerry caught sight of her and motioned her to hurry. Good, just the woman I wanted to see. Are you ready to meet your next husband candidate? He rubbed his palms together. Whoever he had picked out today brought him a lot of hope. She took hold of it like a lifeline. Yes, she said much too loudly. They were going to try the date set up again, this time at a Mexican restaurant with bright colored table runners, poinsettias on every flat surface, and sequin sombreros on the walls. She'd been briefed by Gary that she wasn't supposed to eat any of the food, it had been prepared by a specialist to look good on camera and wasn't edible. Which was so strange to her. Food could look and taste wonderful, why would anyone have to add paper towels under the salad to make it look good? She was, however, supposed to move it around on her plates and place bites on her fork. Jerry eyed her a moment, probably wondering if she was stable. News of her disappearing act must have spread through the crew, because there was a serious case of Don't Disturb Robin going around. She'd been treated with kid gloves all morning. If you'll take a seat at the table, Brad will stand here behind you and introduce your date on camera. Brad had already filmed the intro, with a short interview of her and the mystery man separately. They hadn't done that before. Each week, the format of the show changed slightly. The viewers ate it up, feeling as though they were on the journey with Robin. The changes reminded them of their own dating experience, no two evenings out were ever the same. Candy, the makeup specialist, ran in and dabbed at Robin's face with a soft brush. She did that between each take. By the time they were done filming the interview, Robin had a quarter inch of powder on her forehead. In the episodes she'd seen, the makeup worked and she looked flawless, so she wasn't worried. Candy knew what she was doing. The cue was given for Brad to start. He smiled like a used car salesman and jumped right in. So far, Robin, you've met men who were not honest, those who were already in love with someone else and in denial, and a man who didn't share your goals and dreams. We wanted to try something new tonight. All right. She smiled as best she could. The muscles in her cheeks felt rusty and uncooperative. She added the man who decided he didn't want her to that list. Lux waved at her from behind camera too. She put aside her compulsive need to rewire, reprogram, and rework the set to support Robin during filming. Brian continued, we wanted to give an old love a second chance. Robin cocked her head, trying to figure out where this was going. An old love? She didn't have an old love, except Elmer. But she wouldn't call what they'd had love. It was something, but it wasn't love. Robin, this is your second chance with Elmer Claw. Brad swept his arm to the side. Stunned at hearing Elmer's name spoken by the television host, she followed his gesture to the side door, where Elmer appeared, wearing a sheepish grin. She half stood, wondering what the protocol was for greeting a man on national television who dumped you three years ago. I, I. Words flew out of her head like startled turtle doves. She half expected feathers to land at her feet. What bad list karma was this? Bringing both men who decided they didn't want her into the same room? Robin. Elmer was suddenly at her side, giving her an awkward hug that neither of them seemed to know what to do with. Her body was still halfway in the chair and under the table. She twisted but couldn't reach around him. As soon as he stepped back, her eyes darted to Gabe. He stared straight ahead, his face unreadable. Her heart cried out to him, Notice me. If he loved her at all, then he'd hate another man's arms around her. Yet he didn't move so much as a muscle. Sit. Sit, directed Brad. Robin did as she was told, landing hard in her seat. The jolt made her feel clumsy, and she tried to pull herself together. Elmer sat next to her, slightly turned toward her so the cameras could see them both and they could still talk. He was a natural in front of the camera, which annoyed her. You look amazing, Robin. 
Elmer picked up her limp hand and pressed a kiss to the back. His need to appear charming came through loud and clear. She'd felt it many times before, thought it adorable that he tried so hard to impress others. She wasn't so sure it was cute anymore. Th, thank you. She clamped her lips shut, they were as clumsy as her rear end had been a moment before. Robin, what's going through your head right now? asked Brad as he took a seat on the other side of her. I'm speechless, really. Her brain kicked into gear, and she raced through the possibilities of how this had come about. How on earth had they gotten Elmer's name? An image of the dating profile Stella filled out for her flashed in her head. She mentally shook her fists at her sister. Brad laughed easily. Cut, called a loud voice. Chelsea stepped forward. Can we do that again? Robin, I love the surprise, but I'd like to capture your natural grace this time. Less surprise, more of a welcome? Can you do that? She glanced at Gabe again. He was a statue. Her resolve to be graceful doubled. Yes, I believe I can. That's a girl. Elmer stood up and tugged on the ends of his black suit. He looked like a mortician. Give us a few minutes to reset at one. Chelsea headed back to her seat. Brad stood up, and Candy rushed in to dab at him. Lux approached, her phone in her hand. Stella's on the line. I see your sisters are still within arm's reach. Elmer nodded to Lux. Robin stared at him. Had that been one of the reasons he'd broken up with her? Because she was close to her sisters? He cocked his head toward the phone. Robin rounded on Lux. Did you do this? She demanded quietly so as not to make a scene. The last thing she needed was the crew of 30-minute match to give up on finding her a husband. So far, she'd ruined every one of their efforts unintentionally of course. No way. Stella roared through the phone. Elmer Bexley Claw, I despise you. Stella. Robin yanked the phone out of Lux's hands and hit the button to take it off of speakerphone. Talk nice. I'm not feeling nice list right now. If I was there. Well, you're not, Robin said quickly. Focus on the toys. I got this. Lux leaned over the phone. Me too. She flipped on Elmer and poked him in the chest. How dare you break up with Robin? She's the best thing that ever happened to you. Don't you think I know that? He held his hands up. I've spent the last three years trying to find her. When I saw the show, I called in hoping they would let me talk to her. Lux dropped her arm and screwed up her lips. You did? Yes. He looked past Lux to Robin, his muddy brown eyes pleading. I've missed you so much. Gabe grunted. Robin thrilled with victory. That's right, big guy, this man has pined over me for years. He realized what he lost. What's your problem? She squared her shoulders. I think we can try this out today. I'm game if you are. She tucked a strand of hair behind her ear and smiled softly, remembering how much he'd liked it when she batted her lashes. The whole room seemed to let out a breath of relief. Glancing around, she saw the lights on above the cameras. Their whole exchange had been caught on film. We're trending, called Gary. Robin's heart froze. They couldn't expose the whole Kringle family on national television. And Stella's comment wasn't very Santa-like. If the world knew Santa's family was in chaos, that Christmas hung by a thread, things could go South Pole quickly all over the world. Christmas magic was about more than the toys and the candy. It was about hope and peace and goodwill toward men and women and children. A surge of it filled the earth on Christmas Eve, and it was enough to last the whole year long. Without even knowing it, people drew upon the holidays for strength. 
They got along better because they knew they'd be together at Christmas. What's trending? She asked through gritted teeth. Chelsea shrugged. We put up a teaser from your interviews. Okay, that wasn't so bad. At least they weren't streaming live. Good globs of gumdrops, she needed to pay better attention to what was going on around her and keep her emotions under control. Places, someone called out. Robin couldn't see much of the crew past the lights shining in her eyes. Strangely, Gabe was always within sight. She wished he'd show some sort of feelings that she could get a read on him or even a flash of a need. But he was a stone wall. She shoved the bone deep aching for him aside and steeled herself to welcome Elmer with style. Chapter 20 Gabe did his best to keep his growling to a minimum. Thankfully, no one on the crew paid that much attention to security. They'd all been taught to leave the men in black alone and let them work, that distracting the security guard was a bad idea for everyone involved. Which was fine with him. The fewer people he had to pretend to be happy for, the better. While Robin's ex was schmoozing away on camera, Gabe sidled up to her sister. A mint chocolate scent filled his nose and soothed him, at the same time, it woke up his brain. It was like a drug in smell form. Not at all the same as Robin's scent of deep vanilla that drew him in and sent come hither ness coursing through his veins. Talking with Robin earlier hadn't gone well. He'd been so worried when she didn't come home that night. Nick had found a letter on the fireplace mantle from Stella explaining that they were going home, but he had no idea where home was or how to protect her there. Not to mention he missed her. He couldn't think about that right now. She was in danger and he had to talk to someone who could talk rationally about her safety. The sister had her phone up to her nose, and her thumbs flew across the screen. Normally, electronics were forbidden on set, but no one told her to put it away. She'd spent the morning making friends with all the tech geeks, though, so maybe she had permission. Um, Lux, right? She was the only Kringle he hadn't met yet, and her name was unusual enough that he remembered it from the conversations he'd overheard. She didn't look up from her phone. Yeah. Her voice had an edge to it. She'd gone after Elmer for dumping Robin, the idiot. Her edge was different from Stella's edge. Stella would claw your eyes out and slash your tires. Lux wasn't harsh, but it was her quiet that made him nervous. She was too smart to let him get away with fudging the truth. Her glasses slid down a fraction, and she shoved them back in place as she refused to look at him. I'm Gabe. I know. Okay, so he hadn't won any points with the family. Hopefully, Robin hadn't told them what he'd said about them not having real-world problems and all the other stupid things that had come out of his mouth. As dumb as they were, he was holding on to them. Robin was better off with someone better than him. Not this Elmer jerk, but someone. He adopted a cool, detached persona of a bodyguard. We had a breach last night. A what? She kept typing. A breach. Someone was at the safe house. They walked the entire perimeter and tried several windows. The police took fingerprints. It was Kylo. She slowly lowered the phone. Her eyes ticked from one thing to the next, taking in him, the room, and probably a hundred other details. Man, her brain worked fast. Robin can't go back there. No, he tucked his thumbs in his pockets. But we can't let Kylo think we've moved her again. Why are you telling me this? Her bright green eyes narrowed. Robin should be the one to know all about what's going on with Kylo. She's the one he's threatening. She's not exactly speaking to me at the moment. Well, you weren't exactly nice. She cocked her head to the side in challenge. He was trying to avoid an argument in front of everyone, that was why he'd chosen her to talk to. Can we keep this on a professional level, please? Oh! She lifted her chin. Now you want to keep it professional. 
Her voice went up a notch, and several heads turned their direction. Robin pointedly ignored them, letting her sister have free reign. He groaned. Since I need to stay employed, yes. Her eyes did that thing where she looked like she was processing information. Nick, she stated when she got to the end of her calculation. Yes. Yes. Nick. Since I was 18, I've done everything I can to keep that kid close. Okay? We live paycheck to paycheck, and I can't lose work. Family services checks in once a year, in January. If I'm out of a job or lose my house, they'll put him back in the system. Why don't you adopt him? He scrubbed his face. How did things get so personal all of the sudden? He never wanted me to. He said he likes me more as a brother than a dad, and I respected his wishes. But that made life harder for you. He sighed. Yeah. People constantly looking over his shoulder to see if he was screwing up as a guardian. Mandatory doctor's visits where they drilled Nick about every bruise and scratch, all the while assuming Gabe had abused him. Then there was the paperwork to keep his foster license. Life's always been hard. And I'm making it harder by being grumpy. She transformed her face into a pleasant expression. I'll tell Robin about Kylo. What do you want to do about it? His walls, which had been down for a moment when talking about Nick, went right back up. He didn't have the luxury of discussing his personal issues right now. Robin's life was at stake. Kylo wasn't snooping around the safe house to leave threats. He was intent on silencing Robin. It had become an obsession for him. The police were on the case, tracking him from lead to lead, but he was slippery and had more connections than a Lego set. She needs to come through the house after the show and then sneak out. Your family seems to be good at that. The night they'd been there making cookies, he hadn't heard a car on the driveway or a door open and close. You're like ghosts. Lux nodded, accepting his comment as if she heard it all the time. I'm sure we can get her in and out undetected. What about you guys? Will you be safe? Nick? He nodded. We'll be fine. If Kylo was interested in a shootout, he would have come in with guns blazing and not tried to climb in a window. Just make sure someone is with Robin at all times. Lux's eyes blazed, but her voice was level as she said, we're already making sure she's not alone. A broken heart isn't something Kringles take lightly. Gabe felt every word of censure like sharp teeth across his skin, and his defenses rose up. She seems to be getting over it just fine. He pointed to the set where Robin smiled at Elmer. Not the smile she'd given him at first full of strain and pain, but a real one that spoke of a long history together. Lux glanced that way and frowned. This isn't good, she muttered. What kind of a name is Elmer, anyway? He groused. A pretentious one, especially when your family makes a living off of glue. Tapping on her phone, she brought it to her ear. Ginger, we've got a situation here. Gabe headed to the back of the room, far away from the lights and glitter, where he could sulk in the shadows. Let her sisters worry about her love life. He was here to protect her life, not her heart. He had no claim there, and the sooner he got that in his head, the better. Chapter 21 Robin walked along a winding path with her hand tucked in the cook of Elmer's elbow. The show had set up a winter wonderland inside the cavernous building, complete with fake snow and trees. There was even a squirrel and bluebirds in the branches. Nice attention to detail. Even with the hours they'd spent filming already, Elmer was nervous about how things were going. She could feel his unease, and her Santa sense kicked in. I have to admit, this has gone better than I ever would have thought. She smiled up at him. He placed his hand over hers. It felt, tepid. Like it always had. She'd not known that her body could change temperatures with a touch until Gabe showed her that it was possible. 
She hadn't known her heart could race with a glance until his eyes met hers. And she had no idea a kiss could sweep away her common sense like spilled glitter until he'd held her in his kitchen and flipped the world upside down. Cut. That's a wrap, people. Interviews in 15 minutes. Robin went to pull away, but Elmer's hand held her in place. Don't leave, he said quietly. All around them, people were busy taking down the set. The adorable bridge was separated into three pieces and hauled off to storage. The bluebirds were dropped into a box, and the squirrel was tucked in beside them. The magic of television all wrapped up and placed on a shelf. Elmer waited a moment for the crew to scatter, and then he leaned close. Robin, I'd like another chance. Isn't that what this is all about? She waved her free hand around, indicating the now darkened studio and the forest that was quickly becoming a slab of concrete as the interns took the trees out. I mean a real one. He leaned closer. She breathed in wondering what scent he wore, but Elmer didn't smell like anything. There was no manly scent of cologne or body spray, not even a hint of toothpaste or gel. Go out with me tonight? He was sincere in his desire to start fresh, she could feel it coming off of him. She glanced over at Lux, who was sitting in the director's chair, her laptop open. She was probably monitoring the water levels at the North Pole. There were four inches on the ground now. The elves wore rain boots and slickers to work, as water constantly dripped from the ceiling and puddled at their feet. Over Elmer's shoulder, Gabe waited for her by the door. His rejection was a sting she couldn't forget or ignore. But a Kringle had to get married this year. There was no way around it. Christmas magic had a plan, not that any of them knew what it was, they just knew that one of them had to be married by Christmas Eve or Christmas magic would disappear. She looked Elmer over. He'd filled out in the shoulders by a couple inches. Not that she cared so much about a man's physique, she was just noticing that he changed. And perhaps he changed in other ways. They'd gotten along swimmingly for a few years, had fun, studied, kissed, made friends. Maybe they could have that again, and maybe that would be enough for Christmas magic. Lux would surely point out that if she didn't marry her true love, the wedding wouldn't count. That was just a theory, though, and they wouldn't know for sure until one of them tried marrying without love. She'd have to be the one to put Christmas first and her heart second. If any Kringle sister was going to do that, it would be her. Jerry would be happy. He wanted to film a wedding and play it on prime time for the whole nation to see. If there was one thing her family did well, it was Christmas Eve weddings. She could give him exactly what he wanted for Christmas. The crew would be ecstatic. A 30-minute match wedding would guarantee another season. Chelsea could send her daughter to college. Sarah could take another cruise. And then there were also the children, busily writing letters to Santa and making ornaments out of popsicle sticks at school to give their parents to consider. She'd focus on the needs of millions of children around the world and draw happiness from their joy on Christmas morning. Do you still like meat and potatoes? she asked. His face broke into a slow smile. She used to think it was cute, now she wondered if it took him that long to process that her question was an answer to his question. I saw a great place not too far from here. He pulled out his wallet and checked for his credit card. She sighed. Elmer was nothing if not prepared. I'll meet you in the lobby after interviews? Sounds great. He blinked, which was his way of winking, he'd never been able to master doing it with one eye. Maybe in time, she'd think that was cute too. And in turn approached, Elmer, if you'll follow me this way? I'll see you later. He headed off, adjusting his tie as he went. Robin hurried over to Lux. Hey. So, I'm going out with Elmer tonight. She wanted to get the words out before she thought better of her plan. Lux slammed her laptop shut. 
Her face matched the angry Grinch face on the front of her t-shirt. That's not a good idea. If you have a better one, I'm all ears. Lux gave her a dubious look. I mean it. I'll give you points for originality, too. The weirder, the better, as long as it scores me a husband by Christmas Eve. Gabe cleared his throat behind her. What is it with you and getting married by Christmas? Robin widened her eyes at Lux, asking for help, and pressed her hand against her straining throat. I'm not getting any younger. She coughed several times. Lux nodded. It's become a family tradition. I got married two Christmases ago. She held up two fingers. On Christmas Eve? Gabe asked. Well, no. It was earlier. But Quick and I had a big project that had to be done by Christmas Eve, so we got married before then. She tucked a piece of hair back up in her messy bun and hopped off the chair. I need to get back to the factory. I'll send someone to the house to pick you up after your date. Date? Gabe turned to Robin. Elmer and I are going to dinner, she all but whispered, as if in a confessional. Gabe. Gabe's stomach dropped. Of course they were going out. This whole thing was about getting Robin married off for some dumb family tradition. The more he learned about the Kringles, the crazier they sounded. He dodged a bullet. It could have been me, his conscience whispered. He could have been the one sweeping Robin off her feet and meeting her at the altar. They could have honeymooned over New Year's. He pushed that thought away. Robin would be happier with Elmer than she would have been with him. Elmer had the money, the poise, and the happy childhood that added up to a good fit for Robin. And he took her family in stride. Gabe would always stick out, the bad apple of the bunch. That said, he didn't have it in him to watch her swoon over Elmer. I'm taking tonight off to spend with Nick, but I'll make sure you have a guard with you. He turned, not able to look in her eyes. Don't leave without him. Lux will explain why. With that, he practically ran out of the room. He checked in with his boss. Dale was ready to take over for him. I'll make sure she gets home. You handle the bait and switch. He bossed Gabe around like he didn't know how to do his job. Since Robin had shown up without him that morning, they assumed he was incompetent. It would take a while to earn their respect back. He rushed to his truck and then sat there, thinking. He couldn't go right back to the house, not while Robin was out there, somewhere, with the man she was going to spend the rest of her life with even though she didn't love him. He might have stood against the cold, black wall of the studio during filming, but even Gabe could see that there wasn't a spark between the country's new favorite couple. Yeah, he'd heard the excited chatter behind the scenes. America loved Robin, and they were clamoring for her to find her soul mate. Headlights in the rearview mirror flashed and blinded him for a moment. He shook his head. His truck had been parked in the driveway last night. Kylo knew the plates. He was being followed. He drove through neighborhoods as if he were on a tour of the city lights. Christmas displays blinked and flashed all over town. He took a quick left onto a busy street and then another left and finally a third, getting behind his tail. He watched the beat-up red cruiser go right and then disappear. With a sigh, he made his way to the rental house. He did want to spend the night with Nick. They could watch a superhero movie or something. Anything the kid wanted to do that didn't revolve around Christmas. Christmas meant Robin, and he wanted one night without thinking about her. He wiped a bead of sweat off his forehead just as he pulled through the iron gate. The lights were all on, the Christmas tree winking at him through the large bay window. He groaned. Maybe leaving would give them a better shot at avoiding her. Instead of going inside, he walked the perimeter, carefully checking the fresh snowfall for new footprints. There were none. I'm home, 
he called as he went through the door. A warm blast of air wrapped him up, and he shucked his coat, hanging it in the closet near the door. We're in here, Nick called from the kitchen. We? Too late, he remembered Lux saying she'd send someone to pick up Robin after her date. Just don't let it be Stella, he murmured as he made his way into the room. Elvis crooned Christmas carols from a speaker on the counter. The scent of fresh-baked cookies filled the air and made his stomach growl. Nick sat at the counter with a woman who looked very much like a grandma. She had white hair and wrinkles that were soft and gentle on her smooth, round cheeks. Her hair was short, perfectly styled, and she had on a white sweatshirt with a reindeer outlined in blue sparkles. The counter was covered with wrinkled papers, textbooks, and the school-issued Chromebook Nick hauled around like a brick of gold. On the screen was a button labeled Submit. Nick clicked on it, and the older woman clapped. That's it for social studies. You're all caught up. She beamed, her eyes full of pride. Gabe bit back his remark about turning things in on time. You don't have to catch up if you're not behind in the first place. My math book's in my room. I'll go get it. He swung his long legs out from under the counter and offered Gabe a fist bump. Hi. They touched knuckles, and he scampered off to his room. Gabe stared after him. That was an open kid, the one who used to run into Gabe's arms when he'd pick him up from daycare was all over Nick's face. That was the kid who wanted to be a pilot and fly airplanes and grow pineapple trees in his backyard. He never thought he'd see that kid again. Would you like some hot chocolate, dear? asked the lady. Gabe landed on a bar stool, stunned. Who are you? She laughed lightly. I'm Marie Kringle, Robin's grandmother. Of course you are. He watched as she turned the burner up on a small saucepan and stirred slowly. How'd you get him to care about school? She lifted one eyebrow. He's always cared about school. No. He's failing all his classes. She flicked her hand. That doesn't mean he doesn't care. It doesn't? The liquid started to steam, and she removed the pan, pouring dark brown cocoa into a waiting mug. No. He cares, and he wants you to care too. Why does he think I've been hounding him for three months? He took the mug, feeling the heat warm his cold fingers. That's not the kind of caring he needed. She motioned for him to take a sip. He did, the warmth spreading through his limbs. He started to feel better about life. With a jolt, he realized it was the same way he felt when he ate something Robin made. What did you put in here? The usual. Milk. Cocoa. Christmas magic. She giggled as she wiggled her fingers. I almost believe you. He took another sip and then set it on the counter, staring into the depths of the cup as if the answers to all of life's problems were inside. He thought over what she'd said about the kind of caring Nick needed. Had he even once sat down to help him? No. All he'd done was nag, yell, threaten, and punish. I'm failing at this big brother thing. Nonsense. Marie dropped a marshmallow in his cup. You're the biggest blessing in his life, and don't you forget it. She smiled at him, and her eyes twinkled, just like her sons had. The whole family was all sparkles and grins. He sank lower in his seat. I found it. Nick came in, holding his book over his head like a trophy. A smile tugged at Gabe's mouth. What math are you in again? Algebra 2. He vaulted onto his stool and kept his eyes on the counter. Gabe felt the test there, the question rang out from Nick's whole body whether Gabe was going to help him or yell at him. For the first time, he decided to sit with his brother and struggle through homework. I did okay in algebra, maybe I can take a look at that? Nick's back straightened. That's lit. He opened the book, 
the spine crackling like a log on the fire. Gabe scanned the page. Integers. He jammed his fingers into his hair. Remind me, is an integer a fraction? Nick copied his posture. I don't know. They talked about that in class, but it was a blur. Marie set a plate of warm snickerdoodles in front of them. Brain food. And the answer is yes and no. Both he and Nick raised their eyebrows. She laughed. Let me explain. For the next hour, they had a thorough math lesson punctuated with cinnamon and vanilla, which reminded Gabe of Robin. Math proved to be a poor distraction, no matter how hard he concentrated. Long after the cookies were devoured, the math understood, and the cocoa tepid, the front door opened and the alarm system dinged, letting them know someone had crossed the threshold. Gabe sucked in a breath, desperately needing to see the look on Robin's face. Was she aglow with new possibilities? He didn't think he could stand it if she was, and he hopped to his feet. Elmer walked in first. He was all smiles and bright eyes. Gabe glared, ready to punch him. Marie! It's so good to see you again. He reached for a hug, but Marie snagged his hand and shook it briefly. That's Mrs. Kringle to you, boy. Though she'd corrected him, her words were gentle. The woman probably didn't know how to say a mean thing. She turned and grabbed the saucepan off the stove. Gabe, you're running low. Let me top you off. She winked at him. He chuckled. The woman wasn't subtle. At least he knew one Kringle was on his side. If he had a side. He wasn't making sides. Robin would be more fortunate in the long run if he was out of her life for good. Still, it was nice to know Maria had his back. He would have liked having a grandmother like her. Robin came in next, scowling at a stain on her blouse. I'm not sure it will come out, Grandma. She launched herself at Marie, holding her tight. I didn't think I'd see you until Christmas. Marie giggled. Luck said you needed a ride home tonight, so here I am. Gabe scowled. I didn't see your car. Maria ignored his comment and faced Elmer. Thanks for bringing her back in one piece. It wasn't too hard. We had a bodyguard. Elmer fumbled with his keys, signaling that he'd like to tell Robin goodnight. Honey, go get your things, and we'll leave before that horrible Kylo figures things out. Marie shoved Robin toward her room. We'd best be quick about it. Right. Robin skipped out, calling over her shoulder. Night, Elmer. He waved pathetically at her back. Night. Oh. Nick sucked in. Denied a doorstep. He shook his head in mock pity. Elmer rolled his eyes. It's not like I haven't kissed her before. He swung his keys around his finger and caught them in his palm. See ya, kids. Gabe huffed at his pathetic attempt to write them off. As soon as the front door clicked shut, Nick smacked his arm. Don't take that from him. Gabe laughed. Take what? He's out the door, and I'm right here. He took a deliberate sip of his cocoa. Nick nodded slowly. Turning to Marie, he asked, Do you think Robin, you know, likes Elmer? Marie rinsed out her mug and placed it in the dishwasher. Contemplative lines graced her brow. They have a history together, and that's hard to dismiss. I'm not sure where her heart is. Nick walked his mug around the island and handed it over for her to rinse. Do you think she likes Gabe? Nick, Gabe warned. What? I want to know. Maria smiled at the two of them. Out of the two, Gabe's got my vote. Nick grinned at him. But Marie lifted a finger, spraying water droplets. He's going to have to up his game. 
My granddaughter should not have to settle for a man who doesn't put her first. Nick stroked his chin. What can he do? Gabe shifted. They were talking like he wasn't in the room. And even if he shouldn't, he wanted to know the answer. Making a Christmas wish would be a good start. That one statement brought into focus all the differences between him and Robin. It summed everything up and wrapped it with a bow. No, thanks. Gabe took his mug and a plate to the sink. I don't believe in wishes. Marie's shoulders fell, and the twinkle in her eye dimmed. Can you try? He shook his head. The whole thing was silly. Grown-ups have to work for what they want. She touched his arm. Christmas isn't just for children. There's enough magic for everyone. He patted her hand. That's a beautiful thought. And you're a wonderful lady. Thank you for helping us tonight. She sighed and reached for a towel to dry her hands. You're welcome. I'm going to sit in my room with the lights off to see if anyone follows you out. Kylo was obsessed with Robin and intent on stopping her from being on the show. It was psychotic but also a very real threat. The tree in the front room was too bright for him to see into the dark outside. And he didn't want to watch Robin leave the house, didn't want to have to say something to her, because nothing sounded right. The only words that came to mind were stay and let's try again. And he couldn't say those. Wouldn't. So he ducked into his room before she came out. He was looking forward to Christmas, because it meant Robin would be off with her husband and he wouldn't have to think about what he could have had with her. What they could have been. As much as he was trying to protect her from his grumpiness, on the other side of that was a man who desperately wanted to give his whole heart to a woman he could trust. People came and went in and out of his life. He didn't dare love with his whole heart, because if his heart was broken, he might never recover. Chapter 22 Robin reclined on the green velvet seat of Grandma's sleigh. Baron, their reindeer, loped his way to the North Pole as easily as a pony heading in for grain. He had a burnt red hide, non-symmetrical antlers, and white freckles across his nose. Grandma loosely held the reins in her weathered hands. She'd been flying longer than Robin was alive, and she was good at it. Tell me about your night, she called over the wind. They pushed through a southern flowing high-pressure system. It was all right. That doesn't sound promising. Robin folded her arms across her. I had a revelation of sorts. Do tell. Grandma pumped her white eyebrows, making Robin laugh. Kringle women never grew out of the need for girl talk. She gathered her thoughts that had scattered like dried pine needles. It started out fine. We had a nice talk over dinner, catching up on things we hadn't wanted to share on screen. Grandma hummed to keep her talking and made a slight correction in Baron's route. On the way out to the car, he took my hand. I'd forgotten to wear gloves. I do that sort of thing with him, and he doesn't notice. I hear a butt in there. Gabe notices. Every time. She let her arms flop to her sides. And Elmer said, I'm always warmer when I hold your hand. Like the only reason he reaches for me is to warm himself up. She rubbed her palm on the velvet, watching the slight change in hue as she did so. I know he misses me. I can tell he needs me, but I think he's selfish. He doesn't need me because he loves me, he needs me because of what I can do for him. And it's not the same thing. Grandma sat back and put one arm around her shoulders. It's most definitely not the same. She tugged Robin in for a side hug. Honey, what about Gabe? Robin sighed. Gabe is different. There's this feeling I get from him, it's so unique, and it makes me feel all glittery inside. Yes? He has this need to see me smile, to hear my laugh. Not because it does anything for him, but because he wants my happiness. 
she pressed her fingers to her cheeks. I've never felt that from a man before, it's… precious? Grandma offered. Priceless, Robin finished. But, on the flip side, he won't let me love him. I don't think that's it at all. Grandma circled the entrance to the stables. Hold on, this is going to be rough. She took them in, and the runners bounced across the rivets in the ice, rattling her teeth like shaking candy in a plastic container. They slid to a stop, Baron's nose three feet from the back wall. He breathed heavily and snorted, wanting to back up but prevented by the heavy sleigh that was stuck in a pile of slush. Selra, the elf over the stables, rushed forward to calm him with a carrot. She was followed by Bulb and Barry, who each took a side of his harness and ran their hands down his neck, talking softly. Thanks, dear. Grandma nodded to Selora. It's good to see him again. Selora touched her forehead to Baron's forelock. The two had grown up together. Baron lived most of the year in Mexico with Grandpa and Grandma, Coming back should have been a splendid occasion, but his onyx eyes were full of concern as he stomped in the slush. We'll get him settled in his old stall, Selora promised. Her white and red striped stockings were wet up to the knees. Robin offered her a smile. Thank you. She chased after Grandma, who was halfway to the Hall of Santa's past. What is it? Excuse me? Grandma swung around, her flowing shirt billowing around her. You said on the sleigh that it wasn't that Gabe wouldn't let me love him. If that's not it, then what is it? Grandma took both her hands. He won't let himself love you. He's scared. The image of him in his uniform the first day they met popped in her head. His muscles were firm and nicely displayed, the olive skin contrasting with the black shirt. His royal eyes were intent and focused. He was intimidating and so handsome. Gabe's not scared of anything. Grandma cupped her cheek. Except you. Trust me, darling. You're downright terrifying. She wrung her hands. So what do I do about it? Be honest with him about who you are. Tell him everything. Invite him to be a part of this. Help him feel safe. Her heart lurched forward and then pulled back like Baron putting on the brakes. Will he be able to love me then? There are no guarantees. But it's better to have reached for love than to let it slip by. Trust me, if your grandpa hadn't come after me when I ran from him, we wouldn't be together. Robin jolted. You didn't fall in love at first sight. Grandma tipped her head back and laughed. No way. He came on strong, spouting off that he loved me on the second date. I thought he was crazy. Robin laughed. At least she hadn't made that mistake. I'll tell you all about it, later. She kicked her foot, sending water across the floor. You have a wedding to figure out. A feeling of urgency pumped into her system. Christmas Eve was just two days away. She packed a kiss on Grandma's rosy cheek and took off at a sprint for the Christmas magic room where Lux and Quick had built the electrical substation. She slammed into the door, only to bounce off again. She rubbed her shoulder. Stupid wood. Giving it a mighty shove, she managed to fling it open. Lux. Christmas magic floated in the air like a bazillion fireflies. The substation hummed and then sputtered and hummed again. Lux and Quick were in a cherry picker working with wrenches the size of their heads, each fitted onto a different piece of the pipe. Hey! She waved her arms over her head. They turned, and a few excruciating minutes later, they had lowered the basket down far enough to hold a conversation. How'd it go with Elmer? Lux made a face. Horrible. Thanks for asking. Robin grinned. But that's not why I'm here. She shook out her hands, wishing she had a whisk or rolling pin to work while she thought. 
What happens if I bring a non-believer here? Lux and Quick locked eyes, having a whole conversation without speaking. Lux had on an Iron Man t-shirt, and Quick was in army camo pants and a black tee that clung to his frame. They were the cutest pair of nerds on the planet. Lux answered for the two of them, he won't see the ice castle or the reindeer or anything. It will be a barren, cold wasteland to him. Robin pulled her hair back and then let it fall again. Would anything happen to Christmas magic? She needed all the information she could get before making a decision. Best case, asked Quick. Nothing. Worst case, asked Lux. The magic short circuits, the elves turn to dust, the reindeer lose their ability to fly, and we are forced to evacuate. Santa's flight is cancelled forever, children around the world wake up to empty stockings and no presents. Goodwill across the globe deteriorates. War breaks out. Okay. I get the picture. Robin hugged herself. I'm torn between following my heart and protecting everything I hold dear. She planned her whole life to be Santa. To wear the red suit and share the joy of Christmas with the whole world. That dream hadn't worked out, but that didn't mean she didn't love Christmas or the children. Lux hopped down from the basket and took both Robin's hands in hers. Do you love him? Yes. The answer came out in a strangled cry. The battle inside was real. Her Santa sense, the very thing that made up her genetic code, told her to put aside her own needs and focus on the children. Do what would be best for them, don't take a risk. But her heart was beating just for Gabe. It wanted him and him alone. Then go get him. Lux squeezed her hands tightly. Robin glanced at Quick. His jaw set. Do it, he told her. But it feels so selfish. She pressed the back of her hand over her mouth. It's not. Quick hopped down too. His army boots splashing heavily in the slush. You're reaching for something bigger than yourself. He put his arm around Lux and held her to his side. I didn't understand it until Lux and I finally gave in to the bond we had, the love we shared. But once I fell, I realized that there's so much more to this than I ever thought possible. Robin's eyes misted over. That's so sweet, quick. His cheeks turned pink. Yeah, well. Don't tell anyone. He hopped back into the basket and hit the button to take it up. Lux chuckled. What's your plan? Robin sucked in, lifting her shoulders in a huge shrug. I'm going to tell him everything. That's a bold plan. You inspired it. Robin nudged her. And Grandma, actually, it was her idea. Lux laughed. Two Christmases ago, she'd eloped with Quick and brought him to the North Pole to help her build the substation. That was not my finest moment. But it worked. She smiled shyly at her husband. I'll be rooting for you. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I will. Robin rushed to her room to change clothes. It wouldn't do to show up for filming in the same outfit she'd worn the day before. As she dressed, she wondered how the castle would change her room to include Gabe and Nick. Lux's single bedroom had transformed into a two-bedroom apartment complete with a kitchen and a playroom for her stepson. Nick could use an entertainment room, maybe a pool table. Her hands shook with excitement. Everything the two of them really wanted, family, love, home, she could give them. They just had to believe. Nick was already there. He'd seen her family come down the chimney that first night. Ginger had put a finger over her lips to tell him to keep it a secret. As far as they knew, Nick had been true to their cause. He was firmly on the nice list and had even written a letter this year, a letter she didn't dare read for fear it included becoming a Kringle. Gabe wasn't like Nick that way. He didn't believe in Christmas or Santa at all. 
If he couldn't go on faith, then she'd show him the magic. She grabbed her magic purse and made her way to the stables. Chapter 23 I'm going out for a coffee break, said Ethan, the other security guard on set. The police had a hot lead on Kylo and said they'd have him in custody by tomorrow. But the studio wasn't taking any chances and had doubled up on protection for the crew. Who knew what that madman was capable of? So far, all had been quiet. Gabe nodded to let Ethan know that he'd heard him. Brian had just finished his big introduction, and the montage of Robin and Elmer's time together the day before played on screens all over the set. By all accounts, it looked like there would be a Christmas Eve wedding. Then he and Nick could hunker down and have a quiet Christmas at home. The very thought of going back to that dungeon for Christmas gave Gabe a case of the holiday blues. Robin had been in his kitchen. Any meals prepared there now would be bland and sparkle less. Laughter would echo hollowly off the empty white walls. Maybe they should move. Brian turned to Robin, his too bright smile already in place. It looks like you two had a great time yesterday. It was fun to catch up, Robin answered easily. She had a light about her today, an inner glow that made her all the more beautiful. So that was what love looked like on a woman. He thought they had something special, but maybe he was wrong. Maybe her heart was available to the most eligible bachelor and he'd happened to be in the slot for a few days. And maybe reindeer could fly. He could tell himself lies all day long, but they didn't make him feel any better. Brian winked at the camera. So, what are your thoughts? You've made no secret about the fact that you're dating for keeps. Is Elmer the guy? Robin looked at her ex. She grinned at him as their eyes met, a familiarity passing between them. Gabe wanted to throw up. I'm so thankful you brought Elmer back into my life. She briefly touched his arm. He helped me see things about myself more clearly. Love can often do that. Brian spoke right to the camera. It can. But it can also be scary, she added. How so? Brian leaned on his fist. Well, I think, when we're dating, we put our best self out there. Everyone does it, and for good reason. But it's not our honest self, that's found deeper into the relationship, and it takes a lot of trust to share who we really are with another person. I know everything about you, Elmer said. And I love all that I see. Robin's smile was a tad condescending which made Gabe feel better about the situation and the world in general. I'm sure you think you do, Elmer. But what we have, what we had, isn't love. A gasp went through the studio. Jerry smacked his palm to his forehead. He banked on an engagement today and a wedding special to air by Christmas Eve. He told the network it was a done deal. He'd staked his reputation on this episode. Poor guy. What Elmer did for me was show me what love isn't. It's not meeting someone who meets all your needs. It's meeting someone you need to make happy. Isn't that the same thing? Elmer asked. Robin shook her head. When you figure that out, you'll know you're in love with the right woman. She patted his knee and stood up. The camera operators worked frantically to follow her movement, which got Elmer out of the frame. Brian looked into one camera still pointed at him. His perfect host demeanor slipped as his patience wore thin. Is there a Mr. Right for you, Robin? Gabe's heart hammered so hard and so loud he could barely hear the whispers around him. Robin wasn't going to marry Elmer. His muscles went weak with relief, and he released the breath he'd been holding for far too long. The universe had righted a very big wrong. There is a man for me. She giggled. I think you guys have all but given up on me. I probably threw a wrench in every one of your carefully laid plans. But that crazy path has brought someone into my life who is the one. She shielded her eyes against the light. 
Gabe? Can you come up here? No, he croaked. His feet were attached to the floor, and his mouth was dry. She wasn't going to call him up there, in front of the cast and crew, and America. She crooked a finger. I promise I'm not going to hurt you. He stared at her, seeing the most beautiful woman in the world calling out to him. She'd made herself vulnerable in front of the studio. He knew she must be holding her breath, waiting to see if he would embarrass her. His feet moved without telling him, and he lurched forward, meeting her on stage. Her smile blossomed until it was too stunning to behold. He glanced away and then locked eyes with hers. The lights faded away. Elmer, pouting in his chair, disappeared. Even Brian, who was all about being in the spotlight, became a blur. There was just him and Robin and the place where their hands touched. Gabe, there's so much I want to tell you, she said quietly. I know you're scared to love me, but my heart, she laid her hand over her heart, is the safest place in the world for you. I will never leave you. She took his hand, lacing their fingers together. I can be your home. Emotions clogged his throat. I can't even imagine that. I know. I know it's hard to believe. But I promise you, it's true. Her eyes shone with unshed tears. Her words touched a tender spot inside of him, the very spot he'd been trying to keep hidden from her and from the rest of the world his whole life. A home. A place where he could unpack his clothes and throw away his suitcase because he wouldn't need it again in a year. A woman who wanted him, to be with him for their whole lives through. He opened his mouth to respond. Three gunshots rang out as they hit the ceiling right outside the doors. He whipped around as the door swung open to reveal Kylo with a gun in his hands. His hair stood on end and his eyes were wild. Behind him was a body on the ground. He leveled the gun at Robin and pulled the trigger. Without thinking, Gabe threw himself in front of her. A hot, searing pain went through his chest. He cried out and the world went dark, sucking him into a place that was as far away from Robin as he could get. Cold. Lonely. Final. He reached for her, but she wasn't there. He tried to yell, but all he could hear was the erratic beating of his heart. He swore he would make it through this for her, even if it was for one last kiss. Chapter 24 Robin screamed as Gabe fell into a heap at her feet. She dropped beside him and gently rolled him onto his back. Kylo's scream came next as he fell to the floor, the electrodes from a taser sticking out of his back. As he fell, a security guard she didn't know came into view behind him. He held the trigger down, his face contorted in anger. A scream rang out, and pandemonium broke loose. Elmer glanced at her and then ran to the exit. Gabe was bleeding. A lot. She grabbed his face with both hands. Gabe Fowler. Don't you dare die on me. She pressed a kiss to his forehead. His eyes fluttered open. I must love you, he said before passing out again. She rolled her eyes. Oh, so it takes getting shot for you to figure that out. Come on. Wake up. She pressed her hands to his chest in an effort to keep him warm. Somewhere in the back of her head were instructions on treating someone for shock. Being warm was in there. She couldn't think of what else she needed to do. Gabe was bleeding. She was shoved out of the way by emergency personnel and landed on her back. Her hands scraped the floor. Brian dragged her to her feet and held her against his navy suit, preventing her from lunging at Gabe and interfering with his treatment. She was half out of her mind with worry. The paramedics kept saying things like he's losing too much blood and call ahead and tell them to prep for emergency surgery. Lux got to her. She had her phone out and was texting. Mom and Dad are in the sleigh. Robin nodded, 
but she couldn't find words to tell Lux thank you for calling them. The police hauled Kylo away. She had to touch Gabe. Her Kringle Ness could help him. Her legs shook and gave out as needles punctured his skin, making him look fragile. Brian held her up. He muttered nice things, calming words, but they didn't break through her terror. They wheeled Gabe out on a stretcher, and Brian nudged her. Go with them. She'd never ridden in an ambulance before. She didn't ask permission, just followed him out the door and into the back of the unwelcoming vehicle. The paramedics were so focused on saving his life that no one argued with her. The sound of jingle bells rang above her head. Her parents were there. She glanced up to see the sled fly slowly through the sky. They were ready to follow them. At the hospital, Gabe was taken into surgery and she was told to wait in a small, windowless room with a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. She sat in a chair and rocked back and forth, praying for Gabe to live. Minutes later, her mom rushed in, her hair a windblown mess. Your dad's parking the sleigh. We got here as fast as we could. She fell into her mom's open arms, thankful for a steady presence when her world was falling apart. Your sisters are frantic. Shame overflowed her. Tell them not to come. Christmas Eve is tomorrow. Stella would be in the thick of the last-minute toy-making and wrapping. Oh, the wrapping! Always done at the last minute, wrapping stressed even Stella out. And Ginger had to finish checking the list, and Frost had letters to read, and Lux was working on the flooding problems. They didn't need to coddle her any more than they already had. She'd done enough to ruin Christmas this year. Her dad came through the door, wearing his full Santa getup. Robin pressed her hands together in front of her, pleading. Can you go get Nick? He should be here. He's already seen half of us come down the chimney, use the sleigh it will be faster. Dad spun on his shiny black boot and was out the door again. It's going to be okay, Robin said. As long as he lives, it's all going to be okay. She slammed her eyes shut. Mom, there was so much blood. I think. Mom hugged her and rubbed her back. SHH, don't think the worst. Believe in the best. Robin nodded. He said, he said he must love me. She sniffed. If he loves me and then dies, I'm going to be so mad. Mom chuckled softly. All the more reason for him to fight to stay alive. Nick came running through the door and landed in her arms. He quaked. She moved from being the comforted to the comforter. Nick's fears were so big. He was afraid of losing his brother. Afraid of being alone. SHH. It's okay. It's going to be okay. What if he, the poor kid, was a mess? Mom handed her a tissue box out of her Kringle purse, and Robin set to work wiping his tears. He drank in the attention like a starved soul. Oh, how she wanted to be a woman he could count on. Nick. She pulled his head to her shoulder and rubbed comforting circles on his back. It was a little awkward with him being taller than her, but he didn't seem to mind. No matter what happens, you have a family. Do you understand? I will never, ever leave you, and if you run away, I will always come find you. Her voice was steady for the first time since getting to the hospital. Her vow was a solemn truth. He nodded against her shoulder. Do you love Gabe? He asked, his voice full of trepidation and fear. Robin reached into her heart and found a love so big she could barely breathe because of it. I love Gabe more than Christmas. She kissed his hair and met her parents' wondering gazes. I'm going to marry him, and we're going to be a family. Mom sat on her other side and patted her leg. Will you be able to marry him in time? I don't know, Robin replied. She managed to get Nick to sit up and blow his nose. 
He looked so small, so breakable. She took his hand, and he held tight. Quick's words about love and magic came back to her. I think I get it now. I get how the magic works in us. She leaned her head on Nick's shoulder. Dad's eyes crinkled at the corners. Maybe you can explain it to me. She huffed a soft laugh. Like her dad didn't know Christmas magic inside and out. He could make it fall from his fingers. It's this love, Dad. It's bigger than me, it fills me up, and it overflows. I feel like I can love the whole world three times over. Dad's reply was interrupted by a doctor wearing horrid green scrub standing in the doorway. Excuse me, Robin Kringle? He had a weary expression that had her reaching for her mom's hand. That's me. He glanced at Nick. This is Gabe's brother. Nice to meet you. They exchanged nods. I'm Dr. Allen, the ER surgeon. I have good news and bad news. The good news is that the bullet missed Gabe's heart by a fraction of an inch. Robin let out a breath. That's good. As close to a Christmas miracle as we get around here. Dr. Allen smiled for a brief second. The bad news is that it hit the inside of his rib and lodged there. We had to take it out and put rods in the bone to hold it together. He's going to be sore for quite some time. When can he come home? asked Nick. Probably tomorrow. Since it's later in the day, I'd like to keep him overnight for observation. That's Christmas Eve, blurted Robin. I'd cancel the parties if I were you. He needs rest. Merry Christmas, folks. He waved and headed off to do whatever doctors did after delivering news. Robin glanced at Dad. What does this mean for Christmas? Gabe might have said he loved her when he thought he was going to die, but would he feel the same when he knew he would live? He'd already decided once that he couldn't be with her. Did getting shot change things? Would he revert back to his original Scrooge self once he woke up? And what about his injuries? She didn't want to rush him into anything, but they had Christmas to think about. There were things to work out, lots of them, and not much time to do it in. I don't know. He patted her hand. I'm going to run home and check on things. Mom smiled fondly at him. Can you come back in a couple hours? We need to get Nick some food and give him a chance to shower and change clothes. Did you want to stay here tonight? She asked him. Robin could feel the ribbons of their family wrapping around Nick. He looked grateful that someone cared about him even in all of this. Of course they did. Robin patted his arm. She was grateful her mom thought about things like food and clothing. She was too wrapped up in praying for Gabe to care about either. Nick ducked his head. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be any trouble. Mom leaned over Robin to whisper. You've been in the sleigh, Nick. She winked. There's no getting rid of us now. He grinned. That was pretty tight. Dad ho ho hoed. You ain't seen nothing yet, son. Wait until I get you behind Prancer. He'll blow your stockings off. Nick blanched. Four reals? For real. Dad touched the side of his nose. Robin had no idea if Christmas magic would accept Nick without her marrying Gabe, but if it didn't, she'd move down here to be with him. Her heart was already sealed to these two tough guys, and she wouldn't be able to live without them. Chapter 25 You look so dope. Gabe lifted an eyebrow at Nick. Probably. He plucked at his Santa-themed hospital gown, which was embarrassing when it was folded in a square but downright humiliating to actually wear. He'd come out of surgery a little less than ten hours ago. The first person he saw when he woke up was Robin. Her hair was a mess and she had a pillow crease on her cheek. 
and she was the most beautiful sight he'd ever seen. She'd kissed his cheek and his forehead and finally his lips, sending his heart rate monitor to beeping sporadically. Which, in turn, burned off the haze from the anesthesia so he could think clearly. Once the nurses settled him back down, he had a few minutes to reassure Nick he wasn't going to die on him this year. His rib was broken, but thankfully, his heart was intact. He'd been one lucky man, and he wasn't going to forget it any time soon. A second chance at life, love, was huge. The Kringle family had given him the royal treatment, decorating his room while he slept after surgery. It looked like a movie set for a Christmas special, and he didn't even mind. Bring on the holidays. He had a lot to be thankful for this year and so much to celebrate. I'm going to get some food. Nick bumped knuckles with him before heading to the cafeteria. Robin smiled after Nick as she sat on the edge of Gabe's bed. Something had changed between the two of them. They had a bond, an understanding, and an acceptance between them. I would have adopted him, you know? If you had died. He wouldn't have ever been without family. Gabe took her hand in his. He felt so good holding her, but more importantly, she melted at his touch. I know. You have enough love to give the whole world over. She smiled. I am a Kringle. That means something to you, doesn't it? She laughed. Gabe, I have so much to tell you. Let me tell you something first. She lifted an eyebrow. Go for it. He gently tucked her hair behind her ear. I'm sorry I said all those things at the park, sketch. You are perfect, and I was worried that I would bring you down, that you'd tire of me and move on to some guy who was more. More what? Just more. Oh, Gabe. She leaned into his touch. You're my match. There was a part of Gabe, a small part, that was locked away deep inside of him. It was the part that longed to be loved with wild abandon and all the security of vows and rings. That part of him rose to the surface, called by her words and her love. He sensed that he and his heart would be safe with this woman for time and eternity. He marveled at her goodness. She tucked her chin as if gathering her courage. There's so much I need to tell you. There you are. Jerry and Chelsea strolled in together twin smiles on their faces. The most famous Christmas couple short of Santa and Mrs. Claus. Robin coughed and turned her head. Gabe ran his thumb over the back of her hand before lifting it to his lips and pressing a kiss to her soft skin. Hi, guys. What brings you by? We wanted to check on our favorite security guard. Chelsea scooted a chair closer to the bed and sat down. How are you feeling? I've been better. Don't make me laugh, it hurts, he said in all seriousness. Nick had tried to cheer him up and sent him begging for a painkiller. It knocked him out for an hour. Jerry grabbed the foot of the bed. He cast his eyes down and said, We're hoping you're feeling good enough to get married. Married? Gabe bolted up and then cried out in pain. I can hardly move. He gasped carefully. Worry lines appeared between Robin's eyes. That's what makes it so romantic, said Jerry. You aren't going to let a gunshot wound stop you from being together. Robin pressed the button to lift the head of the bed to a higher position. The lines didn't disappear, though, and she bit her lower lip. He relaxed against the cushion with a groan. This isn't what I pictured for a wedding day. Robin deserves better. Why don't you ask her? Chelsea folded her arms. He asked with a look that said, Can you believe these guys? Robin swallowed. Gabe, she hedged, the ceremony isn't what's important. I just want to be with you. Jerry and Chelsea held their breath as they turned back to him. He rubbed his face. He was so tired. 
But knowing that Robin was his, that he'd leave the hospital a married man, with someone to love and cherish, was not the same as going home alone. He wanted to be with Robin too, but what was a start like this? He could barely walk, let alone carry her over the threshold or hold her in his arms. Still, he'd taken a bullet for this woman, and for some crazy, unfathomable reason, she wanted him. I don't know why we should spend one more day apart. Chelsea hooped and threw her arms over her head. There's a chapel in the hospital. I can have it set up by tomorrow night. Tomorrow morning, Robin corrected. It's Christmas Eve. We thought we'd stream live, Jerry chimed in. Tomorrow morning, Robin said with finality. There's too much to do for Christmas. All righty, then. Tomorrow morning it is. Chelsea bolted from her chair, her phone in her hand. Jerry followed her, moving slower. I'm really happy for you, Robin. Gabe. He nodded at them before taking his leave. Robin gripped his hand. If you don't want. I do. Gabe started to chuckle at his word choice but stopped with the first stab of pain. I thought I proved beyond a doubt that I'm willing to give my life to you. Robin's eyes misted over and she came forward, laying her head gently between his neck and his collarbone on his good side. There are some important things I need to tell you. Go ahead. He stroked his fingers through her thick, soft hair, releasing the scent of vanilla into the air. As long as he lived, he'd never grow tired of that smell. Okay, I'm just going to come out and say it. She kissed his neck. I'm Santa's daughter. His hand froze mid-stroke. You're what now? He gently pushed her back so he could look into her eyes. My dad was Santa. I know. I met him in the park, remember? She huffed. No. I mean the real Santa. He tried to clear his brain, but the meds must still be in his system. He could have sworn she just said Santa was real. He shook his head in an effort to clear it. She got to her feet and paced by the bed. He's not the acting Santa. Ginger is. She has the tinsel tattoo to prove it. I was supposed to become Santa, but for some reason, Christmas magic chose her. I was really mad, at first. It was right after Elmer had dumped me, and I wasn't in a good place. But I've come to see that she was born for the part. I don't know why we didn't pick up on that before. So, that's my big secret. Words weren't there. What was he supposed to say to something so crazy? He dropped his eyes shut. It figured that he'd find the perfect woman and she'd turn out to be delusional. Gabe? She leaned over the bed to check on him. He kept his eyes shut, needing a moment more to process what she'd said and what it meant for them. He felt her stiffen and then heard her sigh. I guess there's time for all of that after the wedding. She kissed his cheek. Sleep, my handsome Scrooge. Gabe lay there, wondering who was crazier. The woman who believed she was part of Santa's family, or the man who loved her in spite of it? He was going to marry Robin, crazy family and all. Chapter 26 Your family is amazing, whispered Chelsea. Robin giggled. She stood outside the chapel in a wedding gown designed and made by Frost. Her family had somehow managed to transform the chapel into a winter wonderland, working around the movie crew, which quickly realized all they needed were cameras and microphones and to get out of the Kringle's way. Stella, Frost, Ginger, and Lux stood in a line at the door. Their satin dresses and hats that would send Princess Kate into a fit of jealousy were stunning. Elves really did know how to make hats. While each dress and hat was the same shade of Christmas red, they were made to fit the individual sister. Stella's hat swooped down in front of one eye, giving her a mysterious quality, like a sexy spy. Her dress was a form-fitting mermaid style with a train that only she could pull off. 
Ginger was next in line. She wore a large skirt with hoops. The bodice of her dress was fitted to her chest and waist with pin tucks. Her hat was a fascinator, perched jauntily forward and made with wide ribbon. It was whimsical and classy like Santa. Lux, the least girly of them all, had chosen a flapper dress and ankle boots. She had a floral headband worn across her forehead, and her long hair was done in a fashionable twist at the nape of her neck. Robin would bet dollars to candy cane Stella had a hand in that do. Frost was last. She wore a classic Jackie O'Cut dress with three-quarter sleeves that ended in a ruffle. The hem stopped just above her knees, and she had on thick three-inch heels. Her wide-brimmed hat was adorned with feathers and ribbons, and she had pearls at her neck and wrists. Robin's dress was also three-quarter sleeved with scalloped lace at the ends. The front had a diamond pattern and the back was an open V, accented with the same lace as the sleeves. The light fabric floated to the floor, and she had to lift it to walk, which she absolutely loved. Her veil rested just below her collarbone. Even though she'd gotten ready in a hospital bathroom, she felt stunning. Mostly, though, she was excited to marry Gabe. Each time he woke up in the night, he whispered sweet words of love and adoration that filled her with peace and hope for their future together. Okay. Chelsea clapped her hands. We'll start the march in three, she held up three fingers and stopped counting out loud. When she got to one, she pointed at Stella, who began her slow, careful walk down the aisle. This was so different from Frost's wedding last year, where they practically sprinted through the ceremony. When it was her turn, Robin took a deep breath, stepped to the middle of the open doorway, and pivoted. She searched for Gabe, finding him in a wheelchair in front of Pastor Willis. Oh! Stella was going to be so mad her ex-crush was here. Whoever had brought him down from Alaska was asking for it, but Robin was glad. He'd married her other sisters, and it felt right that he should be the one to perform the ceremony for her and Gabe. Dad, who had been waiting just inside the door, stepped over and offered his arm. She looked into his crystal blue eyes and saw tears. Santa's not supposed to cry. He pulled his arm closer to his side, bringing her right along with it. I can't help it. I'm giving away my daughter, it's not easy. I love you, Dad. She threw her arms around his neck. Thank you for being my dad. He softly ho-ho-hoed. It was my greatest joy. She stepped back and swiped under her eyes, not wanting to look like a raccoon when she said her vows. They rearranged themselves for their short journey down the aisle and stepped forward at the same time. The cameras were off to the side and hardly noticeable. Most of the guests were her brothers-in-law, her nieces and nephews, and several crew members from 30-Minute Match. Nick stood by Gabe, wearing a black tuxedo with a red tie. He'd gotten a haircut, again, probably Stella's doing. He looked older, steady, and happy. Robin couldn't wait to make him official family. He'd flown in the sleigh several times over the past couple of days and talked to Layla about the homeschool program she did from the North Pole when she'd stopped by to visit. Dad handed Robin off to Gabe. He too was in a tux, with a silver tie and vest. He looked so handsome. How on earth he'd managed to get into these clothes without keeling over in pain was beyond her. The fact that he was even here, willing to be married in such strange circumstances, was a testament to his love for her. We are gathered here today, Pastor Willis went on, but Robin's thoughts were all about Gabe. What was even more amazing was that his needs were all about her. There was a beautiful safety in knowing that he would watch out for her. For so many years, she'd taken care of herself and everyone around her. She felt like she'd found a harbor of safety and peace with him. They said, I do, and she leaned down to kiss him for the first time as his wife. Gabe pulled her into his lap and did a wonderful job of telling her he was happy to be her husband. Her family surged around them for congratulations. The crew packed up their camera equipment and said hasty goodbyes and good lucks. 
It was Christmas Eve, after all, and they wanted to spend it with their families. When it was just the family left, and Pastor Willis quick patted Gabe lightly on the shoulder. How do you feel? Tingly? The guys gathered around his chair, knowing smiles on their faces. Robin hung back, wanting Gabe to feel welcome, like one of the guys. They were a close-knit group at the North Pole, and it was important to her that they all got along. No. I'm fine. Gabe glanced at each of their faces. Quick frowned and exchanged a look with Joseph. Maybe it will take a minute? What will? asked Gabe. The magic. Quick reached for Lux. Do you have those calculations we ran? They bent their heads together over her phone. Magic? Gabe pulled his eyebrows down. What magic? Christmas magic. Layla bounced on her toes. Now that you're a Kringle, you'll fill up with it. It's like being inside a can of soda when someone shakes it. But it doesn't hurt. She poked Nick's shoulder. Can you feel it? He scowled. Not really. Maybe in the sleigh, offered Tannen. My tingle started on the flight to the North Pole. Let's get him to the roof. Joseph grabbed the wheelchair's handlebars and began pushing Gabe to the back of the small chapel and then onto the elevators that would take them to the roof. Robin gathered her skirts and hurried to keep up. Tonight was her first night as a married woman, and it was Christmas Eve. She was dying to see what the ice castle had done to her rooms and to show Gabe their beautiful suite. Nick, too. Gabe. Wait, what? Gabe turned in his seat, which was quickly rolling him down the tiled hallway. Robin, what are they talking about? Robin caught his hand and held on, giving him an instant sense of peace at the same time his mind spun. Once you marry a Kringle, the magic changes you so you're like us. She said the words as if they had meaning, but he wasn't sure what like us meant. He scanned the faces boarding the elevator. They were serious. As in, they actually believed this stuff. Nick waved as the elevator doors closed. I'll catch a ride with these guys. He pointed to Robin's parents, the only ones not to make it in before the door slid shut. A growing sense of panic filled him. Where are we going? Robin bent her knees and sat on her heels. She was lovely in white and had stolen his breath away as she walked down the aisle. The North Pole. I'm behind on Christmas baking. Nothing in her face or her eyes told him she was joking. But she had to be. This was the world's most elaborate practical joke. The North Pole? All of you live there? He stared at Tannen. The guy seemed stable enough, normal as any other guy out there. Seriously. Come on. This is some kind of prank? Is it part of the TV show? He looked at the camera above the doors and waved. Tannen lifted a shoulder. You're really going to love it. Just watch her step in the reindeer stables, if you know what I mean. That earned him a round of chuckles. Reindeer? Gabe turned back to Robin. One of them had to see reason. Robin, Honey, you know Santa isn't real, right? Ouch! Ginger grasped her chest. That hurts, Gabe. She smacked his good arm. He stared at her. Robin had said something about Ginger taking over as Santa and a tattoo? You guys aren't lying to me? Kringles can't lie. Ginger folded her arms. Except Frost. Tannen wrapped his arm around his wife and pressed a kiss to her hair. Lucky me. She's the only one who can keep a secret. Hey. Quick patted Gabe's arm. You can forget about surprising Robin. She has a lie detector. Gabe swung his head back to his wife. You have a lie detector? 
These are things you're supposed to tell me before we get married. What else was she hiding from him? A picture of his fingers taped to red and green wires feeding a machine that drew waves on graph paper came to mind. It's internal. I can sense when someone is not being truthful. It's my Santa gift. She giggled. Like when Stella said she was over Pastor Willis, lie. She grinned. She hung back to give him a ride home in her sleigh. I'll bet they kiss and make up tonight. There was that Santa theme again. He opened his mouth to protest at the same time the elevators dinged and opened to reveal two large red and green helicopters on the roof. Snow swirled around them in an angry dance. Robin stood up and threw her arms wide. We're going home in style. Who's going to fly that thing? He wasn't afraid of flying, but he'd never been in a helicopter before either. A set of nerves started in his stomach. The world was all tipsy. He'd had surgery yesterday. He needed a bed and a few hours of sleep. He pinched the bridge of his nose. The cold seeped into his bones, and he shivered. Come on. Joseph pushed him over the lip in the floor and out to the chopper. The rest of the family piled into the larger machine. They waved and lifted off, disappearing from sight faster than he could blink. There weren't any doors, and his little bit of nerves bloomed into a large container of butterflies. Quick help lift him in, and he searched frantically for a seat belt. Robin climbed in the pilot's seat. Do you know how to fly one of these? he asked. She laughed. I've been flying since I was fifteen. He ran his hands through his hair. Where's the seat belt? You don't need one. But there's no door. He shoved his arm out the side and waved it around. The magic will hold you in. She lifted the stick, and they rose effortlessly into the air, bells ringing out. He gripped the seat, his rib aching something fierce. The temperature was better inside the chopper than it was outside of it. And despite the fact that they were in an open vehicle, the wind wasn't a problem. They zoomed over buildings. If he looked straight down, he got dizzy. Can you slow down? She shook her head. I told you, I'm behind. The big sleigh leaves at dusk. As it is, we're going to have to send elves out to meet up with Ginger and Joseph in Europe and Africa and drop off goodies and toys. I can't imagine how stressed Stella is right now. And there's always an elf issue or two on Christmas Eve. I need to be home. She glanced over at him. Are you cold? A little. She frowned. Standing, which made the chopper swerve to the right and caused Gabe to say a word he normally wouldn't in front of a lady, she lifted the seat and pulled out a blanket. Here. She threw it over his shoulders and tucked it tight to his body. You should be warm, but maybe you're cold because of the surgery. His teeth began to chatter, and he gathered the blanket closer. Can you please focus on flying? I'm fine. She considered him with a tip of her head. We're almost there. He nodded. They hadn't been in the air that long. Maybe the North Pole was code for their family home or something. She hadn't actually thought they were going to the North Pole. Getting inside sounded good to him. They touched down inside an ice cave with a splash and a skid. His ribs jostled, and he could swear he felt the metal pin doing its job of holding him together. Son of a nutcracker, Robin said like a curse. She stood up in her seat, her eyes hooded. This isn't right. It wasn't right at all. This wasn't a home, it was a cave in the middle of nowhere. He looked out through the opening to see nothing but white. They must have flown farther outside of the city than he thought. She jumped down, spraying water all over her beautiful dress. Her siblings huddled close to their chopper. Frost had her face buried in Tannen's chest as she cried quietly. He ran his hands down the length of her hair, his face pinched. 
Lux and Quick had their heads bent over a laptop computer with a dim light. Ginger and Joseph were yanking on a wood door that was sealed shut. What's going on? Gabe grabbed the side of the chopper and eased himself out. This isn't right. It should have worked. Robin's eyes pooled with tears. She ran to him and hugged him close, being gentle with his injury. I love you. I love you with all my heart. I love you too. He kissed her temple. Her panic was all too real. Then why didn't it work? She whipped around, pulling out of his arms and the chill went into his bones. Lux, what is happening? she demanded. Disoriented, with the world spinning around him, Gabe went to his knees, barely registering the frigid water soaking his pants. The air was so cold he couldn't catch his breath. Robin cried out and dropped to her knees beside him. She threw her arms around him. The chill lessened, but it was inside of him now, like a bacteria rapidly multiplying in his cells. Robin. He touched her face. You're a beautiful Christmas bride. Gabe? Her tears began to fall. What's happening? She asked Lux again. Lux sniffed. The only thing we can figure is that, he doesn't believe. She and Quick grasped for one another. Elfin dust. Ginger cried from across the cave. No. She wailed. Frost sobbed louder. We have to get him out of here. He'll freeze. Robin tried to lift him, but it hurt and he yelled out, sinking lower into the slush. Get the reindeer. She motioned frantically at Ginger. They can't fly. Ginger's face crumpled. It's happening. Robin sobbed against his chest. I just wanted you, Gabe. I didn't mean for this to happen. It was supposed to work. You're my true love, my match. She lifted her head and yelled at the ceiling. Do you hear that? I love him. It's supposed to work. Gabe's energy drained away and he could barely lift his hand. The world was shrinking, the edges of his vision turning dark. The cold started to ease off, replaced with an inner warmth that made him feel sleepy. If this was the end, then he wanted Robin to know how much she meant to him. He concentrated on touching her velvet cheek. He couldn't feel anything anymore. It wouldn't be long. Robin. She lifted her gaze to meet his. Rivers of tears ran down her face. I'm sorry, she whispered. I'm so, so sorry. This wasn't supposed to happen. Our love was supposed to be enough. It was, it was more than enough for him. He could barely draw a breath, and he needed to make this count. With his last words, he was going to give her what he should have given her from the start. You, he gasped twice. You are my Christmas wish. She sobbed and buried her face between his neck and shoulder. His heart broke open at the sound. This woman was his whole world. If anyone represented Christmas magic, it was her. I believe in you, he whispered. His energy drained, and he felt himself drift away. Robin. Robin held her breath. If she held it in and never let it go, then this moment would last forever and Gabe would never die. She'd almost lost him once to a madman. She'd thought that was bad. But to have him die because she failed Christmas was too much to bear. Tears of regret burned down her frozen cheeks. The magic was so low, even she felt the chill in the air. They had limited time before it wore off completely. She couldn't look up from Gabe, couldn't see the stables fall to pieces or the elves turn to dust. The reindeer would wander into the frozen world and have to fend for themselves. The family legacy ended with her. Christmas magic was right to pick Ginger to be Santa, Robin wasn't up to wearing the red suit. 
but even all that paled in comparison to losing the love of her life. Gabe. She shook him gently. Gabe. A huge gust of warm wind blew through the open stable doors, whipping her hair across her face. Robin. Ginger cried out in warning. She lifted her head to find herself and Gabe off the ground, floating. She sat up taller, still holding him close to her chest. They were all floating. Is this normal? Tannen yelled above the noise. The door that went to the rest of the castle banged open. Robin flinched. Is anything in our lives ever normal? answered Ginger. Her red dress floated around her legs, the wet spots getting smaller and smaller. It's blow-drying the castle. Frost gathered her white hair off her face. Joseph laughed, the sound booming through the stables. Blitz, Blitzen's daughter, zipped past them, snorting and tossing her antlers around. Loose hay gathered into bales. Shovels and pitchforks lined up against the wall according to height. Elfin dust glowed bright, then brighter, until it was too white to look at. When it burst, an elf was left in its place. Tannen hooped and threw his hands in the air. Ginger ho ho hoed. Robin held on to Gabe, his body was so cold. A part of her registered that Christmas was saved, but the sacrifice was too great. There would be no Christmas for her this year. The wind began to recede, and they were set gently on the now solid and dry ice. Robin couldn't feel the cold through her dress, but she felt it in her heart. Ginger came to kneel beside her. I'm so sorry. Her tears mixed with Robin's. He would have made a good Kringle. Robin sniffed and wiped her cheeks. He just needed someone to love him enough. You are that someone. Frost knelt next to her. Sleigh bells filled the sky, and the green sled came to a perfect stop at the mouth of the cave. Mom and Dad piled out, their faces grim. Nick and the other grandkids were right behind them. Gabe's eyes fluttered open. Is that Jingle Bells? Stunned, Robin clutched him. Yes. She laughed with relief. I mean, no. It's sleigh bells. Gabe stared at her for a moment, drinking her in, before his eyes traveled behind her. They grew wide as Max, the oldest and laziest reindeer in the herd, leaned over her shoulder and snorted in his face. Robin shoved the brood away. Go find a bucket of oats. I've got you covered, Miss Robin. Selora slipped a bridle over Max's muzzle. This way, Max. We've got a storage room full of oats. Several other elves appeared, grinning like they'd just eaten Christmas cake. Robin's heart lifted to see the head stable elf busy with the animals. She thrived on caring for them. Mom wandered over. Sorry we're late. We lost power over Alaska and had to touch down. Quick son jumped into Luxa's arms. Grandpa said nutcrackers three times, he tattled. Dad's cheeks turned cherry red. I had some precious cargo to worry about. He reached up and rubbed Nick's head. Nick grinned at him, soaking up every bit of love her family dished out. There would be so much more of that in the years to come. Who knew what he'd turn out to be? Gabe grunted. You people are for real. Robin laughed so hard her chin tipped back. Yes, we're real. She helped him stand. Her heart was light, and her limbs were strong, full of Christmas magic. She could cook a million cupcakes in an hour with this much energy. How do you feel? He rubbed his hands together. Tingly. Me too. Nick stomped in place. It's like my feet were asleep and now they're waking up. It's the magic, Lux confirmed. It's changing you on the inside. Gabe rubbed his chest. I'm not as sore either. Interesting. Quick stepped forward, rubbing his chin. 
As far as I know, no Kringle has ever sustained an injury of that type. Lux nodded, her eyes doing that super-thinking movement. We never get sick, but I wonder if we have healing abilities. Has anyone broken a bone before? asked Quick. Not in this family. But we should check the archives. Lux grabbed his hand, and they dashed off. Robin leaned against Gabe, grateful to feel his solid body behind her. She could stand here for the rest of her life. Lux and Quick's departure signaled something in the family. The energy shifted from relief and celebration to urgent. Snow globes! Frost grabbed Ginger's hand. I have letters to check against the list. Ginger nodded. I'm only in the TS. It'll take me hours to finish the second check. Dad lifted a hand. I'll start at C and work backwards. The three of them hurried off together. Gabe glanced down at her. The list? That's the one, she confirmed. I'm going to take these cuties in for some milk and cookies. I'll meet you in the kitchen. Mom winked and herded the kids ahead of her. Layla walked by Nick, looking up at him shyly. Do you want to see the castle? Nick bobbed his head. That'd be legit. A smile widened her cheeks. I can show you the test room. We have all the latest video games. He opened the door for her, and Robin's heart melted just a little more for the young gentleman. He would be a strong addition to the family. You know, he believed long before you did. She nudged Gabe. He figured it out that first night in the safe house. Gabe shook his head ruefully. What can I say? I'm a slow learner. He pulled her close, and her body flushed with heat. Have I told you how beautiful you look in that dress, Sketch? Her knees officially gave out at his husky tone. She had no idea he could sound like that. He held her up. You scared me, she admonished him. In my defense, you claimed you are Santa's daughter. She swatted him. I am. He nipped a kiss to her jaw. I know. He pulled back to look in her eyes. It's kind of obvious, now that I think about it. Stubborn man. She gave him a shove. He gathered her close and rubbed his cheek against hers. I have to warn you, he kissed her neck and worked his way toward her mouth. Yes? Robin could barely draw in air. Her whole being anticipated the moment when his lips found hers. I may never get enough of you. He hovered over her mouth, his breath warm and minty on her lips. I hope not, she lifted up and closed the gap, kissing him with wild abandon. Her hands were in his hair, at his jaw, and then sliding down his chest. He buried his fingers in her hair and tipped her head, deepening the kiss. Robin allowed herself to get lost in him, and as she did, she felt the tingles of Christmas magic getting bigger. With each expression and feeling of love, she and Gabe would create more magic to share with the world. They'd become a part of something bigger than the two of them and take their place in Christmas. She pulled away, breathing heavily. Gabe rested his forehead against hers, his pulse thrumming just under his skin. She reveled in the knowledge that she could make his heart race. I love you, Robin Kringle. You will always be Christmas to me. I love you, too. She traced her finger down his smooth jaw in awe of this moment. What are you thinking? She smiled softly. Three Christmases ago, I thought I'd lost everything. Looking back, it was all so small compared to right here, with you. I've been waiting my whole life to find you. If I'd known all it took was a Christmas wish, I would have wished on every star and written hundreds of letters to Santa. He lifted her hand and pressed a kiss to her fingertips. A thrill went through her system. This is the best Christmas Eve of my life. 
His words shot a bolt of adrenaline into her veins. It's Christmas Eve. She began tugging him toward the door. I'm way behind on stocking stuffers. He blinked several times. Wait, you're the one who makes the candy? She flung the door open. Yes. And the sleigh leaves in less than three hours. There's so much to do. She walked three steps and spun around to grab the front of his tux and pull him to her for an ice-melting kiss. We honeymoon on Christmas, deal? He gave her a saucy grin. Deal. She wrinkled her nose with happiness and then spun out of his arms, dashing for the kitchens. She passed Tannen on the way. Gabe's alone. She hooked a thumb over her shoulder. Her Kringle need to cook spurred her on, even as she longed to be back in Gabe's arms. I'll get him. Tannen waved at her to keep going. Thanks, she called over her shoulder. Joseph rode in the sleigh with Ginger. Quick spent Christmas Eve calculating fluctuations in power levels with Lux. But Frost read letters on her own. It was good for Tannen to have a friend, and good for Gabe to have a buddy. She stepped into the sweltering oven room and put her hands to her hips. Roxy, she called over the sound of fifty timers ticking away. Where are we? We're better off now that you're here. Roxy wrapped a full-length apron around her to protect her wedding dress. There was no time to change. Christmas magic might be at full power, but they had a lot of work ahead of them. Robin rubbed her palms together. Let's make some children happy. She jumped in with more energy than she'd had in three years. An hour later, Gabe poked his head in. Something smells wonderful. Drawn to him, Robin set down the mixing bowl she'd been using and packed him on the lips. It must be you. She breathed deeply, taking in his leather and cedar scent. I missed you, he said huskily. She giggled, her head fuzzy. Me too. Maybe I could help. He looked around the room. Robin looked too. Every elf had a job, and the whole production ran smoothly. Where's Tannen? Rapping. Stella's back. I wonder what took her so long. I don't know. But she got flustered when Tannen asked if she'd been to church. Robin laughed. Roxy beamed. You're welcome to stay, Mr. Gabe. As long as you keep Miss Robin in good spirits. That, I can do. Gabe put a hand on her hip and snatched a piece of dough out of her bowl. Delicious. His eyes widened. You really do put magic in the cookies, don't you? She wiggled her fingers, and a dusting of shimmery sprinkles fell into the dough. Every batch. I think the chocolate molds are done. Roxy pushed a rack of molds to the cooling room. Robin continued to work, buzzing around Gabe and letting him steal kisses. Do you think you'll be happy here? she asked. I mean, would you rather live in the city and work at the studio? Gabe picked up the dirty dishes and walked them to the sink, where Chip, the washing elf, took them with the tip of his hat and thanks. He came around, wrapped his arms around her from behind, and kissed her neck. For three years she'd searched for her place in Christmas, for her true self, and for true love. Gabe had helped her find all three of those things this Christmas. She was the baker and cookie maker who'd saved Christmas. She was Robin, a woman who loved without fear. And she'd married a man who was willing to give his life for her. Best. Christmas. Ever. I'm not sure how this all works out. But wherever you are is where I want to be. We're a family now. We're home. She turned in his arms and he kissed her with everything he had, holding nothing back. Robin got lost in his arms. For a man who had been afraid to be loved, he was brave in loving her. She felt his need to give her a lifetime of Christmases together flow between them. 
He wanted her to be joyful. He craved bringing her peace and security. But most of all, he wished for their love to go on and on. She smiled against his lips. Christmas wishes did come true. Epilogue Stella Kringle I'll ask. Stella got to her feet to signal the end of the meeting with the crew from 30-minute match. But I'm not sure they're up to interviews. Robin and Gabe are busy decorating their new place and getting Nick settled into a school routine. The after-Christmas lull had been anything but slow the last few years as the Kringles welcomed new members to their family, and this year was no different. Let us know, said Jerry. We'd love to have them back for a follow-up. Chelsea nodded. We get at least 30 emails a day asking about them. Stella smiled. Her scheme to find Robin a husband had worked out better than she expected. Not only had she gotten a new brother-in-law, she'd gotten a nephew. Okay, so Nick was totally awesome. He'd adapted to life at the North Pole like he was born to be there. Joseph took him under his wing and spent every other morning teaching him to carve. Quick said he had a natural gift for engineering and was determined to help him build a computer from spare parts before Valentine's Day. Tannen and Lux asked him to babysit every Friday night so they could go out on a date. He readily agreed and taught his new cousin how to ice skate. They had plans for a hockey rink in the stables that the elves weren't too thrilled about, but the reindeer seemed jazzed. Mostly, he spent time with his brother. The two of them had come to a place of peace where neither was running away from being a family and trusting that the other one was going to stick around. Robin had healed both their hearts. Stella snapped her fingers. I almost forgot, Robin wanted me to ask about the other guard. She saw one on the floor the day Kylo broke in here. Whatever happened to him? He's doing great. He'd been knocked out but not shot, thankfully. Chelsea stacked the papers in front of her. He quit to go to culinary school shortly after that. Huh. Stella brushed off her hands. That's good to hear. Well, I'm off. Thank you again. Hey, Stella, called Jerry as she reached for the door. If you ever want us to find you a guy, all you have to do is ask. Stella's stomach cramped. She was the last remaining single Kringle. The fate of Christmas rested on her bare shoulders. She gulped. I'll let you know. He grinned. Let's do another Christmas special, and Robin and Gabe can do a cameo. She turned on her charm as easily as flipping a switch. We'll see. She winked and spun on her heel, sauntering out of the room. As soon as she was out of sight, she collapsed against the wall. That was intense. After a few deep breaths, she swiped her arm across her damp forehead and shoved away from the cement. Every Kringle was compelled to tell the truth. So far, she'd been able to avoid telling anyone, even her nosy sisters, that there was only one man she wanted to walk down the aisle toward, and he'd sworn off marriage. She had to find a way to change his mind, because she was so in love with the Alaskan pastor that no other man would do. The problem was, Christopher Willis was the only man alive immune to her charm. With a flip of her hair, she charged down the hall. If there was a way into Chris's heart, she'd find it, or land on the naughty list trying. I hope you enjoyed listening to Marrying Miss Kringle Robin. If you did, please leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more full-length audiobooks including more of the Marrying Miss Kringle series. Have a very Merry Christmas.